The Advent by B.B. Warfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lord has come into his world. Nay, nay, that cannot be. The world is full of noisomeness and all iniquity. The Lord, thrice holy is his name, he cannot touch this thing of shame. The Lord has come into his world. Ah, then he comes in might, the sword of fury in his hands, with vengeance all bedight. O wretched world, thine end draws near, prepare to meet thy God in fear. The Lord has come into his world. What, in that baby sweet, that broken man, acquaint with grief, those bleeding hands and feet? He is the Lord of all the earth, how can he stoop to human birth? The Lord has come into his world, a slaughtered lamb I see, a smoking altar on which burns a sacrifice for me. He comes, he comes, O blessed day, he comes to take my sin away. End of The Advent by B.B. Warfield The Animal's Christmas Tree by John P. Peters This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Stacy M. Once upon a time, the animals decided to have a Christmas tree, and this was how it came about. The swifts and the swallows and the chimneys in the country houses, awakened from their sleep by joy and laughter, had stolen down and peeped in upon scenes of happiness, the center of which was always an evergreen tree covered with wonderful fruit, bright balls of many colors, and sparkling threads of gold and silver, lying like beautiful frostwork among the green fir needles. A sweet, fairy-like figure of a Christ child or an angel rested high among the branches, and underneath the tree were dolls and sleds and skates and drums and toys of every sort, and furs and gloves and tippets, ribbons and handkerchiefs, and all the things that boys and girls need and like. And all about this tree, were gathered always little children, with faces, oh, so full of wonderment and expectation, changing to radiant, sparkling merriment as toys and candies were taken off the tree or from underneath its boughs and distributed among them. The swifts and swallows told their feathered friends all about it, and they told others, both birds and animals, until at last it began to be rumored through all the animal world that on one day in the year, the children of men were made wonderfully happy by means of some sort of festival which they held about a fir tree from the forest now of course the tame animals and the house animals the dogs and the cats and the mice knew something more about this festival but then they did not exchange visits with the wild animals because they felt themselves above them they were always trying to be like men and women you know putting on airs and pretending to know everything but after all they were animals, and could not help making friendships now and then with the wild creatures, especially when the men and women were not there. And when they were asked about the Christmas tree, they told still more wonderful stories than the swifts and the swallows from the chimneys had told, for some of them had taken part in these festivals, and some had even received presents from the tree, just like the children. They said that the tree was called a Christmas tree, because that strange fruit and that wonderful frosting came on it only in the Christmas time, and that the Christmas time was the time when men and women, and little children too, were always kind and good and loving, and gave things to one another. And they said, moreover, that on the Christmas tree grew the things which everyone wanted, and which would make them happy, and that it was so, because in the Christmas time everyone was trying to make everyone else happy, and to think of what other people would like. This, they said, was what they had seen and heard told about Christmas trees. They did not quite understand why it was so, but they knew that the Christmas tree, when rightly made, brought the Christmas spirit, and they had heard men say that the Christmas spirit was the great thing, and that that was what made everyone happy. Well, the long and short of it was that the animals talked of it in their dens and on their roosts, in the fields and in the forests, wild beasts and tame alike the cows and the horses in their stalls, the sheep in their fold, the doves in their coats, and the poultry in the poultry yard, until all agreed that a Christmas tree 
would be a grand thing for the wild and tame alike. Like the men, they too would have a tree of their very own. But how to do it? Then the lion called a meeting of all the creatures, wild and tame. For you know, the lion is king of beasts, and when he calls, they all must come. You know, too, that before and during and after these animal congresses, there is a royal peace. The lamb can come to the meeting and sit down by the wolf, and the wolf dare not touch him. The dove may perch on the bough between the hawk and the owl, and neither will harm him, when the great king of beasts has summoned them all together to take counsel. But you know all about the rules of the animals, for you have read them in books, and you have seen the pictures how the lion sits on his throne with a crown on one side of his head and all the other creatures gather about, the elephant and giraffe, the hippopotamus, the buffalo, wolves and tigers and leopards, foxes and deer, goats and sheep, monkeys and orangutans, parrots and robins and turkeys, and swans and storks and eagles, and frogs and lizards and alligators, and all the rest besides. Then, when the lion had called the meeting to order, the swifts and the swallows told what they had seen, and a fat little pug dog with a ribbon and a silver bell about his neck wheezed out a story of a Christmas tree that he had seen, and how a silver bell had grown on that tree for him, and a whole box of the best sweets he had ever dreamed of while he lay comfortably snoozing on his cushion before the fire. And a Persian cat, with her hair turned the wrong way, mewed out her story of a Christmas tree that she had attended, and told how there was a white mouse made of cream cheese for her creeping about beneath the branches. Then the monkeys chattered, and the elephants trumpeted, the horses neighed, the hyenas laughed, and each in his own way argued for a Christmas tree and told what he would do to help make it. The elephant would go into the forest and choose the tree and pull it up, the buffaloes would drag it in, the giraffe would fix the ornaments on the higher limbs because its neck was long, the monkeys would scramble up where the giraffe could not reach, the squirrels could run out on the slender twigs and help the monkeys. The birds would fly about and get the golden threads and put them on the tree with their beaks. The fireflies would hide themselves among the branches and sparkle like diamonds. And the glowworms promised to help the fireflies by playing candles, if someone would lift them up and put them on the branches. The parrots and paroquets and other birds of gay plumage would give feathers to hang among the branches and the hummingbirds promised to flutter in and out among the twigs, and the sheep to give white wool to lie like snow among the boughs. Then the parrot screeched, and the peacock screamed with delight, and you and I never could have told whether anybody voted I or nay, but the lion knew, and the owl, for he was clerk, set it down in the minutes, as the lion bade him, that all the birds and beasts would do their part. So each planned what he could do, even the little beetle, who makes great balls of earth, thought that if he could only once see one of those gay balls that grow on the children's Christmas tree, he might make some for the animal's tree. Different birds and beasts told of the oranges and apples and holly berries, and who knows what they could get and hang upon the tree. You see, the animals came from many places, and then, too, they could send the carrier pigeons to go and bring fruit and berries, and who knows what besides from, oh, so far away, because the carrier pigeons can fly through the air no one knows how fast or how far. Well, I cannot tell you everything that each one was going to do, but if you will go and get your Noah's Ark and take the animals out one by one, then you surely will think it out for yourself, for you have all the animals there. And so they arranged how they would ornament the tree, and the next thing was to decide what presents should be hung on the tree or put beneath its boughs, for each one must have his present. Well, after much discussion in roars and bellows, crows and croaks, lows and screams and bleats and baas and grunts and all the other sounds of birds and beast language, it was voted that each might choose the present he wished hung on the tree. The clerkly owl should call their names one by one, and each might declare his choice. So they began. The parrots and the macaws thought that they would like oranges and bananas and such things, which would look so pretty on the tree, too, and so they were arranged for. The robins and the cedar birds chose cherries, the partridges, partridge berries, the squirrels, the red and gray and black, nuts and apples and pears. The monkeys said the popcorn strings would do for them, and the cats and dogs, remembering the Christmas gift which the pug dog and Persian cat had told about, 
asked for tiny mice made of cream cheese or chocolate. By and by, it came the pig's turn to tell his choice. Grunt, grunt, said the pig. I want a nice pail of swill, hung on the very lowest bough of all. Ugh, said the black leopard, so sleek and so clean. Fa, said the gazelle, with his dainty sense of smell. Nay, said the horse, so daintily groomed. What? roared the lion. What's that you want? A pail of swill, grunted the pig. Each one has chosen what he wants, and I have a right to choose what I want. But, roared the lion, each one has chosen something beautiful to make the tree a joy to all. Grunt, grunt, said the pig. The parrots and macaws are going to have oranges and bananas, and the robins and the cedar birds red cherries, the partridges their berries, the squirrels nuts and apples and pears, the dog and the cat their cream and chocolate mice. They all have what they want to eat. Grunt, grunt, said he. I will have what I want to eat too, and what I want is a pail of swill. Now, you see it had been voted, as I told you, that each should have what he wanted hung on the tree for him. And so the lion could not help himself. If the pig chose swill, swill he must have. And angrily, he had to roar. If the pig wants swill, a pail of swill he must have, hung on the lowest bough of the tree. Then the wolf's wicked eyes gleamed, for his turn was next. And he said, if the pig has swill because he wants swill to eat, I must have what I want to eat and I want a tender lamb, six months old. And at that, all the lambs and the sheep bleated and bawed. Ha ha, barked the fox. Then I want a turkey. And the turkeys gobbled in fear. And I, said the tiger, want a yearling calf. And the cows and the calves lowed in horror. And I, said the owl, the clerk, I want a plump dove. And I, said the hawk, will take a rabbit. And I, said the leopard, want a deer or a gazelle. Then all was fear and uproar. The hares and rabbits scuttled into the grass. The gazelles and the deer bounded away. The sheep and the cattle crowded close together. The small birds rose in the air in flocks. And the Christmas tree was like to have come to grief and ended, not in Christmas joy, but in fear and hatred and terror. Then a little lamb stepped out and bleated, Ah, King Lion, it would be very sad if all the animals should lose their Christmas tree, for the very thought of that tree has brought us closer together, and here we are, wild and tame, fierce and timid, met together as friends, and, oh, King Lion, rather than there should not be a tree, they may take me and hang me on it. Let them not take the turkeys and gazelles and the calves and the rabbits and all the rest that they have chosen." Let the tigers and leopards and wolves and foxes and eagles and hawks and owls and all their kind be content that their Christmas present shall be a lamb. And so we may come together again and have our happy Christmas tree and each have what he wishes. But, said the lion, what will you have? If you give yourself, then you will have no Christmas present. Yes, said the lamb, I too shall have what I want, for I shall have brought them all together again and made each one happy. Then a dove fluttered down from a tree and landed on the ground beside the lamb, and very timidly and softly she cooed, Take me too, King Lion, as the present for the owls and the hawks and the weasels and minks, because for them a lamb is too big. I am the best present for them. Take me, King Lion. Then the lion roared, See what the lamb and the dove have done? My food, oh, tigers and leopards and wolves and eagles, and all your kind is like your food. But I would rather eat nothing from our Christmas tree than take this lamb or dove for my present. Then all the beasts kept still, because the lion roared so loud and angrily, and the birds that were flying away settled on the branches of the trees, and the gazelles stopped their running and turned their heads to listen, and the rabbits peeped out through the grass and brush where they had hid. Then the lion turned to the pig and roared, See this lamb and this dove? Are you not ashamed for what you have done? You have spoiled all our happiness. Will you take back your choice, you pig, or do you wish to ruin our Christmas tree? Grunt, grunt, said the pig. It is my right. I want something good. I don't care for your lambs and your doves. I want my swill. Then the lion roared again. Have all chosen? And all answered, yes. Then, said the lion, it is my choice. And all said, 
It is. I love fat and tender pigs. I choose a pig for my Christmas gift, roared the lion. Did you ever hear a pig squeal? Oh, how that pig squealed then. And he got up on his fat little legs and tried to run away. But all the animals gathered around in a ring. And the hyenas laughed and the jackals cried and the dogs and the wolves and the foxes headed him off and hunted the poor pig back again. Then, when the pig found that he could not run away, he lay down on his back with his feet in the air and squealed with all his might. Oh, I don't want the swill. Oh, I don't want the swill. I take it all back. I don't want anything. But at first, no one heard him, because all were talking at once in their own way, barking and growling and roaring and chattering. But by and by, the lion saw that the pig was squealing something. So he roared for silence. And then they all heard the pig squeal out that he did not want any swill. And the lion roared aloud. You have heard. Has the owl recorded that the pig will have no swill? Yes, said the owl. Then, said the lion, record that the lion wants no pig. Then the tiger growled. And I want no calf. And one by one, the leopard and the eagle, the wolf and the fox, the hawk and owl, and all their kind took back their votes. And so it came about that the animals did have a Christmas tree after all, but instead of hanging lambs and doves upon the tree, they agreed that they could hang little images of lambs and doves, and other birds and animals too, perhaps. And by and by, the custom spread until the humans came to hang the same little images on their trees too. And when you see a little figure of a lamb or a dove on the Christmas tree, you may know that it is all because the lamb and the dove, by their unselfishness, saved the animals from strife, for neither thought what he wanted from the tree, but each was ready to give himself for the others, so that they might not fight and kill one another at the Christmas time. End of The Animal's Christmas Tree by John P. Peters Annie and Willie's Prayer by Sophia P. Snow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Peter. Twas the eve before Christmas. Good night had been said, and Annie and Willie had crept into bed. There were tears on their pillows and tears in their eyes, and each little bosom was heaving with sighs. For tonight their stern father's command had been given that they should retire precisely at seven instead of at eight, for they troubled him more with questions unheard of than ever before. He had told them he thought this delusion a sin. No such creature as Santa Claus ever had been, and he hoped after this he should never more hear how he scrambled down chimneys with presents each year. And this was the reason that two little heads so restlessly tossed on their soft, downy beds. Eight, nine, and the clock on the steeple told ten. Not a word had been spoken by either till then, when Willie's sad face from the blanket did peep and whispered, Dear Annie, is you fast asleep? Why, no, brother Willie. A sweet voice replies, I've long tried in vain, but I can't shut my eyes, for somehow it makes me so sorry because dear Papa has said there is no Santa Claus. Now we know there is, and it can't be denied, for he came every year before Mama died. But then I've been thinking that she used to pray, and God would hear everything Mama would say. And maybe she asked him to send Santa Claus here, with the sack full of presents he brought every year. Well, why can't we pay, just as Mama did then, and ask Dot to send him with presents again? I've been thinking so, too. And without a word more, four little bare feet bounded out on the floor, and four little knees the soft carpet pressed, and two tiny hands were clasped close to each breast. Now, Willie, you know we must firmly believe that the presents we ask for we're sure to receive. You must wait very still till I say the amen, and by that you will know that your turn has come then. Dear Jesus, look down on my brother and me, 
and grant us the favor we're asking of thee. I want a wax dolly, a tea set, and ring, and an ebony workbox that shuts with a spring. Bless Papa, dear Jesus, and cause him to see that Santa Claus loves us as much as does he. Don't let him get fretful and angry again at dear brother Willie and Annie. Amen. Peace, Jesus, at Santa Claus tum down tonight, and bring us some peasants before he is eight. I want you to give me a nice little set with bite shining on us and all painted it. A box full of candy, a book, and a toy. Amen. And then, Jesus, I'll be a good boy. Their prayers being ended, they raised up their heads, and with hearts light and cheerful again sought their beds. They were soon lost in slumber, both peaceful and deep, and with fairies in dreamland were roaming in sleep. Eight, nine, and the little French clock had struck ten, ere the father had thought of his children again. He seems now to hear Annie's half-suppressed sighs, and to see the big tears stand in Willie's blue eyes. I was harsh with my darlings, he mentally said, and should not have sent them so early to bed. But then I was troubled, my feelings found vent, for bank stock today has gone down ten per cent. But of course they've forgotten their troubles ere this, and then I denied them the thrice-asked-for kiss. But just to make sure, I'll steal up to their door, to my darlings, I never spoke harshly before. So saying, he softly ascended the stairs, and arrived at the door to hear both of their prayers. His Annie's, bless Papa, drew forth the big tears, and Willie's grave promise fell sweet on his ears. Strange, strange, I'd forgotten, said he with a sigh. How I longed when a child to have Christmas draw nigh. I'll atone for my harshness, he inwardly said by answering their prayers ere I sleep in my bed. Then he turned to the stairs and softly went down, threw off velvet slippers and silk dressing gown, donned hat, coat, and boots, and was out in the street, a millionaire facing the cold, driving sleet. Nor stopped he until he had bought everything, from the box full of candy to the tiny gold ring, Indeed, he kept adding so much to his store that the various presents outnumbered a score. Then homeward he turned, when his holiday load, with Aunt Mary's help, in the nursery was stowed. Miss Dolly was seated beneath a pine tree, by the side of a table spread out for her tea. A workbox, well filled, in the centre was laid, and on it the ring for which Annie had prayed. A soldier in uniform stood by a sled, with bright shining runners and all painted red. There were balls, dogs, and horses, books pleasing to see, and birds of all colors were perched in the tree, while Santa Claus, laughing, stood up in the top, as if getting ready more presents to drop. Now as the fond father the picture surveyed, he thought for his trouble he'd amply been paid, and he said to himself, as he brushed off a tear, I'm happier tonight than I've been for a year. I've enjoyed more true pleasure than ever before. What care I if bank stock falls ten per cent more? Hereafter I'll make it a rule, I believe, to have Santa Claus visit us each Christmas Eve. So thinking, he gently extinguished the light, and, tripping downstairs, retired for the night. As soon as the beams of the bright morning sun put the darkness to flight and the stars one by one, four little blue eyes out of sleep opened wide, and at the same moment the presence espied. Then out of their beds they sprang with a bound, and the very gifts prayed for were all of them found. They laughed and they cried in their innocent glee, and shouted for Papa to come quick and see— what presents old Santa Claus brought in the night, just the things that they wanted, and left before light. And now, added Annie, in voice soft and low, you'll believe there's a Santa Claus, Papa, I know. While dear little Willie climbed up on his knee, 
determined no secret between them should be, and told in soft whispers how Annie had said that their dear, blessed mamma, so long ago dead, used to kneel down and pray by the side of her chair, and that God up in heaven had answered her prayer. Then we dot up and paid dust as well as we could, and dot answered our prayers. Now wasn't he good? I should say that he was, if he sent you all these, and knew just what presents my children would please. Well, well, let him think so, the dear little elf. T'would be cruel to tell him I did it myself. Blind father, who caused your stern heart to relent, and the hasty words spoken so soon to repent. T'was the being who bade you steal softly upstairs, and made you his agent to answer their prayers. End of Annie and Willie's Prayer by Sophia P. Snow Birdie's Christmas Eve by Saki This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paula Messina It was Christmas Eve, and the family circle of Luke Steffink Esquire was aglow with the amiability and random mirth which the occasion demanded. A long and lavish dinner had been partaken of. Waits had been round and sung carols. The house party had regaled itself with more caroling on its own account. And there had been romping which, even in a pulpit reference, could not have been condemned as ragging. In the midst of the general glow, however, there was one black, unkindled cinder. Bertie Steffink, nephew of the aforementioned Luke, had early in life adopted the profession of Myrdewheel. His father had been something of the kind before him. At the age of 18, Bertie had commenced that round of visits to our colonial possessions, so seemly and desirable in the case of a prince of the blood, so suggestive of insincerity in a young man of the middle class. He had gone to grow tea in Ceylon and fruit in British Columbia, and to help sheep to grow wool in Australia. At the age of twenty, he had just returned from some similar errand in Canada, from which it may be gathered that the trial he gave to these various experiments was of the summary drumhead nature. Luke Steffig, who fulfilled the troubled role of guardian and deputy parent to Bertie, deplored the persistent manifestation of the homing instinct on his nephew's part and his solemn thanks earlier in the day for the blessing of reporting a united family had no reference to Bertie's return. Arrangements had been promptly made for packing the youth off to a distant corner of Rhodesia, whence return would be a difficult matter. The journey to this uninviting destination was imminent. In fact, a more careful and willing traveler would have already begun to think about his packing. Hence, Bertie was in no mood to share in the festive spirit which displayed itself around him, and resentment smoldered within him at the eager, self-absorbed discussion of social plans for the coming months, which he heard on all sides. Beyond depressing his uncle and the family circle generally by singing Say Au Revoir and Not Goodbye, he had taken no part in the evening's conviviality. Eleven o'clock had struck some half hour ago, and the elder Steffings began to throw out suggestions leading up to that process which they called retiring for the night. Come, Teddy, it's time you were in your little bed, you know, said Luke Steffing to his thirteen-year-old son. That's where we all ought to be, said Mrs. Steffing. There wouldn't be room, said Bertie. The remark was considered to border on the scandalous. Everybody ate raisins and almonds with the nervous industry of sheep feeding during threatening weather. In Russia, said Horace Bordenby, who was staying in the house as a Christmas guest, I've read that the peasants believe that if you go into a cowhouse or stable at midnight on Christmas Eve, 
you will hear the animals talk. They're supposed to have the gift of speech at that one moment of the year. Oh, do let's all go down to the cowhouse and listen to what they've got to say, exclaimed Beryl, to whom anything was thrilling and amusing if you did it in a troop. Mrs. Stefink made a laughing protest, but gave a virtual consent by saying, We must all wrap up well, then. The idea seemed a scatterbrained one to her, and almost heathenish, but if afforded an opportunity for throwing the young people together, and as such she welcomed it. Mr. Horace Bordenby was a young man with quite substantial prospects, and he had danced with Beryl at a local subscription ball a sufficient number of times to warrant the authorized inquiry on the part of the neighbors whether there was anything in it. Though Mrs. Steffink would not have put it in so many words, she shared the idea of the Russian peasantry that on this night the beast might speak. The cow house stood at the junction of the garden with a small paddock, an isolated survival in a suburban neighborhood of what had once been a small farm. Luke Steffink was complacently proud of his cow house and his two cows. He felt that they gave him a stamp of solidity, which no number of Wyandots or Orpingtons could impart. They even seemed to link him in a sort of inconsequent way with those patriarchs who derived importance from their floating capital of flocks and herbs, he-asses and she-asses. It had been an anxious and momentous occasion when he had had to decide definitively between the buyer and the ranch for the naming of his villa residence. A December midnight was hardly the moment he would have chosen for showing his farm building to visitors. But since it was a fine night, and the young people were anxious for an excuse for a mild frolic, Luke consented to chaperone the expedition. The servants had long since gone to bed, so the house was left in charge of Bertie, who scornfully declined to stir out on the pretext of listening to bovine conversation. We must go quietly, said Luke, as he headed the procession of giggling young folk, brought up in the rear by the shawled and hooded figure of Mrs. Steffink. I've always laid stress on keeping this a quiet and orderly neighborhood. It was a few minutes to midnight when the party reached the cow house and made its way in by the light of Luke's stable lantern. For a moment, everyone stood in silence. Almost with the feeling of being in church, Daisy, the one lying down, is by a short-horned bull out of a Guernsey cow, announced Luke in a hushed voice, which was in keeping with the foregoing impression. Is she? said Bordenby, rather as if he had expected her to be by Rembrandt. Myrtle is, Myrtle's family history was cut short by a little scream from the women of the party. The cow house door had closed noiselessly behind them, and the key had turned gratingly in the lock. Then they heard Bertie's voice pleasantly wishing them good night, and his footsteps retreating along the garden path. Luke Steffink strode to the window. It was a small square opening of the old fashioned sort, with iron bars let into the stonework. Unlock the door this instant, he shouted with as much air of menacing authority as a hen might assume when screaming through the bars of a coop at a marauding hawk. In reply to his summons, the hall door closed with a defiant bang. A neighboring clock struck the hour of midnight. If the cows had received the gift of human speech at that moment, they would not have been able to make themselves heard. Seven or eight other voices were engaged in describing Bertie's present conduct, and his general character at a high pressure of excitement and indignation. In the course of half an hour or so, everything that it was permissible to say about Bertie had been said some dozens of times, and other topics began to come to the front. The extreme mustiness of the cowhouse, the possibility of it catching fire, and the probability of it being a row town house for the vagrant rats of the neighborhood and still no sign of deliverance came to the unwilling vigil-keepers. 
Towards one o'clock, the sound of rather boisterous and undisciplined carol singing approached rapidly and came to a sudden anchorage, apparently just outside the garden gate. A motor load of youthful bloods, in a high state of conviviality, had made a temporary halt for repairs. The stoppage, however, did not extend to the vocal efforts of the party, and the watchers in the cowshed were treated to a highly unauthorized rendering of Good King Wenceslas, in which the adjective good appeared to be very carelessly applied. The noise had the effect of bringing Bertie out into the garden, but he utterly ignored the pale, angry faces peering out at the cowhouse window and concentrated his attention on the revelers outside the gate. Wassel, you chaps, he shouted. Wassel, old sport, they shouted back. We jolly well drink your health, only we've nothing to drink it in. Come and wassel inside, said Bertie hospitably. I'm all alone, and there's heaps of wet. They were total strangers, but his touch of kindness made them instantly his kin. In another moment, the unauthorized version of King Wenceslas, which, like so many other scandals, grew worse on repetition, went echoing up the garden path. Two of the revelers gave an impromptu performance on the way by executing the staircase walls up the terraces of what Luke Steffink hitherto, with some justification, called his rock garden. The rock part of it was still there when the walls had been accorded its third encore. Luke, more than ever like a cooped hen behind the cowhouse bars, was in a position to realize the feelings of concertgoers unable to countermand the call for an encore which they neither desire or deserve. The hall door closed with a bang on Bertie's guests, and the sound of merriment became faint and muffled to the weary watchers at the other end of the garden. Presently, two ominous pops in quick succession made themselves distinctly heard. They've got at the champagne, exclaimed Mrs. Steffink. Perhaps it's the sparkling Moselle, said Luke hopefully. Three or four more pops were heard. The champagne and the sparkling Moselle, said Mrs. Steffink. Luke uncorked an expletive which, like brandy in a temperance household, was only used on rare emergencies. Mr. Horace Bordenby had been making use of similar expressions under his breath for a considerable time past. The experiment of throwing the young people together had been prolonged beyond a point when it was likely to produce any romantic result. Some forty minutes later, the hall door opened and disgorged a crowd that had thrown off any restraint of shyness that might have influenced its earlier actions. Its vocal efforts in the direction of carol singing were now supplemented by instrumental music. A Christmas tree that had been prepared for the children of the gardener and other household retainers had yielded a rich spoil of tin trumpets, rattles, and drums. The life story of King Wenceslas had been dropped. Luke was thankful to notice but it was intensely irritating for the chilled prisoners in the cowhouse to be told that it was a hot time in the old town tonight. Together with some accurate but entirely superfluous information as to the imminence of Christmas morning, judging by the protests which began to be shouted from the upper windows of neighboring houses, the sentiments prevailing in the cowhouse were heartily echoed in other quarters. The revelers found their car and what was more remarkable, managed to drive off in it, with a parting fanfare of tin trumpets. The lively beat of a drum disclosed the fact that the master of the revels remained on the scene. Bertie came in an angry, imploring chorus of shouts and screams from the cowhouse window. Hello, cried the owner of the name, turning his rather errant steps in the direction of the summons. Are you people still there? Must have heard everything Cow's got to say by this time. If you haven't, no use waiting. After all, it's a Russian legend, and Russian Christmas Eve not due for another fortnight. Better come out. After one or two ineffectual attempts, he managed to pitch the key 
of the cowhouse door in through the window. Then, lifting his voice in the strains of I'm Afraid to Go Home in the Dark, with a lusty drum accompaniment, he led the way back to the house. The hurried procession of the released that followed in his steps came in for a good deal of the adverse comment that his exuberant display had evoked. It was the happiest Christmas Eve he had ever spent. To quote his own words, he had a rotten Christmas. End of Bertie's Christmas Eve by Saki Around the Yule Log by Willis Boyd Allen Chapter 7, Miss Brownlow's Christmas Party This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lee Vogler Mrs. Brownlow's Christmas Party It was fine Christmas weather. Several light snowstorms in the early part of December had left the earth fair and white and sparkling. Cold days that followed were enough to make the most crabbed and morose of mankind cheerful, as with a foretaste of the joyous season at hand. Downtown, the sidewalks were crowded with mothers and sisters, buying gifts for their sons, brothers, and husbands, who found it impossible to get anywhere by taking the ordinary course of foot travel, and were obliged to stalk along the snowy streets beside the curbstone in a sober but not ill-humored row. Among those who were looking forward to the holidays with keen anticipations of pleasure were Mr. and Mrs. Brownlow of Elm Street, Boston. They had quietly talked the matter over together and decided that, as there were three children in the family, not counting themselves as they might well have done, it would be a delightful and not too expensive luxury to give a little Christmas party. You see, John, said Miss Brownlow, we've been asked ourselves to half a dozen candy bowls and parties since we've lived here, and it seems nothing but fair that we should do it ourselves once. That's so, Clarissy, her husband replied slowly, but then there's so many of us, and my salaries, well, it would cost considerable, little woman, wouldn't it? I'll tell you what, she exclaimed. We needn't have a regular grown-up party, but just one for children. We can get a small tree and a bit of present for each of the boys and girls with ice cream and cake and let it go with that. The whole thing shouldn't cost ten dollars. Good, said Mr. Brownlow heartily. I knew you'd get some way out of it. Let's tell Bob and Sue and Polly so they can have the fun of looking forward to it. So it was settled and all hands entered into the plan with such a degree of earnestness that one would have thought these people were going to have some grand gift themselves instead of giving to others and pinching for a month afterwards and their own comforts as they knew they would have to do. The first real difficulty they met is in deciding whom to invite. John was for the asking only of the children of their immediate neighbors, but Miss Brownlow said it would be a kindness, as well as polite, to include those who were better off than themselves. I always think, John, she explained, laying her hand on his shoulder, that it's just so much despising to look down on your rich neighbors, as if all they got was money, as on your poor ones. Let's ask them all, the Deacon Wholesomes, the Brights, and the Nortons. The Brights were Mr. Brownlow's employers. Anybody else, queried her husband with his funny twinkle. Perhaps you'd like to have me ask the governor's family, Jordan and Marsh. Now, John, don't you be saucy, she laughed, relieved that having carried her point. Let's put our heads together and see who to set down. Susie will write the notes in her nice hand, and Bob can deliver them to save postage. Well... You've said three, counted Mr. Brownlow on his fingers. Then there's Mrs. Sampson's little girl and the four Williamses, and he enumerated one family after another till nearly thirty names were on the list. Once Susie broke in, Oh, Pa, 
don't invite that Mary Spinfield. She's awfully stuck up and cross. Good, said her father again. This will be just the thing for her. Let her be coffee and you be sugar, and see how much you can sweeten her that evening. In the few days that intervened before the 25th, the whole family were busy enough. Mrs. Brownlow shopping, Susie writing the notes, and the others helping wherever they got the chance. Every evening they spread out upon the sitting room floor such presents as had been bought during the day. These were not costly, but they were chosen lovingly and seemed very nice indeed to Mr. Brownlow and the children who united in praising the discriminating taste of Mrs. B. As with justifiable pride, she sat in the center of the room, bringing forth her purchases from the depths of a capricious carpet bag. The grand final expenditure was left until the day before Christmas. Mr. Brownlow got off from his work early with his month's salary in his pocket and a few kind words from his employers tucked away even more securely in his warm heart. He had taken special pains to include their children for his party and he was quietly enjoying the thought of making them happy on the morrow. By a preconcerted plan he met Mrs. Brownlow under the great golden eagle at the corner of Summit and Washington Streets, and having thus joined forces, the two proceeded in company toward a certain wholesale toy shop where Mr. Brownlow was acquainted and where they expected to secure such small articles as they desired at dozen rates. And now Mr. Brownlow realized what must have been his wife's exertions during the last fortnight for having gallantly relieved her of her carpet bag and offered his unoccupied arm for her support, he was constantly engaged in a struggle to maintain his hold upon either one or the other of his charges and rescuing them with extreme difficulty from the crowd. At one time he was simultaneously attacked on both venerable points, a very stout woman persisting in thrusting herself between him and his already bulging carpet bag on the one hand, and an equally persistent old gentleman engaged in separating Mrs. Brownlow from him on the other. With flushed but determined face, he held on to both with all his might, when a sudden stampede, to avoid a passing team, brought such a violent pressure upon him that he found both Clarissa and the bag dragged from him while he himself was borne at least a rod away before he could stem the tide. Fortunately, the stout woman immediately fell over the bag, and Mr. Brownlow, having by this means identified the spot where it lay, hewed his way, figuratively speaking, to his wife and bore her off triumphantly. At last, to the relief of both, they reached the entrance of the toy dealer's huge store. Mr. Brownlow at once hunted up his friend, and all three set about a tour of the premises. It was beyond doubt a wonderful place. A little retail shop in the Christmas holidays is of itself a marvel, but this immense establishment, at the back doors of which stood wagons, constantly receiving cases on cases of goods directed to all parts of the country, was quite another thing. Such long passageways there were, walled in from floor to ceiling, with boxes of picture blocks labeled in German, such mysterious gloomy alcoves, by the sides of which lurked innumerable wild animals with glaring eyes and rigid tails, such fleets of Noah's Ark, wherein were bestowed the patriarch's whole family in tight-fitting garments of yellow and red, and specimens of all creation, so promiscuously packed together that it must have been extremely depressing to all concerned. Such a delirious smell of sawdust and paint and wax, and short of such presentation of toy in the abstract, and toy in particular, and toy overhead and underfoot and in the air, could never have existed outside of Cotlow and Company's manufacturers, dealers, and importers of toys. 
Mrs. Brownlow was fairly at her wit's end to choose, when she meekly inquired for ten soldiers, solid regiments of them sprang up, like Jason's armed men, at her bidding. At the suggestion of a doll, the world seemed suddenly and solely peopled with these little creatures, and winking, crying, walking and talking dolls crowded about the bewildered customers, dolls with flaxen hair and dolls with no hair at all, dolls of imposing proportions when viewed in front, but of no thickness to speak of when held sideways, dolls as rigid as mummies, and dolls who exhibited an alarming tendency to double their arms and legs up backward. To add to this confusion, the air was filled with the noise of trumpets, drums, musical boxes, and other instruments, which were being tested in various parts of the building, until poor Mrs. Brownlow declared she should go distracted. At length, however, she and her husband, with the assistance of their polite friend, succeeded in selecting two or three dozen small gifts, and, when the last purchase was concluded, started for home. After a walk of ten minutes, they reached Boylston Market, where they were at once beset by vendors of evergreen and holly wreaths, crosses and stars of every description. Mr. Brownlow bought half a dozen of the cheaper sort of wreaths, which the owner kindly threaded upon his arm, as if they were a sort of huge, fragrant beads. Then he selected a tree, and after a short consultation with Mrs. Brownlow, decided to carry it home himself, to save a quarter. A horse car opportunely passing, they boarded it. Mrs. Brownlow and her bag, being with some difficulty squeezed in through the rear door, and Mr. Brownlow, taking his stand upon the front platform, from which the tree, which had been tightly tied up, projected like a bow sprite until they reached home. Great was the bustle at 17 Elm Street that night. Parcels were unwrapped, the whole house was pleasantly redolent of boiling molasses, and from the kitchen there came, at the same time, a scratchy and poppy sound, denoting the preparation of mounds of feathery corn. Bob and his father took themselves upon the uprearing of the tree. On being carried to the parlor, it was found to be at least three feet too long, and Mr. Brownlow, in his shirt sleeves, accomplished wonders with the saw, smearing himself in the process with pitch from head to foot. The tree seemed at first inclined to be sulky, perhaps having been decapitated and curtailed, for it obstinately leaned backwards kicked over the soapbox in which it was set, bumped against Mr. Brownlow, tumbled forward, and in short, behaved itself like a tree which was determined to lie on its precocious back all the next day, or perish in the attempt. At length, just as they were beginning to despair of ever getting it firm and straight, it gave a little quiver of its limbs, yielded gracefully to a final push by Bob, and stood upright as fair and comely a tree as one would wish to see. Mr. Brownlow crept out backward from under the branches, thereby throwing his hair into the wildest confusion and adding more pitch to himself, and regarded it with a sigh of content. Such presents as were to be disposed of in this way were now hung upon the branches, then strings of popcorn, bits of wool, and glistening paper, a few red apples, and lastly, the candles. When all was finished, which was not before midnight, the family withdrew to their beds, with weary limbs and brains, but with light-hearted anticipation of tomorrow. Do you suppose Miss Bright will come with her children, John? asked Miss Brownlow as she turned out the gas. Shouldn't wonder, sleepily from the four-poster. Did Mr. Bright say anything about the invitation we sent when he paid you off? Silence. More silence. Good Mr. Brownlow was asleep, and Clarissa soon followed him. Meanwhile, the snow, which had been falling fast during the early part of the evening, had ceased, leaving the earth as fair to look upon as the fleece-drifted sky above it. Slowly, the heavy banks of cloud rolled away, disclosing star after star, until the moon itself looked down and sent a soft, merry Christmas mankind. 
At last came the dawn, with the glorious burst of sunlight and church bells and glad voices ushering in the gladdest and dearest day of all the year. The Brownlows were early astir, full of the joyous spirit of the day. There was a clamor of Christmas greetings and a delighted melody of shouts from the children over the few simple gifts that had been secretly laid aside for them. But the ruling thought in every heart was the party. It was to come off at five o'clock in the afternoon, when it would be just dark enough to light the candles on the tree. In spite of all the hard work of the preceding days, there was not a moment to spare that forenoon. The house, as the head of the family facetiously remarked, was a perfect hive of bees. As the appointed hour drew near, their nervousness increased. The children had been scrubbed from top to toe and dressed in their very best clothes. Mrs. Brownlow wore a cap with lavender ribbons, which she had a misgiving were too gaudy for a person of her sedate years. Nor was the excitement confined to the interior of the house. The tree was placed in the front parlor, close to the window, and by half-past four, a dozen raggedy children were gathered about the iron fence of the little front yard, gazing open-mouthed and open-eyed at the spectacular wonders from within. At a quarter before five, Mrs. Brownlow's heart beat hard every time she heard a strange footstep in their quiet street. It was a little odd that none of the guests had arrived, but then it was fashionable to be late. Ten minutes more passed, still no arrivals. It was evident that each was planning not to be the first to get there, and that they would all descend on the house and assault the doorbell at once. Mrs. Brownlow repeatedly smoothed the wrinkles out of her tidy apron, and Mr. Brownlow began to perspire with responsibility. Meanwhile, the crowd outside, recognizing no rigid bonds of etiquette, rapidly increased in numbers. Mr. Brownlow, to pass the time and to please the poor little homeless creatures, lighted two of the candles. The response from the front yard fence was immediate. A low murmur of delight ran along the line, and several dull-eyed babies were hoisted in the arms of babies scarcely older than themselves to behold the rare vision of candles in a tree, just illuminating the further splendors glistening here and there among the branches. The kind man's heart warmed toward them, and he lighted two more candles. The delight of the audience could now hardly be restrained and the babies having been temporarily lowered by the arching little arms of their respective nurses, were shot up once more to view the redoubled grandeur. The whole family had become so much interested in these small outcasts that they had not noticed the flight of time. Now someone glanced at the clock and exclaimed, It's nearly half past five. The Brownlows looked at one another blankly, Poor Mrs. Brownlow's smart ribbons drooped in conscious abasement, while mortification and pride struggled in their wearer's kindly face, over which, after a moment's silence, one large tear slowly rolled and dropped off. Mr. Brownlow gave himself a little shake and sat down, as was his wont upon critical occasions. As his absent gaze wandered about the room, so prettily decked for the guests who didn't come, it fell upon a little, worn, gilded edge volume on the table. At that sight, a new thought occurred to him. Clarissy, he said softly, going over to his wife and putting an arm around her. Clarissy, seeing the well of folks haven't accepted, don't you think we'd better invite some of the others in? And he pointed significantly toward the window. Mrs. Brownlow, dispatching another tear after the first, nodded. She was not quite equal to words yet. Being a woman, the neglect of her little party cut her even more deeply than it did her husband. Mr. Brownlow stepped to the front door. Nay, more, he walked down the short flight of steps, took one little girl by the hand and said in his pleasant, fatherly way, wouldn't you like to go in and look at the tree? Come, puss, to the wayfit to decide. We'll start first. With these words, he led the way back through the open door and into the warm, lighted room. 
the children hung back a little, but seeing that no harm came to the first guest, soon flocked in, each trying to keep behind all the rest, but at the same time shouldering the babies up into view as before. In the delightful confusion that followed, the good hosts forgot all about the miscarriage of their plans. They completely outdid themselves in efforts to please their hastily acquired company. Bob spoke a piece. The girls sang duets. Mrs. Brownlow had held every individual baby in her motherly arms before half an hour was over. As for Mr. Brownlow, it was simply marvelous to see him go among those children, giving them the presents and initiating their owners into the mysterious, impelling forces of monkeys with yellow legs and gymnastic tendencies, filling the boys' pockets with popcorn, blowing horns, and tin whistles. Now assaulting the tree, it had been lighted throughout, and, blessed, how firm it stood now, for fresh novelties, now diving into the kitchen and returning in an unspeakable, cohesive state of breathlessness and molasses candy all the while laughing, talking, patting heads, joking, until the kindly spirit of Christmas present would have wept and smiled at once for the pleasure of the sight. And now, my young friends, said Mr. Brownlow, raising his voice, we'll have a little ice cream in the back room, ladies first, gentlemen afterward. So saying, he gallantly stood on one side, with a sweep of his hand, to allow Mrs. Brownlow to precede him, but just as the words left his mouth, there came a sharp ring at the doorbell. It's a carriage, gasped Miss Brownlow, flying to the front window and backing precipitously. Susie, go to the door and see who it is. Land sakes, what a mess this parlor's in. And she gazed with the true housekeeper's dismay at the littered carpet and dripping candles. Deacon Wholesome and Mrs. Hartwell, Pa, announced Susie throwing open the parlor door. The lady thus mentioned came forward with outstretched hand. Glancing a glimpse of Mrs. Brownlow's embarrassed face, she exclaimed quickly, Isn't this splendid? Father and I were just driving past and we saw your tree through the window and couldn't resist dropping in upon you. You won't mind us, will you? Mind you, repeated Mrs. Brownlow in astonishment. Why, of course not, only you're so late. We, we didn't expect... Mrs. Hartwell looked puzzled. Pardon me? I don't think I quite understand. The invitation was for five, you know, ma'am. But we received no invitation. Mr. Brownlow, who had greeted the deacon heartily and then listened with amazement to this conversation, now turned upon Bob with a signaling futile attempt at a withering glance. Bob looked as puzzled as the rest for a moment. Then his face fell and he flushed to the roots of his hair. I, I must have forgot, he stammered. Forgotten what? The invitations, they're in my desk now. Thus Bob, with utterly despairing tone and self-abasement. Mrs. Hartwell's silverly little laugh rang out. It was as near moonlight playing on the upper keys of an organ as anything you can imagine, and grasped Mrs. Brownlow's hand. You poor dear, she cried, kissing her hostess, who stood speechless, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. So that's why nobody came. But who was cluttered? Who has been having such a good time here then? Mr. Brownlow silently led the last two arrivals to the door of the next room and pointed in. It was now the kind deacon's turn to be touched. Into the highways, he murmured, as he looked upon the unwashed, hungry little circle about the table. His, I suppose, said Mr. Brownlow doubtfully. They'd like to have you sit down with them, just as if they were folks, if you didn't mind. Mind? I wish you could have seen the rich furs and overcoat come off and go down on the floor in a heap before Polly could catch them. When they were all seated, Mr. Brownlow looked over to the deacon, and he asked a blessing on the little ones gathered there. Thy servants... The masters of this house have suffered them to come unto thee, he said in his prayer. Will thou take them into thine arms, O Father of lights, and bless them? A momentary hush followed, and then the fun began. Sweetly and swiftly kind words flew back and forth across the table 
each one carrying its own golden thread and weaving the hearts of poor and rich into the one fine fabric of brotherhood and humanity they were meant to form. Outside, the snow began to fall once more, each crystal flake whispering softly as it touched the earth that Christmas night. Peace. Peace. End of Mrs. Brownlow's Christmas Party by Willis Boyd Allen Christmas Bells by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Jones I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, good will to men. And thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, Good will to men. Then from each black accursed mouth The cannon thundered in the south, And with a sound the carols drowned Of peace on earth, good will to men. It was as if an earthquake rent The hearthstones of a continent, And made forlorn the households born Of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song Of peace on earth and good will to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. End of Christmas Bells by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow A Christmas Carol by Christina Rossetti This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sonia. A Christmas Carol Before the paling of the stars, before the winter morn, before the earlier cock crow, Jesus Christ was born. Born in a stable, cradled in a manger. In the world, his hands had made born a stranger. Priest and king lay fast asleep in Jerusalem. Young and old lay fast asleep in crowded Bethlehem. Saint and angel ox and ass kept a watch together before the christmas daybreak in the winter weather jesus on his mother's breast in the stable cold spotless lamb of god was he shepherd of the fold let us kneel with mary maid with joseph bent and hooray with saint and angel ox and ass to hail the king of glory end of a christmas carol by christina rossetti Christmas Day by Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. When I awoke the next morning, it seemed as if all the events of the preceding evening had been a dream and nothing but the identity of the ancient chamber convinced me of their reality. While I lay musing on my pillow, I heard the sound of little feet pattering outside of the door, and a whispering consultation. Presently a choir of small voices chanted forth an old Christmas carol, the burden of which was, Rejoice, 
our Savior, he was born, on Christmas Day in the morning. I rose softly, slipped on my clothes, opened the door suddenly, and beheld one of the most beautiful little fairy groups that a painter could imagine. It consisted of a boy and two girls, the eldest not more than six, and lovely as seraphs. They were going the rounds of the house, and singing at every chamber door, but my sudden appearance frightened them into mute bashfulness. They remained for a moment, playing on their lips with their fingers, and now and then stealing a shy glance from under their eyebrows, until, as if by one impulse, they scampered away, and as they turned an angle of the gallery, I heard them laughing in triumph at their escape. Everything conspired to produce kind and happy feelings in the stronghold of old-fashioned hospitality. The window of my chamber looked out upon what in summer would have been a beautiful landscape. There was a sloping lawn, a fine stream winding at the foot of it, and a tract of park beyond, with noble clumps of trees and herds of deer. At a distance was a neat hamlet, with the smoke from the cottage chimneys hanging over it, and a church with its dark spire and strong relief against the clear, cold sky. The house was surrounded with evergreens, according to the English custom, which would have given almost an appearance of summer. But the morning was extremely frosty. The light vapor of the preceding evening had been precipitated by the cold, and covered all the trees and every blade of grass with its fine crystallizations. The rays of a bright morning sun had a dazzling effect among the glittering foliage. A robin, perched upon the top of a mountain ash that hung its clusters of red berries just before my window, was basking himself in the sunshine and piping a few querulous notes, and a peacock was displaying all the glories of his train and strutting with the pride and gravity of a Spanish grandee on the terrace walk below. I had scarcely dressed myself when a servant appeared to invite me to family prayers. He showed me the way to a small chapel in the old wing of the house, where I found the principal part of the family already assembled in a kind of gallery, furnished with cushions, hassocks, and large prayer books. The servants were seated on benches below. The old gentleman read prayers from a desk in front of the gallery, and Master Simon acted as clerk and made the responses, and I must do him the justice to say that he acquitted himself with great gravity and decorum. The service was followed by a Christmas carol, which Mr. Bracebridge himself had constructed from a poem of his favorite author, Herrick, and it had been adapted to an old church melody by Master Simon. As there were several good voices among the household, the effect was extremely pleasing, but I was particularly gratified by the exultation of heart and sudden sally of grateful feeling with which the worthy squire delivered one stanza, his eyes glistening, and his voice rambling out of all the bounds of time and tune. "'Tis thou that crownest my glittering hearth with guiltless mirth, and givest me wassail bowls to drink, spiced to the brink. Lord, tis thy plenty dropping hand that soils my land, and gifts for me my bushel sown, twice ten for one. I afterwards understood that early morning service was read on every Sunday, and Saint's Day, throughout the year, either by Mr. Bracebridge or by some member of the family. It was once, almost universally, the case of the seats of the nobility and gentry of England, and it is much to be regretted that the custom has fallen into neglect, for the dullest observer must be sensible of the order and serenity prevalent in those households, where the occasional exercise of a beautiful form of worship in the morning gives, as it were, the keynote to every temper for the day, and the tunes every spirit to harmony. Our breakfast consisted of what the squire denominated true old English fare. He indulged in some bitter lamentations over modern breakfasts of tea and toast, which he censured as among the causes of modern effeminacy 
and weak nerves, and the decline of old English hardiness, and though he admitted them to his table to suit the palates of his guests, yet there was a brave display of cold meats, wine, and ale on the sideboard. After breakfast, I walked about the grounds with Frank Bracebridge and Master Simon, or Mr. Simon, as he was called by everybody but the squire. We were escorted by a number of gentlemen-like dogs that seemed loungers about the establishment, from the frisking spaniel to the steady old staghound, the last of which was of a race that had been in the family time out of mind. They were all obedient to a dog whistle, which hung to Master Simon's buttonhole, and in the midst of their gambols would glance an eye occasionally upon a small switch he carried in his hand. The old mansion had a still more venerable look in the yellow sunshine than by pale moonlight, and I could not but feel the force of the squire's idea that the formal terraces, heavily moulded balustrades, and clipped yew trees carried with them an air of proud aristocracy. There appeared to be an unusual number of peacocks about the place, and I was making some remarks upon that, what I termed a flock of them, that were basking under a sunny wall, and I was gently corrected in my phraseology by Master Simon, who told me that, according to the most ancient and approved treatise on hunting, I must say a muster of peacocks. In the same way, added he, with a slight air of pedantry, we say a flight of doves or swallows, a bevy of quails, a herd of deer, of wrens or cranes, a skulk of foxes, or a building of rooks. He went on to inform me that, according to Sir Anthony Fitzherbert, we ought to ascribe to this bird both understanding and glory, for being praised, he will presently set up his tail chiefly against the sun, to the intent you may the better behold the beauty thereof. But at the fall of the leaf, when his tail falleth, he will mourn and hide himself in corners, till his tail come again, as it was. I could not help smiling at this display of small erudition on so whimsical a subject, but I found that the peacocks were birds of some consequence at the hall, for Frank Bracebridge informed me that they were great favorites with his father, who was extremely careful to keep up the breed, partly because they belonged to chivalry, and were in great request at the stately banquets of the old time, and partly because they had a pomp and magnificence about them highly becoming an old family mansion. Nothing, he was accustomed to say, had an air of greater state and dignity than a peacock perched upon an antique stone balustrade. Master Simon had now to hurry off, having an appointment at the parish church with the village choristers, who were to perform some music of his selection. There was something extremely agreeable in the cheerful flow of animal spirits of the little man, and I confess I had been somewhat surprised at his apt quotations from authors who certainly were not in the range of everyday reading. I mentioned this last circumstance to Frank Bracebridge, who told me with a smile that Master Simon's whole stock of erudition was confined to some half a dozen old authors, which the squire had put into his hands, and which he read over and over whenever he had a studious fit as he sometimes had on a rainy day, or a long winter evening. Sir Anthony Fitzherbert's Book of Husbandry, Markham's Country Contentments, The Treatise of Hunting by Sir Thomas Cockney, Knight, Isaac Walton's Angler, and two or three more such ancient worthies of the pen were his standard authorities. And like all men who know but a few books, he looked up to them with a kind of idolatry, and quoted them on all occasions. As to his songs, they were chiefly picked out of old books in the squire's library, and adapted to tunes that were popular among the choice spirits of the last century. His practical application of scraps of literature, however, had caused him to be looked upon as a prodigy of book knowledge by all the grooms, huntsmen, and small sportsmen of the neighborhood. While we were talking, we heard the distant toll of the village bell, and I was told that the squire was a little particular in having his household at church on the Christmas morning, considering it a day of pouring out of thanks and rejoicing, for, 
as old Tusser observed. At Christmas be merry, and thankful with all, and feast thy poor neighbors, the great and the small. If you are disposed to go to church, said Frank Bracebridge, I can promise you a specimen of my cousin Simon's musical achievements, as the church is destitute of an organ. He has formed a band from the village amateurs, and established a musical club for their improvement. He has also sorted a choir, as he sorted my father's pack of hounds, according to the directions of Gervais Markham and his country contentments. For the bass, he has sought out all the deep, solemn mouths, and for the tenor, the loud, ringing mouths among the country bumpkins, and for sweet mouths, he has culled with curious taste among the prettiest lasses in the neighborhood, though these last, he affirms, are the most difficult to keep in tune, your pretty female singer being exceedingly wayward and capricious and very liable to accident. As the morning, though frosty, was remarkably fine and clear, the most of the family walked to the church, which was a very old building of gray stone, and stood near a village, about half a mile from the park gate. Adjoining it was a low, snug parsonage, which seemed coeval with the church. The front of it was perfectly matted with a yew tree that had been trained against its walls, through the dense foliage of which apertures had been formed to admit light into the small, antique lattices. As we passed this sheltered nest, the parson issued forth and preceded us. I had expected to see a sleek, well-conditioned pastor, such as often found in a snug living in the vicinity of a rich patron's table. But I was disappointed. The parson was a little, meager, black-looking man, with a grizzled wig that was too wide, and stood off from each ear, so that his head seemed to have shrunk away within it, like a dried filbert in its shell. He wore a rusty coat, with great skirts, and pockets that would have held the church Bible and prayer book, and his small legs seemed still smaller, from being planted in large shoes, decorated with enormous buckles. I was informed by Frank Bracebridge that the parson had been a chum of his father's at Oxford, and had received this living shortly after the latter had come to his estate. He was a complete black-letter hunter, and would scarcely read a work printed in the Roman character. The editions of Caxton and Lincoln de Word were his delight, and he is indefatigable in his researches after such old English writers as have fallen into oblivion from their worthlessness. In deference, perhaps, to the notions of Mr. Bracebridge, he had made diligent investigations into the festive rites and holiday customs of former times, and had been as zealous in the inquiry as if he had been a boon companion. But it was merely with that plodding spirit with which men of a just temperament follow up any track of study merely because it is denominated learning indifferent to its intrinsic nature whether it be the illustration of the wisdom or of the ribaldry and obscenity of antiquity he had pored over these old volumes so intensely that they seemed to have been reflected into his countenance indeed which if the face be an index of the mind might be compared to a title page of black letter on reaching the church porch, we found the parson rebuking the gray-headed sexton for having used mistletoe among the greens with which the church was decorated. It was, he observed, an unholy plant, profaned by having been used by the druids in their mystic ceremonies, and though it might be innocently employed in the festive ornamenting of halls and kitchens, yet it had been deemed by the fathers of the church as unhallowed and totally unfit for sacred purposes. So tenacious was he on this point, that the poor sexton was obliged to strip down a great part of the humble trophies of his taste, before the parson would consent to enter upon the service of the day. The interior of the church was venerable but simple. On the walls were several mural monuments of the brace bridges, and just beside the altar was a tomb of ancient workmanship, in which lay the effigy of a warrior in armor, with its legs crossed a sign of his having been a crusader. I was told it was one of the family who had signalized himself in the Holy Land, and the same whose picture hung over the fireplace in the hall. During service, Master Simon stood up in the pew, and repeated the responses very audibly, 
evincing that kind of ceremonious devotion punctually observed by a gentleman of the old school and a man of old family connections i observed too that he turned over the leaves of a folio prayer-book with something of a flourish possibly to show off an enormous seal-ring which enriched one of his fingers and which had the look of a family relic but he was evidently most solicitous about the musical part of the service keeping his eye fixed intently on the choir and beating time with much gesticulation and emphasis the orchestra was in a small gallery and presented a most whimsical grouping of heads piled one above the other among which i particularly noticed that of the village tailor a pale fellow with a retreating forehead and chin who played on the clarinet and seemed to have blown his face to a point and there was another a short pursy man stooping and laboring at a bass viol so as to show nothing but the top of a round bald head like the egg of an ostrich there were two or three pretty faces among the female singers to which the keen air of a frosty morning had given a bright rosy tint but the gentlemen choristers had evidently been chosen like old cremona fiddles more for tone than looks and as several had to sing from the same book there were clusterings of odd physiognomies not unlike those groups of cherubs we sometimes see on country tombstones the usual services of the choir were managed tolerably well the vocal parts generally lagging a little behind the instrumental and some loitering fiddler now and then making up for lost time by travelling over a passage with prodigious celerity and clearing more bars than the keenest fox hunter to be in at the death but the great trial was an anthem that had been prepared and arranged by master simon and on which she had found a great expectation unluckily there was a blunder at the very outset the musicians became flurried master simon was in a fever everything went on lamely and irregularly until they came to a chorus beginning now let us sing with one accord which seemed to be a signal for parting company all became discord and confusion each shifted for himself and got to the end as well or rather as soon as he could excepting one old chorister and a pair of horn spectacles bestriding and pinching a long sonorous nose who happening to stand a little apart and being wrapped up in his own melody kept on a quavering course wriggling his head ogling his book and winding up all by a nasal solo of at least three bars duration the parson gave us a most erudite sermon on the rites and ceremonies of christmas and the propriety of observing it not merely as a day of thanksgiving but of rejoicing supporting the correctness of his opinions by the earliest usages of the church and enforcing them by the authorities of theophilus of caesarea saint cyprian saint chrysostom saint augustine and a cloud more of saints and fathers from whom he had made copious quotations i was a little at a loss to perceive the necessity of such a mighty array of forces to maintain a point which no one present seemed inclined to dispute but i soon found that the good man had a legion of ideal adversaries to contend with having in the course of his researches on the subject of christmas got completely embroiled on the sectarian controversies of the revolution when the puritans made such a fierce assault upon the ceremonies of the church and poor old christmas was driven out of the land by proclamation of parliament the worthy parson lived but with times past and knew but a little of the present shut up among worm-eaten tomes in the retirement of his antiquated little study the pages of old times were to him as the gazettes of the day while the era of the revolution was mere modern history he forgot that nearly two centuries had elapsed since the fiery persecution of poor mince pie throughout the land when plum porridge was denounced as mere popery and roast beef as anti-christian and that christmas had been brought in again triumphantly with the merry court of king charles at the restoration he kindled into warmth with the ardour of his contest and the hosts of imaginary foes with whom he had to combat had a stubborn conflict with old prine and two or three other forgotten champions of the roundheads on the subject of christmas festivity 
and concluded by urging his hearers in the most solemn and affecting manner to stand to the traditionary customs of their fathers and feast and make merry on this joyful anniversary of the church i have seldom known a sermon attended apparently with more immediate effects for in leaving the church the congregation seemed one and all possessed the gaiety of spirit so earnestly enjoined by their pastor the elder folks gathered in knots in the churchyard greeting and shaking hands and the children ran about crying oule oule and repeating some uncouth rhymes which the parson who had joined us informed me had been handed down from days of yore the villagers doffed their hats to the squire as he passed giving him the good wishes of the season with every appearance of heartfelt sincerity and were invited by him to the hall to take something to keep out the cold of the weather and i heard blessings uttered by several of the poor which convinced me that in the midst of his enjoyments the worthy old cavalier had not forgotten the true christmas virtue of charity on our way homeward his heart seemed overflowing with generous and happy feelings as we passed over a rising ground which commanded something of a prospect the sounds of rustic merriment now and then reached our ears the squire paused for a few moments and looked around with an air of inexpressible benignity the beauty of the day was of itself sufficient to inspire philanthropy notwithstanding the frostiness of the morning the sun in his cloudless journey had acquired sufficient power to melt away the thin covering of snow from every southern declivity and to bring out the living green which adorns an english landscape even in midwinter large tracts of smiling verdure contrasted with the dazzling whiteness of the shaded slopes and hollows every sheltered bank on which the broad rays rested yielded its silver rill of cold and limpid water glittering through the dripping grass and sent up slight exhalations to contribute to the thin haze that hung just above the surface of the earth there was something truly cheering in this triumph of warmth and verdure over the frosty thraldom of winter it was as the squire observed an emblem of christmas hospitality breaking through the chills of ceremony and selfishness and thawing every heart into a flow he pointed with pleasure to the indications of good cheer reeking from the chimneys of the comfortable farmhouses and low thatched cottages i love said he to see this day all kept by rich and poor it is a great thing to have one day in the year at least when you are sure of being welcome wherever you go and of having as it were the world all thrown open to you and i am almost disposed to join with poor robin in his malediction of every churlish enemy to this honest festival those who at christmas do repine and would fain hence dispatch him may they with old duke humphrey dine or else may squire catch catch em the squire went on to lament the deplorable decay of the games and amusements which were once prevalent at this season among the lower orders and countenanced by the higher when the old halls of castles and manor houses were thrown open at daylight when the tables were covered with brawn and beef and humming ale and the harp and the carol resounded all day long and when rich and poor were alike a welcome to enter and make merry our old games and local customs said he had a great effect in making the peasant fond of his home and the promotion of them by the entry made him fond of his lord they made the times merrier and kinder and better and i can truly say with one of our old poets i liked them well the curious preciseness and all pretended gravity of those that seek to banish hence these harmless sports have thrust away much ancient honesty the nation continued he is altered we have almost lost our simple true-hearted peasantry they have broken us under from the higher classes and seem to think their interests are separate they have become too knowing and begin to read newspapers listen to alehouse politicians and talk of reform i think one mode to keep them in good humour in these hard times would be for the nobility and gentry 
to pass more time on their estates, mingle more among the country people, and set the merry old games going again. Such was the good squire's project for mitigating public discontent, and indeed he had once attempted to put his doctrine in practice, and a few years before had kept open house during the holidays in the old style. The country people, however, did not understand how to play their parts in the scene of hospitality. Many uncouth circumstances occurred. The manor was overrun by all the vagrants of the country, and more beggars drawn into the neighborhood in one week than the parish officers could get rid of in a year. Since then he had contented himself with inviting the decent part of the neighboring peasantry to call at the hall on Christmas Day, and distributing beef and bread and ale among the poor, that they might make merry in their own dwellings. We had not been long home when the sound of music was heard from a distance. A band of country lads, without coats, their shirt sleeves fancifully tied with ribbons, and their hats decorated with greens and clubs in their hands, were seen advancing up the avenue, followed by a large number of villagers and peasantry. They stopped before the hall door, where the music struck up a peculiar air, and the lads performed a curious and intricate dance, advancing, retreating, and striking their clubs together, keeping exact time to the music, while one, whimsically crowned with a fox's skin, the tail of which flaunted down his back, kept capering round the skirts of the dance, and rattling a Christmas box with many antic gesticulations. The squire eyed this fanciful exhibition with great interest and delight, and gave me a full account of its origins, which he traced to the times when the Romans held possession of the island, plainly proving that this was a lineal descendant of the sword dance of the ancients. It was now, he said, nearly extinct, but he had accidentally met with traces of it in the neighborhood, and had encouraged its revival, though, to tell the truth, it was too apt to be followed up by rough cudgel play and broken heads in the evening. After the dance was concluded, the whole party was entertained with brawn and beef and stout home brewed. The squire himself mingled among the rustics, and was received with awkward demonstrations of deference and regard. It is true I perceived two or three of the younger peasants, as they were raising their tankards to their mouths, when the squire's back was turned, making something of a grimace, and giving each other the wink, but the moment they caught my eye, they pulled grave faces, and were exceedingly demure. With Master Simon, however, they all seemed more at their ease. His varied occupations and amusements had made him well known throughout the neighborhood. He was a visitor at every farmhouse and cottage, gossiped with the farmers and their wives, romped with their daughters, and like that type of a vagrant bachelor, the bumblebee, told the sweets from all the rosy lips of the country round. The bashfulness of the guests soon gave way before good cheer and affability. There was something genuine and affectionate in the gaiety of the lower orders, when it is excited by the bounty and familiarity of those above them. The warm glow of gratitude enters into their mirth, and a kind word or a small peasantry, frankly uttered by a patron, gladdens the heart of the dependent more than oil and wine. When the squire had retired, the merriment increased, and there was much joking and laughter, particularly between Master Simon and a hale, ruddy-faced, white-headed farmer, who appeared to be the wit of the village, for I observed all his companions to wait with open mouths for his retorts, and burst into a gratuitous laugh before they could well understand them. The whole house, indeed, seemed abandoned to merriment. As I passed to my room to dress for dinner, I heard the sound of music in a small court, and looking through a window that commanded it, I perceived a band of wandering musicians with pandean pipes and tambourine. A pretty, coquettish housemaid was dancing a jig with a smart country lad, while several of the other servants were looking on in the midst of her sport. The girl caught a glimpse of my face at the window, and, coloring up, ran off with an air of roguish, affected confusion. End of Christmas Day by Washington Irving
Christmas Eve at Mr. Wardle's from Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. From the centre of the ceiling of this kitchen, old Wardle had just suspended with his own hands a huge branch of mistletoe, and this same branch of mistletoe instantaneously gave rise to a sense of general and most delightful struggling and confusion, in the midst of which Mr. Pickwick, with a gallantry which would have done honour to a descendant of Lady Trollumglower herself, took the old lady by the hand, led her beneath the mystic branch, and saluted her in all courtesy and decorum. The old lady submitted to this piece of practical politeness with all the dignity which befitted so important and serious a solemnity. But the younger ladies, not being so thoroughly imbued with the superstitious veneration of the custom, or imagining that the value of a salute is very much enhanced if it cost a little trouble to obtain it, screamed and struggled and ran into corners and threatened and remonstrated and did everything but leave the room, until some of the less adventurous gentlemen were on the point of desisting, when they all at once found it useless to resist any longer and submitted to be kissed with a good grace. Mr. Winkle kissed the young lady with the black eyes, and Mr. Snodgrass kissed Emily, and Mr. Weller, not being particular about the form of being under the mistletoe, kissed Emma and the other female servants just as he caught them. As to the poor relations, they kissed everybody, not even excepting the plainer portion of the young lady visitors, who in their excessive confusion ran right under the mistletoe directly it was hung up, without knowing it. Wardle stood with his back to the fire, surveying the whole scene with the utmost satisfaction, and the fat boy took the opportunity of appropriating to his own use and summarily devouring a particularly fine mince pie that had been carefully put by for somebody else. Now the screaming had subsided, and the faces were aglow and curls in a tangle, and Mr. Pickwick, after kissing the old lady as before mentioned, was standing under the mistletoe, looking with a very pleased countenance on all that was passing around him, when the young lady with the black eyes, after a little whispering with the other young ladies, made a sudden dart forward, and putting her arm around Mr. Pickwick's neck, saluted him affectionately on the left cheek. And before Mr. Pickwick distinctly knew what was the matter, he was surrounded by the whole body and kissed by every one of them. It was a pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick in the centre of the group, now pulled this way and then that, and first kissed on the chin and then on the nose and then on the spectacles, and to hear the peals of laughter which were raised on every side. But it was a still more pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick, blinded shortly afterwards with a silk handkerchief, falling up against the wall and scrambling into corners and going through all the mystery of blind man's buff with the utmost relish of the game till at last he caught one of the poor relations and then had to evade the blind man himself which he did with a nimbleness and agility that excited the admiration and applause of all beholders the poor relations caught just the people whom they thought would like it and when the game flagged got caught themselves when they were all tired of blind man's buff, there was a great game at Snapdragon, and when fingers enough were burned with that, and all the raisins gone, they sat down by the huge fire of blazing logs to a substantial supper and a mighty bowl of wassail, something smaller than an ordinary wash-house copper, in which the hot apples were hissing and bubbling with a rich look and a jolly sound that were perfectly irresistible. This, said Mr. Pickwick, looking around him, this is indeed comfort. Our invariable custom, replied Mr. Wardle. Everybody sits down with us on Christmas Eve as you see them now, servants and all, and here we wait till the clock strikes twelve to usher Christmas in, and while away the time with forfeits and old stories. Trundle, my boy, rake up the fire. Up flew the bright sparks and myriads as the logs were stirred, and the deep red blaze sent forth a rich glow that penetrated into the furthest corner of the room and cast its cheerful tint on every face. Come, said Wardle, a song, a Christmas song. I'll give you one in default of a better. Bravo, said Mr. Pickwick. Fill up, 
cried Wardle. It'll be two hours good before you see the bottom of the bowl through the deep rich colour of the wassail. Fill up all round, and now for the song. Thus saying, the merry old gentleman, in a good round sturdy voice, commenced without more ado. A Christmas carol. I care not for spring on his fickle wing. Let the blossoms and buds be born. He woos them amain with his treacherous rain, and he scatters them ere the morn. An inconstant elf, he knows not himself, or his own changing mind and hour. He'll smile in your face, and with wry grimace, he'll wither your youngest flower. Let the summer sun to his bright home run. He shall never be sought by me. When he's dim by a cloud, I can laugh aloud, and care not how sulky he be. For his darling child is the madness wild that sports in fierce fever's train, and when love is too strong, it don't last long, as many have found to their pain. A mild harvest night by the tranquil light of the modest and gentle moon has a far sweeter sheen for me, I ween, the broad and unblushing moon. But every leaf that awakens my grief as it lies beneath the tree, so let autumn air be never so fair, it by no means agrees with me. But my song I troll out for Christmas stout, the hearty, the true, and the bold. A bumper I drain, and with might and main, give three cheers for this Christmas old. We'll usher him in with a merry din that shall gladden his joyous heart, and we'll keep him up while this bite or sup in fellowship good will part. In his fine, honest pride, he scorns to hide one jot of his hard weather scars. They're no disgrace, for there's much the same trace on the cheeks of our bravest tars. And then again I sing till the roof doth ring, and it echoes from wall to wall to the stout old wight. Fair welcome tonight as the king of the seasons all. End of Christmas Eve at Mr. Wardle's from Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens Christmas in India by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dim dawn behind the tamarisks. The sky is saffron yellow, as the women in the village grind the corn. And the parrots seek the riverside, each calling to his fellow that the day, the staring eastern day, is born. O oh, the white dust on the highway, O oh, the stenches in the byway, O oh, the clammy fog that hovers over earth, and at home they're making merry neath the white and scarlet berry, what part of India's exiles in their mirth? Full day behind the tamarisks, the sky is blue and staring, as the cattle crawl a field beneath the yoke, and they bear one o'er the field path, who is past all hope or caring, to the gat below the curling wreaths of smoke. Call on Rama, going slowly, as ye bear a brother lowly. Call on Rama, he may hear perhaps your voice. With our hymn books and our psalters, we appeal to other altars. And today we bid good Christian men rejoice. High noon behind the tamarisks, the sun is hot above us, as at home the Christmas day is breaking wan. They will drink our hells at dinner, those who tell us how they love us, and forget us till another year be gone. Oh, the toil that knows no breaking, or the high vase ceaseless aching, or the black dividing sea and alien plain. Youth was cheap, wherefore we sold it. Gold was good, we hoped to hold it, and today we know the fullness of our gain. Grey dusk behind the tamarisks, the parrots fly together, as the sun is sinking slowly over home. And his last rays seem to mock us, shackled in a lifelong tether, That drags us back, howe'er so far we roam. Hard her service, poor her payment, She in ancient, tattered raiment, India, she the grim stepmother of our kind. In a year of life, be lent her, 
if a temple's shrine we enter, the door is shut, we may not look behind. Black night behind the tamarisks, the owls begin their chorus, as the conscience from the temple scream and bray. With the fruitless years behind us, and the hopeless years before us, let us honour, O oh, my brother, Christmas Day. Call a truce, then, to our labours. Let us feast with friends and neighbours, and be merry as the custom of our caste. For if faint and force the laughter, and if sadness follow after, we are richer by one mocking Christmas bust. End of Christmas in India by Rudyard Kipling Read by Jonathan Jones A Christmas Sermon by Robert Louis Stevenson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Sermon by the time this paper appears, I shall have been talking for twelve months, and it is thought I should take my leave in a formal and seasonable manner. Valedictory eloquence is rare, and deathbed sayings have not often hit the mark of the occasion. Charles II, wit and skeptic, a man whose life had been one long lesson in human incredulity, an easy-going comrade, a maneuvering king, remembered and embodied all his wit and scepticism, along with more than his usual good humour, in the famous, I am afraid, gentlemen, I am an unconscionable time a-dying. An unconscionable time a-dying. There is the picture, I am afraid, gentlemen, of your life and of mine. The sands run out, and the hours are numbered and imputed, and the days go by. And when the last of these finds us, we have been a long time a-dying. And what else? The very length is something, if we reach that hour of separation, undishonored. And to have lived it all, is doubtless, in the soldierly expression, to have served. There is a tale in Tacitus of how the veterans mutinied in the German wilderness, of how they mobbed Germanicus, clamoring to go home, and of how, seizing their general's hand, these old, war-worn exiles pressed his finger along their toothless gums. Sunt lacrimae rerum. This was the most eloquent of the songs of Simeon, and when a man has lived to a fair age, he bears his marks of service. He may have never been remarked upon the breach at the head of the army, at least he shall have lost his teeth on the camp bread. The idealism of serious people in this age of ours is of a noble character. It never seems to them that they have served enough. They have a fine impatience of their virtues. It were perhaps more modest to be singly thankful that we are no worse. It is not only our enemies, those desperate characters, it is we ourselves who know not what we do. Thence springs the glimmering hope that perhaps we do better than we think, that to scramble through this random business with hands reasonably clean, to have played the part of a man or woman with some reasonable fullness, to have often resisted the diabolic, and at the end to be still resisting it, is for the poor human soldier to have done Right well. To ask to see some fruit of our endeavor is but a transcendental way of serving for reward, and what we take to be contempt of self is only greed of hire. And again, if we require so much of ourselves, shall we not require much of others? If we do not genially judge our own deficiencies, is it not to be feared that we shall be even stern? to the trespasses of others? And he, who, looking back upon his own life, can see no more than that he has been unconscionably long a-dying, will he not be tempted to think 
his neighbor, unconscionably long of getting hanged? It is probable that nearly all who think of conduct at all think of it too much. It is certain we all think too much of sin. We are not damned for doing wrong, but for not doing right. Christ would never hear of negative morality. Thou shalt was ever his word, with which he superseded, Thou shalt not. To make our idea of morality center on forbidden acts is to defile the imagination, and to introduce into our judgments of our fellow men a secret element of gusto. If a thing is wrong for us, we should not dwell upon the thought of it, or we shall soon dwell upon it with inverted pleasure. If we cannot drive it from our minds, one thing of two. Either our creed is in the wrong, and we must indulgently remodel it, or else, if our morality be in the right, we are criminal lunatics, and should place our persons in restraint. A mark of such unwholesomely divided minds is the passion for interference with others. The fox without the tail was of this breed, but had, if his biographer is to be trusted, a certain antique civility, now out of date. A man may have a flaw, a weakness, that unfits him for the duties of life, that spoils his temper, that threatens his integrity, or that betrays him into cruelty. It has to be conquered. But it must never be suffered to engross his thoughts. The true duties lie all upon the farther side, and must be attended to with the whole mind so soon as this preliminary clearing of the decks has been effected. In order that he may be kind and honest, it may be needful he should become a total abstainer. Let him become so then, and the next day let him forget the circumstance. Trying to be kind and honest will require all his thoughts. A mortified appetite is never a wise companion. In so far as he has had to mortify an appetite, he will still be the worse man, and of such a one a great deal of cheerfulness will be required in judging life, and a great deal of humility in judging others. It may be argued again that dissatisfaction with our life's endeavor springs in some degree from dullness. We require higher tasks, because we do not recognize the height of those we have. Trying to be kind and honest seems an affair too simple and too inconsequential for gentlemen of our heroic mold. We had rather set ourselves to something bold, arduous, and conclusive. We had rather found a schism, or suppress a heresy, cut off a hand, or mortify an appetite. But the task before us, which is to co-endure with our existence, is rather one of microscopic fineness, and the heroism required is that of patience. There is no cutting of the Gordian knots of life. Each must be smilingly unraveled. To be honest, to be kind, to earn a little and to spend a little less, to make, upon the whole, a family happier for his presence, to renounce when that shall be necessary, and not be embittered, to keep a few friends, but these without capitulation, above all, on the same grim condition, to keep friends with himself. Here is a task for all that a man has of fortitude and delicacy. He has an ambitious soul who would ask more. He has a hopeful spirit who should look in such an enterprise to be successful. There is indeed one element in human destiny that not blindness itself can controvert. Whatever else we are intended to do, we are not intended to succeed. Failure is the fate allotted. It is so in every art and study. It is so, above all, in the continent art of living well. Here is a pleasant thought for the year's end, or for the end of life. Only self-deception will be satisfied, and there need be no despair for the despairer. But Christmas is not only the mile mark of another year, moving us to thoughts of self-examination, it is a season, from all its associations, whether domestic or religious, suggesting thoughts of joy. 
a man dissatisfied with his endeavors is a man tempted to sadness and in the midst of the winter when his life runs lowest and he is reminded of the empty chairs of his beloved it is well he should be condemned to this fashion of the smiling face noble disappointment noble self-denial are not to be admired not even to be pardoned if they bring bitterness it is one thing to enter the kingdom of heaven maim another to maim yourself and stay without and the kingdom of heaven is of the childlike of those who are easy to please who love and give pleasure mighty men of their hands the smiters and the builders and the judges have lived long and done sternly and yet have preserved this lovely character and among our carpet interests and two-penny concerns the shame were indelible if we should lose it gentleness and cheerfulness these come before all morality they are the perfect duties and it is the trouble with moral men that they have neither one nor other it was the moral man the pharisee whom christ could not away with if your morals make you dreary depend upon it they are wrong i do not say give them up for they may be all you have but conceal them like a vice lest they should spoil the lives of better and simpler people a strange temptation attends upon man to keep his eye on pleasures even when he will not share in them to aim all his morals against them this very year a lady singular iconoclast proclaimed a crusade against dolls and the racy sermon against lust is a feature of the age i venture to call such moralists insincere at any excess or perversion of a natural appetite their lyre sounds of itself with relishing denunciations but for all displays of the truly diabolic envy malice the mean lie the mean silence the calumnious truth the backbiter the petty tyrant the peevish poisoner of family life their standard is quite different these are wrong they will admit yet somehow not so wrong there is no zeal in their assault on them no secret element of gusto warms up the sermon it is for things not wrong in themselves that they reserve the choicest of their indignation a man may naturally disclaim all moral kinship with the reverend mr zola or the hobgoblin old lady of the dolls for these are gross and naked instances and yet in each of us some similar element resides the sight of a pleasure in which we cannot or else will not share moves us to a particular impatience it may be because we are envious or because we are sad or because we dislike noise and romping being so refined or because being so philosophic we have an overweighing sense of life's gravity at least as we go on in years we are all tempted to frown upon our neighbors pleasures people are nowadays so fond of resisting temptations here is one to be resisted they are fond of self-denial here is a propensity that cannot be too peremptorily denied there is an idea abroad among moral people that they should make their neighbors good one person i have to make good myself but my duty to my neighbor is much more nearly expressed by saying that i have to make him happy if i may happiness and goodness according to canting moralists stand in the relation of effect and cause there was never anything less proved or less probable our happiness is never in our own hands we inherit our constitution we stand buffet among friends and enemies we may be so built as to feel a sneer or an aspersion with unusual keenness and so circumstanced as to be unusually exposed to them we may have nerves very sensitive to pain and be afflicted with a disease very painful virtue will not help us and it is not meant to help us it is not even its own reward except for the self-centred and 
I almost said, the unamiable. No man can pacify his conscience, if quiet be what he want. He shall do better to let that organ perish from disuse, and to avoid the penalties of the law, and the minor capitis diminutio of social ostracism, is an affair of wisdom, of cunning, if you will, and not of virtue. In his own life, then, a man is not to expect happiness, only to profit by it gladly when it shall arise. He is on duty here. He knows not how or why, and does not need to know. He knows not for what hire, and must not ask. Somehow or other, though he does not know what goodness is, he must try to be good. Somehow or other, though he cannot tell what will do it, he must try to give happiness to others. And no doubt there comes in here a frequent clash of duties. How far is he to make his neighbor happy? How far must he respect that smiling face, so easy to cloud, so hard to brighten again? And how far, on the other side, is he bound to be his brother's keeper and the prophet of his own morality? How far must he resent evil? The difficulty is that we have little guidance. Christ's sayings on the point being hard to reconcile with each other, and, the most of them, hard to accept. But the truth of his teaching would seem to be this. In our own person and fortune, we should be ready to accept and to pardon all. It is our cheek we are to turn, our coat that we are to give away to the man who has taken our cloak. But when another's face is buffeted, perhaps a little of the lion will become us best. That we are to suffer others to be injured and stand by is not conceivable and surely not desirable. Revenge, says Bacon, is a kind of wild justice. Its judgments, at least, are delivered by an insane judge. And in our own quarrel, we can see nothing truly and do nothing wisely. But in the quarrel of our neighbor, let us be more bold. One person's happiness is as sacred as another's. When we cannot defend both, let us defend one with a stout heart. It is only in so far as we are doing this that we have any right to interfere. The defense of B is our only ground of action against A. A has as good a right to go to the devil as we have to go to glory, and neither knows what he does. The truth is that all these interventions and denunciations and militant mongerings of moral half-truths, though they be sometimes needful, though they are often enjoyable, do yet belong to an inferior grade of duties. Ill-temper and envy and revenge find here an arsenal of pious disguises. This is the playground of inverted lusts. With a little more patience and a little less temper, a gentler and wiser method might be found in almost every case. And the knot that we cut by some fine heady quarrel scene in private life or in public affairs by some denunciatory act against what we are pleased to call our neighbor's vices, might yet have been unwoven by the hand of sympathy. To look back upon the past year, and see how little we have striven, and to what small purpose, and how often we have been cowardly and hung back, or temerarious and rushed unwisely in, and how every day and all day long we have transgressed the law of kindness, it may seem a paradox, but in the bitterness of these discoveries a certain consolation resides. Life is not designed to minister to a man's vanity. He goes upon his long business most of the time with a hanging head, and all the time like a blind child, full of rewards and pleasures as it is, so that to see the daybreak or the moon rise or to meet a friend, or to hear the dinner call when he is hungry, fills him with surprising joys. This world is yet, for him, no abiding city. Friendships fall through. Health fails. Weariness assails him. Year after year, he must thumb the hardly varying record of his own weakness and folly. It is a friendly process of detachment. 
when the time comes that he should go there need be few illusions left about himself here lies one who meant well tried a little failed much surely that may be his epitaph of which he need not be ashamed nor will he complain at the summons which calls a defeated soldier from the field defeated yes if he were paul or marcus aurelius but if there is still one inch of fight in his old spirit undishonored the faith which sustained him in his lifelong blindness and lifelong disappointment will scarce even be required in this last formality of laying down his arms give him a march with his old bones there out of the glorious sun-coloured earth out of the day and the dust and the ecstasy there goes another faithful failure from a recent book of verse where there is more than one such beautiful and manly poem i take this memorable piece it says better than i can what i love to think let it be our parting word a late lark twitters from the quiet skies and from the west where the sun his day's work ended lingers as in content there falls on the old gray city an influence luminous and serene a shining peace the smoke ascends in a rosy and golden haze the spires shine and are changed in the valley shadows rise the lark sings on the sun closing his benediction sinks and the darkening air thrills with the sense of the triumphing night night with her train of stars and her great gift of sleep so be my passing my task accomplished and the long day done my wages taken and in my heart some late lark singing let me be gathered to the quiet west the sundown splendid and serene death end of a christmas sermon by robert louis stevenson the christmas symbol by harriet monroe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Thomas Peter As I write, the windows are wide open, and the russet and yellow leaves still linger on the city trees under an Indian summer sun. But winter is coming. Soon snowflakes will sift the boughs bare and scurry through human senses and imaginings. Winter will drive us to cover, force us to take refuge indoors from the vastness of the world. We shall gather under roofs, around blazing logs, and enact the annual Christmas drama which challenges the immensity of space with its audacious assertion of the immensity of life. Full of little symbols in this drama, for only through small symbols have we power to assert immensities. Minute sparks of life that we are, we can measure suns only by our own light, and the infinite only by our feeble reach. We build a house to compress to a cell our tiny world, to bound it with walls and comforts, to shut out the keen winds and the questioning stars. We kindle a fire on the hearth to flatter our flesh with warmth against the encompassing chill of space and dreams. We gather together, we talk, we love to cajole the stark loneliness of the soul. We create children in statues, pictures and poems, to assert the continuity of life, the immortality of thought. We order our little days and places into habits and harmonies and rhythms, to ward off confusion and futility, and make a pattern of beauty against threatening chaos. We move darkly as in a dream, brightly as in a dance, carrying our little tapers of faith from mystery to mystery, our little tapers shining against the void. And we please our fancies with delicate detail. We pluck a pine tree from the forest to remind us of ancestral campfires, giving it a ceiling for the sky, tinsel for clouds, and gay little lights for stars. 
we have become children again to hang toys on its boughs, and happy little Christ-child legends drawn from the richly stored past of the credulous world. And through all the childish symbols we behold the mightier symbol, the Christ-life of humanity, its birth out of the virgin earth, its growth through harsh and toilsome ages, its search for truth, its faith in divine beauty, its tragic agony, its crucifixion and obliteration in darkness, and finally, its ultimate resurrection in inextinguishable spiritual life. End of The Christmas Symbol by Harriet Monroe A Cubist Christmas by Kate Masterson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker A Cubist Christmas by Kate Masterson The snow popped up and rattled like rice in the low, lush mistletoe marsh. The chimes swung thick on a sickle of ice and jangled a discord harsh. And the herringbone and the pickle jar, why, that was a Christmas tree. And the glibbering, globular glint was a star, but not to you and me. And off to the right, where the candles grew, was a goglet that made you glare. Pink and yellow and green and blue, it was something descending the stair, carrying a slosh of sugar of lead, powdered with spangled ink. You couldn't say if twas living or dead, but wouldn't it make you think? That centipede doing the turkey trot, it seems was a Christmas kiss. You should keep one eye on the nineteenth leg, and the other eye shut like this. And oh, the moon in the oilcloth glow, and the bath spray burst in bloom. Twas holly and evergreen all in a row, if the artist had had more room. Oh, where is the blazing pudding of plum, and dear old Santy C, who skidded over the rooftops some on his annual Christmas spree? And where is the trusty Yule Logs flare that we used to read about? They are all in that lunatic diagram there. The thing is to find them out. End of A Cubist Christmas by Kate Masterson Drei König von Peter Rosegger dies ist eine LibriVox-Aufnahme. Alle LibriVox-Aufnahmen sind lizenzfrei und im öffentlichen Besitz. Weitere Informationen und Hinweise zur Beteiligung an diesem Projekt gibt es auf LibriVox.org. Gelesen von Janet Melek. Sittenbilder aus dem steirischen Oberlande von Peter Rosegger. Drei König. Man soll's kaum glauben. Aber die Dreikönigsnacht ist die wichtigste unter den heiligen Nächten des ganzen Jahres. Das ist die letzte der drei Weihnächte, in welchen der Bauer in Haus und Hof den Rundgang macht und sein Besitztum beräuchert und besprengt, auf das Heil und Segen sei in Stall und Vorratskammer und Scheune. Von diesen Rundgängen am Christ- und Neujahrsabend unterscheidet sich der heutige dadurch, dass in demselben nicht bloß beräuchert und besprengt, sondern auch auf allen Türen und Toren mit der Kreide ein dreifaches Kreuz gezeichnet wird. Das ist gut für jegliche Hexerei. Und die Kreide hat außerdem noch die Kraft, dass sie, wenn man mit ihr einen Drudenfuß auf die Betten zeichnet, in der Nacht die Gespenster abhält. Wer ist der beste Zeichner im Hause? Derselbe komme nun und schreibe auf die Stubentür schön und zierlich die heiligen drei Könige. 
mit den dazugehörigen Kreuzen und der Jahreszahl an beiden Enden, wie es Brauch und Sitte ist seit uralter Zeit. 18 C. plus M. plus B. 70 Das sind die Heiligen Drei Könige. Und die bleiben nun stehen an der Tür bis zum nächsten Weihnachtsfeste, wo sie die Magd mit dem Besen wegfegt, weil im Laufe des Jahres nicht bloß einer der Weisen, sondern gar alle drei schwarz geworden sind. Nachdem nun die Zeichnung fertig geworden, kommt die Zeit zum Essen. Diese Nacht heißt auch die Dreimalnacht, weil in derselben drei Male auf den Tisch kommen, welche aus neun verschiedenen Musgerichten den neun Koch bestehen sollten. Da gab es früher Haber, Roggen, Weizen, Milch, Äpfelmus und so weiter. Jetzt zieht man's vor, statt den neun Kochen neun andere Gerichte zu wählen. Wozu der Formenzwang? Die Hauptsache ist doch nur, dass viel gegessen wird. Aber gegessen, sagt der Bauer, müsse heute auch so viel werden, dass keiner imstande sei, sich von selbst in das Bett zu legen, sondern sich einer auf den anderen und der letzte auf die Ofengabel zu stützen genötiget wäre, um so ohne Gefahr für den reichlich versehenen Bauch auf den Boden zu gelangen. Für das junge, ledige Volk ist das übrigens wohl nicht angezeigt, denn das hat heute noch zu später Abendstunde ein wichtiges Geschäft. Wenn nämlich eines oder das andere wissen will, ob es in diesem Jahre heiraten wird, und das will eines oder das andere immerhin wissen, so geht es hinaus in den Hof wo die Fichtenäste der zubereiteten Streu aufgeschichtet sind. Von diesen nimmt es einen Arm voll und eilt damit in das Haus zurück. Im Hause werden die Äste gezählt und da zeigt es sich. Hat die betreffende Person die gerade Zahl erwischt, so heiratet sie noch in diesem Jahre. Hat sie aber die ungerade so nun, so glaubt sie einfach nicht daran. Und wenn man an derlei nicht glaubt, so hat es auch nichts zu bedeuten. Wer viel Geld haben will, der gehe in der Dreikönigsnacht auf einen Kreuzweg. Das heißt, auf einen Punkt, wo sich die Wege kreuzen. Dorthin kommt ein kleines, buckliges Männlein. Und das muss man ansprechen und beschwören. Das Männlein gibt hierauf neun Fragen, welche man sofort beantworten muss, ohne dabei die drei Wörtlein Ja, Nein und Ich auszusprechen. Trifft man das, so bekommt man einen Hut voll Taler. Aber das Männlein ist niemand anderer als der Böse. Da ist vor wenigen Jahren der alte Strohdecker Urban auf den Kreuzweg gegangen. Und der Urban ist gar schlau und hat stets gemeint, er sei gescheiter wie so ein dummer Teufel. Frägt ihn das Männlein, weißt du, wer heute auf den Kreuzweg geht? Der Teufel, antwortet jener. Bist du denn der Teufel? Bin ein armer Teufel. Höre, wenn du ein armer Teufel bist, so sage jetzt Ja oder Nein und ich schenke dir zwei goldene Stiefel. Dann wäre ich ein dummer Teufel. Hörst du, jetzt hast du schon verspielt. Dumm darfst du nicht sagen. Dumm darf man sagen. Und so beantwortete der Urban dem Männlein acht Fragen und glaubte schon gewonnen zu haben. Da fragt der Böse plötzlich, sag an, um welche drei Worte handelt es sich? Hol mich der Teufel, wenn ich dir's sag, schreit der Urban. 
So komm denn, bin auch ein armer Teufel, lacht das Männlein. Und der Orban lacht auch, weil er den Schuster Hartl erkennt. Der Decker Urban mag's nicht recht leiden, wenn man dieses Geschichtchen erzählt. Aber beim Male in der Dreikönigsnacht erzählt man sich's immer und immer wieder. Nach derlei Wunderbarem und Geheimnisvollem bricht endlich der Festmorgen an. Kaum ist die Sonne über die beschneiten Waldberge herauf, so bewegt sich ein neuer, Sonderbarer Aufzug durch das Dorf. Es sind merkwürdige Gäste. Voran hüpft ein Junge einher und trägt auf einer langen Stange einen großen, goldenen Stern. Diesem folgt die jubelnde Schuljugend in ihrem bunten Anzug. Und endlich kommen gar drei große Herren in goldenen Gewändern. All dem voraus sind zwei weiße Engel mit goldenen Flügeln und diese singen, um die Leute in den Häusern auf die nahende Schar aufmerksam zu machen. Hiasl he, was müsst es sein? Jetzt kommen die Zigeiner in unser Lund herein. Ich weiß nicht, seien es Krawotten? Ich kenn's noch nicht recht. Ich sag ganzer Schippel, dass man es kaum zählen möchte. Es ist ein gestrafliches Wesen, ein ketzenmäßiges Geschrei. Und wann das unser Amtmann hört, so führt er es einig Sie hoben ja a Pukwe. Es ist schier a Graus. Man meint ja, sie hätten schon viel da verplündert aus. Sie hoben rare Mirne und Buglade raus. Sie machen lonke Kragner, als wird da Franz Haus. Ohne, der ist a cool schwarzer Mann dabei. Just wird der schwarz Toni in unseren Kälber gei. Ohne, der hat a ganz Trüherl voll Gold. Oi, wann er sie daust besinnertet, und mir es schenken wollt. In Weihrach, den rach ich nicht, hon e gestern kracht, und de Mürn sei ma z'hanti, zu bitter, dass i ma's Maul verderben tat. Und seht, nun stehen sie selbst schon vor der Tür, es sind die heiligen drei Könige aus dem Morgenland, in der Mitte der Moor mit dem kohlschwarzen Gesicht. Oft, wenn ein Überzähliges mit Schmuck und Kleidung aufkommen kann, sind auch vier heilige drei Könige. Nun singen sie den Weihnachtsgruß. Sie singen vom falschen Herodes, von dem Stern, vom holden Jesu Kindlein. Sie singen von Gold, Weihrauch und Myrren. Oh, nichts sonst haben sie gemeinsam mit den drei Weisen aus Osten als die Myrren, die bitteren Myrren. Sie, die da glitzern in Rauschgold und Sonnenpracht und die da singen von Edelgestein und goldenen Kronen, sie sind nur da, um vor der Türe des Wohlhabenden ein Stücklein Brot zu erbitten. Es sind die Ärmsten der Gemeinde. Ende von Drei König Peter Rosegger Dim Rizdwiana Kazka Volodymyra Winnyczenka Цей звукозапис зроблено для сайту LibriVox. Усі звукозаписи LibriVox є суспільним надбанням. Щоб отримати більш докладну інформацію або зареєструватися в якості волонтера, будь ласка, відвідайте сайт LibriVox.org. Читає Солуха Анастасія.
ласкавий читач умій. Розкажу тобі казку. Я знаю, ти звик на різдвяні свята послухати казки. Я знаю, ти і без свята завжди охочий до неї. Ти завжди, як пелюшками дитину, любиш обгортувати свою душу казками і колисати її, наспівуючи про чудодіїв котів, що навівають солодкі сни. Я знаю, ти завжди охочий обгорнути своє серце в найбрудніші дранця, щоб захистити його від сурового вітру життя. Обгорни же моєю казкою, вона тепла, як те дранця, яким обгортаються старці. Вона тепла, як залізо кайданів, вона мелодична, як пісня страждання і неволі. Слухай же, ласкавий читачу, моєї казки. Діялось все, діялось все, не тоді, як людей було трохи, а тоді вже, як було їх багато, дуже багато. І не тоді все діяло з читачу, як по річках та ставках текло молоко та меди, а як в річки та ставки текли морями сльози під. З цього, слухай же, і почалося усе. В тих місцях читачу, де падав сей під, сі сльози, там стала земля, Парувати. Стала земля парувати, стала та пара здійматись угору, стала рости і зробилася з неї велика хмара життя. І де більше лилося того поту, тих сліз, то все більше росла тая хмара, велика хмара життя. А як дійшла вона до своєї пори, то родилося з неї двоє дітей, двоє синів життя. Вперед і назад родились вони. І як тільки родились, так стали люто ворогувати між собою, стали люто битись вони між собою, всі сини життя. Бо те, з чого плакав вперед, з того назад сміявся, а з чого співав вперед, з того назад лютував. Бо вперед любив сонце, боротьбу і людей, а назад... Що любив назад? Що ж, як не те, що боїться сонця, боротьби і людей? Бо вперед любив сонце, боротьбу і людей, а через все він встромляв сим людям у груди замість серця пекучі жарини. Він давав їм неспокійні, колючі думки, хльоскав їх голодом і страхіттями життя. Він вливав їм у жили жагучого раювання побід, боротьби, гнівом і гордістю очі запалював їм. І сі люди ішли, і тяглися за ним, і раділи, і страждали. А назад виймав людям серце, клав на місце його холодну, ненажерливу, Жабу, яка глитала радощі життя, глитала вогонь його та світло, і завжди була холодна та чорна. Назад обгортав людей золотом, обковував сим трухлявим, отруйним золотом, яке боялося сокири думки. Назад обкурював людей чадом лінощів і спокою, і люди боялись руху і праці, боялись великого хвилювання. Через це вони любили назада і не любили окутаних злитнями, неспокійних, гнівних людей вперед. Через це люди 
Бились. Через все лилась кров і сльози, і піт, і якими годувалися жаби людей назад. І де більше лилось цього всього, там більше росли та бились вперед і назад ці сини життя. Отож, читачу, в одній країні, де не молоко текло в річках, а кров у річки, там боролись між собою сі два сини життя. Ох, люто боролись вони, і був зверху то вперед, то назад, то знову вперед, то знову назад. І коли перетягував вперед, то сонце весело сміялось, і ставала... Весна, і каміння цвітом цвіло, і риби співали, мовчазні полохливі риби. А коли перетягував назад, то ставала тьма, і сонце ховалось, а в тьмі лютувала Негода, вияли квіти життя, і люди гризли людей. Люди хапали младенців, і головами їх били мокрі з крови каміння. Люди пороли черева матерів і волочили кишки їх, топчучи ногами. Люди за хвилину вбивали сотні людей. І підіймалась до байтужого неба крівавая пара, І чад душного страждання стелився по землі. І чад той дурманив розум, І люди самі гризли собі серця, Точили свою кров, І в страшенній тьмі ворогів обіймали, А друзів... Душили. О, я знаю, читачу, ти не віриш мені. Не вір і не бійсь, мій читачу. Це ж казка. Це тільки казка. Це ж тільки в казках бувають страхіття. Не бійсь і не думай. Бо як вдумаєшся, як хочеш збагнути все страхіття сеї казки – то запалиться спокійне серце твоє, і згорить брудне і тепле дрантя його, і стане воно болючою червоною жариною. І не будуть коти чудодії навівати тобі більш спокійних снів після смачної святочної вечері. Отож, слухай читачу, в один такий час... Коли в тій країні стояла чадна тьма, коли пугачі пугали на темних могилах і гор доходив по змордованих трупах назад, сей назад зустрівся з впередом. Но, посміхнувся назад, скоряєшся, чи ще хочеш битись? А хіба на землі не мав же ні радущів, ні мук, щоб я не схотів більше битись? Промовив вперед. Хіба вже всюди у грудях червоні пекучі жарини згоріли на сірий байдужий попіл? Хіба скрізь уже розум людський, все просторе і хмарне небо, де б'ють вогневі блискавиці, зійшов на стояче тягуче болото, де ледве ворушаться черви думки? «А що? Як скрізь?» – скрикнув назад. Вперед посміхнувся. «Ну, а що? Як скрізь? Скоряєшся тоді?» Жадно повторив назад. «І будеш служити мені!» «Скоряюсь і буду служити», – промовив вперед. «Добре, коли так, 
то ходім, ходім, я покажу тобі тих, у яких були великі найбільші жарини. Я покажу тобі тих, які блискали попереду всіх вогневими блискавицями. Найкращих твоїх покажу. Гляди ж. Ходім, посміхнувся вперед. І вони полетіли. Небо ночі з морозу було темне, глибоке, а зорі розчервонілись і весело дрібно підстрибували, щоб зогрітись. Внизу спала земля, а може й не спала, а тільки думала щось велике і таємне. Села, убогі на радість, багаті на сльози, Обідрені села, скорчившись, лежали в ярах та балках, мов старча та в рівчаках, силкуючись нагріти собою своє тоще нещасне тіло. Хуга гралася снігом і сипала ним із степів на беззахисні села, не знаючи, що їм і так занадто холодно. Вперед і назад зупинились над городом. Він не спав і горів ріжними вогнями, пускаючи от себе в темне небо широке срібне сяєво. На краю його, аж у полі, там, де не було його веселих вогнів, стояв темний великий будинок. Наче виштовханий от себе тими будинками города, самотою стояв він і залісно вишкаряв на їх довгі ряди своїх вікон. Обведений високим муром, він одгородив себе від тих веселих, скупчених будиночків і понуро мовчав. Круг стін його ходили якісь люди з залізом для вбивання і часами нудливо пронизувато свистіли. День у день вони ходили і свистіли, і пильно дивились на всі боки, і не підпускали нічого живого до мурів самотнього будинку. «Дивись тепер!» – сказав назад. І вперед став дивитись. Стіни стали, як скло, весь же будинок і все, що було там в йому, стало видно, як на долоні. Знаєш, читачу мій, ти цей будинок. Це не будинок, це скриня, здоровенна, мертва скриня, зроблена з каменя, старого, промоклого слізми. Каменя. А висяся скриня поділена на клітки, схожі одна на одну, як один арештантський халат на другий. По клітках же тих усе люди, і люди, і люди. Повна скриня людей, стара, прокіпчена муками скриня. Став дивитись вперед. І став впізнавати він тих людей за тих, які йшли за ним, які мали у грудях червоні пекучі жарини. І побачив вперед, що не було їм у грудях жарин тих, не було замість серця ні жарин, ні попілу, а був тільки дим, густий, бурий, гнітучий дим. І бачив вперед, як цей дим піднімався їм у голови, і видно було йому, як від цього чаділи їх думки, як мляво вони рухались. Видно було, як бились вони об стіни кліток, як товклись одна об одну, як від цього вони обтирались, робились маленькими, плескуватими, нікчемними. Дим сей проходив їм в кров, і руки їм були безживні, байдужі, ліниві, 
а на блідих сірих обличчях не сміялася ніжність, не світились вони раювання. Ах, вперед бачив, що дим сей пройшов їм у очі, у їх тверді, блискучі, горді очі, і від його вони стали п'яними, тупими, темними. І мовчки дивився вперед, як тупо рухалися люди в клітках своїх, як мляво бились їх душі об стіни сих кліток, безсило падаючи назад у задимлений мозок. Мовчки дивився він, як стіни кліток насували на їх, стискували, мов, пресом їх груди, і груди стискувались болем а з них видушувались сльози. І сльози ці падали на серце, шкварчали на жару його. І від того ішов у той дим. А з диму того часами запалювались і гасли вогники. Вогники отчаю, маленької злости, маленького суму, поганенькі. Смердючі вогники, от яких тільки чаділо. І не бачив вперед тих ниток вогневих, Що в'язали, вздимали вогонь колись їх жарини. А були сі люди самотні, кожний сам по собі, Кожний чужий до усіх. І тупо, Мляво рухались, кищіли, як черви, сі люди, в яких замість серця були колись в грудях червоні, болючі жарини. І мовчки дивився на їх вперед. Тоді посміхнувся назад і спитав, «Ну що, де ж жар їх?» «Я не бачу ні жару, ні попілу», – тихо промовив вперед. У їх в грудях дим, їм треба вітру. Хіба ти хочеш, щоб вітер розметав попіл? Я не бачу ні жару, ні попілу, сказав вперед. Ти не бачиш? Ну, ходім до їх ближче. Я покажу тобі сей попіл. Ходім. Стіни скрині. Стали знову кам'яними, брудними, продіравленими рядами загартованих вікон, з яких вибивалось безсилеє, млявеє світло. Знову видно було, як ся скриня, ся голова величезного страховища злісно вишкиряла свої жовті зуби, ждучи, щоб глитнути веселі вогники города. Назад і вперед незримо пройшли порожним подвір'ям і ввійшли через замкнені грубі двері у скриню. Темними сходами, по яких бігала луна, пройшли вони до других замкнених дверей і безшумно пройшли і крізь їх. Опинились вони в довгій, низькій норі, в якій не було нічого, крім рядів замкнених дверей з обох боків, двох лямп на стелі, що понуро переморгувались між собою з двох кінців її, та одного чоловіка з пучком ключей за поясом. Чоловік сей сидів у кутку і тупо дивився перед себе, і круг його застигла тиша, таємнича, важка. А на тлі її десь виривались приглушені стінами звуки людських голосів, і вітер, заблудившись у коміні, безнадійно й жалібно плакав за волею. Назад і вперед безшумно підійшли до замкнених дверей, незримо пройшли крізь їх і стали в одній із тих кліток. Сіра і гола, як череп порожній, вона дивилась в темну ніч своїми двома вікнами очима і мовчала. З обох боків їй були широкі і довгі помости, на яких лежали й сиділи люди, а посередині стояв довгий, голий 
і старий, як спорохніла домовина, стіл. На домовині сій стояла лямпочка, нещасна, підсліпувата, як знівечена життям бабуся, і боязко, несміло блимала своїм світличком, мов залякана тьмою, що насувала на неї з кутків черепа. А коло неї сиділо троє людей. Двоє з їх сували якісь чорні й білі баньки по столі, на якому були намальовані квадратики, а третій – широкими щелепами і смуглявим, як стара кістка лицем, дивився на їх руки і квадратики. І у всіх трьох обличчя були тупі, мляві, байдужі. І по клітці від стіни до стіни ходив хлопчик, рум'яненький, кучерявий хлопчик з дитячим легким пухом на щоках і не дитячими тяжкими кайданами на дитячих ногах. Він ходив, розкаряючи ноги, а кайдани теліпались йому у колосих ніг, бились об їх і різко, без ладу, брязкотіли. На помості ж лежали темні постаті людей, а на головах їм лежав важкий, незграбний сон і тупо давив всі голови до помосту. Череп мовчав, а в йому, як скрегіт зубів його, брязкотіли кайдани кучерявого хлопчика. Хлопчик часами ставав, поправляв пояс, до якого чіплялись кайдани, і придавлював в очах блиск гордощів і задоволення. Потім знову ходив, знову слухав, як брязчали кайдани. А в кутку на помості лежав чоловік з блідим лицем і, не придавлюючи блиску очей своїх, також слухав той брязкіт кайданів. І бачив вперед, що той брязкіт через дим не доходив до вух серця їх, і не могли вони почути, про що брязкотіли кайдани. Не могли вони почути, як брязкотіли вони про те, яка тепла кров в цього хлопчика, і як любо їм, цим холодним кайданам, пити кров цю дитячу. Вони не могли бачити, як вип'ють ці кайдани рум'янець і блиск очей хлопчика, як отпадуть з його ніг вже тоді сі дві залізні холодні гадюки, коли не буде вже більше у хлопчика теплої любої крови. І бачив вперед, що не було вогневої нитки між ними, а був тільки дим, а в диму горіло по вогнику. Один вогник – задоволення, а другий – поганенький жовтий вогник – роздратування. Хлопчик знов зупинився, поклав ногу на лаву і, неначе поправляючи, став гратись блискучими міцними гатюками. Залізо брязкало різдзвінко огидливо. Жовтий вогник спалахнув у грудях блідого чоловіка і раптом виштовхнув цілий пук слів. «Годі вам брязкать там своїми ідіотськими кайданами! Що це таке справді? Дайте ж спокій нам!» Хлопчик перестав гратись і, повернувшись до блідого чоловіка, здивовано спитав. «Що таке?» «Таке?» «Що надокучили своїми кайданами! Спать через вас не можна! Дістали, то й лежіть тихо, а любуватись нема чого!» Ті, що сиділи за столом, ті, що мертво лежали, заворушились і стали дивитись до блідого чоловіка. Хлопчик ніяково посміхнувся і зняв ногу з лави. «Хой пограється!» Байдуже насмішкувато вилетів з темного кутка чийсь голос. Він, як родився, все ждав їх, та ж тепер дістав. 
хлопчик сів на лаву і, почервонівши, мовчав. І бачив вперед, як стиснулись груди йому, як видавили вони гарячу сльозу, і сльоза та впала на серце, і прорізала великий слід у йому, і клубом піднявся дим у грудях йому. А чоловік з блідим лицем устав з помосту і заходив по клітці, залісно откидачи злоба блискуче волосся. «А ви теж не ходіть!» – раптом вилетів от помосту новий голос. «Чого ж самі стукаєте ногами?» «Інтелігента можна!» – засміявся насмішкуватий голос. Чоловік з блідим лицем ходив, відкидаючи злоба волосся, не дивлячись туди, звідки вилітали голоси. Він весело дивився собі в груди, де горів жовтий злий вогник. «Інтелігентам все можна», – задумано сказав чоловік смуглявим, як стара кістка, лицем. Їм усе можна, так усе можна, що вже й кайданами не брязкай, а робочий плювать на робочого. Він звик свинею жити. Правильно, тупо сказав його сусіда і посунув рукою чорну баньку. Ви говорите дурниці, глухо сказав, не зупиняючись, чоловік з блідим лицем. «Та звісно, ми дурні, ми не вчились, і справді дурні, що не вчились, а робили весь вік, щоб ви могли вчитись». Тоді чоловік з блідим лицем зупинився, ще більш поблід, і почав говорити. І бачив вперед, що він говорив те, що йшло йому від жовтого вогника і диму. І бачив вперед, як сі слова, нагріті жовтим вогником і прокоптілі димом, влітали в мозок і груди тим людям, а в грудях тим людям починали горіти теж жовті зелі вогники, і вогники сі виштовхували з язика колючі, ущіпливі слова, несправедливі, смердючі, слова сі гасали по клітці, Поганили повітря, і важко стало дихати від їх. «Ну що, де їх жар?» – спитав назад вперед. «Дим їм у грудях», – сумно промовив вперед і пішов з тої клітки. «Ти або впертий, або сліпий», – сказав назад і повів його в другу клітку. Тут теж боя зкоблимала залякана лямпочка і теж повзла на неї тьма з кутків клітки. Люди ж ходили, сиділи, лежали, і всі вони не мовчали й не балакали, а ту, подивлячись поперед себе, роззявляли роти й виштовхували з грудей довгі, голосні низки звуків. Вони співали. І бачив вперед, що темно було їм у грудях, і не було в йому навіть вогників, а тільки дим. Вони співали про впереда й назада, двох синів життя, але не горіло їм світло у грудях. Вони байдуже, мляво й тупо співали про пекуче горе, про радість побіди, про батька двох синів, життя. Вони палки слова гніву, горді слова боротьби обгортали сірими, крикливими низками звуків і мляво, одноманітно виштовхували їх в клітку. І слова сі, сі іскри вогневі, що втягують в єдине Полум'я жарини сердець, сі горючі слова, не гріли їм серця задимленого, не кололи мозка сплячого. Вони бились об стіни клітки і верталися в ухасим людям холодним порохом. А люди 
Знов виштовхувала їх, знов волочила їх задимленими устами, і не горіли від їх, і не чули їх. Вони співали. І страшно було від цього всій клітці, як від мертвяків, що з блідо холодними лицями танцюють своїми задубілими, безживленими ногами палкий, жагучий танець життя. «Ну що, де їх жар?» – спитався назад. «Дим їм великий у грудях». Сумно промовив вперед і тихо вийшов з тої клітки. «Ти впертий!» – з досадою скрикнув назад і повів його в третю клітку. Тут було шумно, люди не лежали мертвими трупами, і тьма наче одсунулась в кутки, боячись крику. Сі люди рухались, і рухались думки їх. Думки їх напружено пнулись, робились гострими і цупко хопались за кожне слово, що літало в сій клітці. Тут балакали і змагались про двох синів життя – впереда і назада. «Для побіди народу треба насамперед його з'єднання». З притиском і запалом говорив один з тих людей, шарпуючи себе за борідку. «Треба кожну прояву життя його використовувати для сього. Треба кожний атом сил його бережно збирати і складати докупи. І от з цього погляду я не можу признати певною тактику наших противників. Ні, помиляються ті, що думають, ніби сила народу в тому, щоб заплющувати йому очі на життя. Ми бажаємо повного життя, ми бажаємо повного щастя, треба ж і повними силами здобувати його». Він говорив з притиском і запалом, подивляючись часом на чоловіка з кучерявим чубом, що ходив по клітці і зелісно ловив його слова, покручуючи вуса. Чоловік з кучерявим чубом хопав всі слова, поспішно, як яблука, перевертав їх туди й сюди і, знайшовши гниле місце, злорадно откладав їх у бік. А чоловік з борідкою подивлявся на його і залісно посміхався. Вони змагались про впереда й назада, про з'єднання людей впереда, але бачив вперед, що самі вони були самотні, і кожний був чужий кожному. І бачив вперед тільки дим їм у грудях, а в диму блищали маленькі вогники злости. І не бачив вперед там тої жарини, яка випіка роздратування і горить великим гнівом і великою злістію. І бачив вперед, що не за його бились і гризлись ці люди думками, а з диму гнітучого – за злість свою маленьку. Чоловік з борідкою скінчив і почав говорити чоловік з кучерявим чубом. Він виймав гнилі, откладені в бік слова і став шпурляти ними в лице хазяїну їх. Він обливав їх піною свого задимленого маленького роздротування і ляпав ними в лице противникови. Він злорадісно посміхавсь і шпурляв своїм роздратуванням в лице противникові, і противник від того кусав його поглядами, а в клітці стояв сміх і крики. І бачив вперед, що не за його бились ці люди думками. І довго говорив чоловік з кучерявим чубом, а чоловік з борідкою лежав на помості і не рухався. «Одчиніть вікно!» – раптом крикнув чийсь голос. «Не треба! Холодно!» 
Очиняйте, не треба! Хотіли і не хотіли, крики змішалися. Сміх з роздратуванням. А чоловік з кучерявим чубом нетерпляче ждав. Тоді чоловік з борідкою, що лежав і не рухався, підвівся і сердито сказав. «Я не дозволю очиняти вікна! Я хворий!» Тоді той, що ждав, той, що хотів, щоб його слухали далі, рішуче підбіг до вікна і очинив його настіж. І побачив вперед, як в грудях противника його спалахнув злий вогник, і з вогника того стрибнуло слово. «Погонець!» І побачив вперед, як слово се встрибнуло в груди чоловіка з кучерявим чубом, ввірвалося в дим, запалило жовті вогники і струсило кров йому. І бачили всі, що були там, як замахнулась рука чоловіка з кучерявим чубом і з ляскотом впала на лице чоловіка з борідкою. І тихо стало. Десь далеко із темної ночі бігли в клітки крізь вікно звуки життя, і холодно дихав мороз білою парою. І видно було в передові, як в грудях тим людям в диму загорілися вогники сорому і шугнули горячою кров'ю в лице. Мовчки сів ударений чоловік і серед мовчання ліг головою униз на помост. «Ну що, де їх жар?» – спитався назад. «Дим їм у грудях, великий їм дим», – сумно промовив вперед. «А попілу не бачиш?» «Я не бачу ні попілу, ні жару». Тоді злісно і мовчки схопився назад і потяг впереда ще в одну клітку. Тут теж було шумно, тут також сміялись, але не сміхом радощів, не тим сміхом сміялися тут, що пада росою на висохлу душу, а сміхом диму, сухим і крикливим. Серед клітки ж і сміху стояв чоловік в синій сорочці, проти чоловіка в чорній сорочці. Стоячи і похмуро дивлячись униз, чоловік говорив. «Ви, товаришу старосто, обижаєте нашу камеру, їй-богу, обижаєте!» «Ну от!» – нетерпляче скрикнув чоловік у чорній сорочці – «Ще один! Ви дасте мені спокій сьогодні, чи ні? Чого вам треба?» «Нам треба, щоб ви той, щоб ви по совістю робили. Ви он другим даєте всякі пундики, а нам оселедці та оселедці. Який же тут порядок? Комуна, так значить, треба, щоб всім нарівно». А ви, як інтелігенту, так що лучше, а нам, мужикам, що гірше. Або от папіросники. Ви дали нам три папіросники на всю камеру, а ті забрали його власність і не дають нікому. Що ж то за комуна така? Соціалістам так не годиться робить». «Товаришу, при соціалізмі будуть власники на папіросники!» Зачувся ззаду крик і сміх. «Та мовчіть ви там, ради Бога!» З досадою озирнувся чоловік у чорній сорочці. «Що вам, товаришу, треба от мене? Що? Я несправедливо роздаю їжу?» Обижаю? Ну, то вибирайте собі другого. Хай робить краще. Годі. Що вам треба? Папіросників? Нема. Тютюну? Нема. Нічого нема, бо зволі нічого нам не дають. 
чоловік у синій сорочці вислухав і знову, потупившись, почав. «Ото сусідів смажать собі м'ясо, бо вони не віддають його в комуну. А, а ми що, мужики, нам м'яса не носять. Ну, то ріжте мене і смажте, ріжте, нате, ріжте!» У клітці засміялись. Чоловік у синій сорочці підвів голову, і видно було впередові, як світились йому очі тим жовтим вогником, що спалахнув у грудях. І вогник той заговорив. «Та ви не кричіть, не злякаєте! Краще поменше собі крали нашого м'яса! Інтелігенти! Хач! На волі так лізуть до нас і братами звуть, а тут...» Буржує. І повернувшися, вийшов чоловік з тої клітки, а серед неї зачувся сміх і гнівні викрики. «Ну, ще чого тобі треба?» – спитався назад. «Мені треба вітру для їх, дим їм у грудях, і не видно за димом ні жару, ні попілу», – промовив вперед. «Ти хочеш, щоб вітер розметав їх попіл?» «Хай розметає, хай краще нічого, ніж попіл!» «Ти впертий самохвалько!» – скрикнув назад. «Ти не хочеш бачити попілу! Ти не хочеш бачити сили моєї!» «Дивись ти, самохвалько!» Я сонце їх мрій примусив сходити на заході і заходити на сході. Їх власним вогнем я запалив їх сльози, і з того вийшов попіл і дим. Я зробив їм так, що вони самі наступили ногами на свою душу і розривають її, не відаючи того. І ти ще не бачиш сили моєї, і ти ще битися хочеш зо мною. Не ти, а я, коханий син життя, і ти служитимеш мені, а не я тобі. Скоряйся же! Скоряється той, хто не любий життю, промовив вперед. Ха-ха, а ти любий життю? Засміявся назад. «Самохвалько сліпий, ти поглянь! Ти насипав їм жару у груди! Ти хотів всі жарини людей їх у єдине полум'я скласти! Ти огиду до бруду життя надихав їм у душу! Ти вливав їм у жили гордо і крови! І поглянь же!» «Поглянь, що зробив з ними я, з тими твоїми людьми!» Твій вогонь не пече уже їх, і їм холодно і нудно від його. Твій вогонь не згромажує їх, а одштовхує тільки. Вони розірвали єдину душу на шматки, і шматки сі гризуться і б'ються з собою. Не гніви ж життя і скоряйся! Так промовив назад, а вперед одповів. Скоряється той, хто не любить життю. Я не бачу ні жару, ні попілу, тільки дим їм у грудях. Хай життя дасть нам вітру, хай побачу я, що за димом лежить. Що ж, хай дасть нам вітру життя, посміхнувся назад. І поклали вони полетіти до життя і прохать його вітру. Тут... Життя не могло часто бувати у сій мертвій задимленій скрині. Воно було там, де рождались, раділи, боролись, вмирали. Туди й полетіли вони. І життя їм сказало «Вертайтесь назад і чекайте, буде вам вітер». І вони повернулися ждати вітру Життя. Чи довго чи коротко вони літали, але коли прилетіли назад, 
то скриня так само стояла, вишкаривши зуби на вогні города, і понуро свистіли попід стінами круг неї закутані люди з залізом для вбивання людей. Так само задимлені люди кищіли у скрині, так само стояв їм у грудях той дим, і не видно було за ним ні жару, ні попілу. І думки їх бились об стіни, і стирались, і тупіли, а мляві очі не горіли життям. Стали ждати назад і вперед. Ту поминали повз їх неживі, однакові дні неживої, а жадної скрині. Бачив вперед, як приводили їй нових людей з жаринами у грудях, Бачив, як вона жадно глитала їх, терла, гризла їх своїми загратованими зубами, і падали їм сльози на жар той, і гасли жарини, і дим наставав їм у грудях. Все бачив вперед, і ждав вітру життя, а назад глузував. І глузуючи, він обсипав тих людей дощем страждання, дихав на їх вітром гниїння і сміявся. Щодня з тої скрині виводили в город кількох з тих людей і водили до людей назада. Вертаючись, вони тягли за собою великі їдов'ї муки. Але тупі з того диму, вони не одривали тих мук же разом зо своїм серцем. Вони не вмирали тут же з полум'ям гніву у грудях, з жагучою злістю боротьби. А довгими ночами старались гострі, колючі думки про сім муки обтерти, обгладити і спокійніще вкласти в темному кутку задимленого розуму. Вони приносили від людей назада ганебну смерть і тупо ждали її гидких обіймів. І темної ночі люди назада вели їх за стіни, і смерть обіймала людей впереда холодною шворкою круг шиї, й давила. Вітер гув їм над вухом свої безглузді брехливі пісні, а скриня злорадісно вишкиряла на їх свої загратовані зуби. Люди ж, ті задимлені люди, з млявими очима, здурбовано озирались на хвилину круг себе, слухали страшний скрегіт смерти і знову тупо кишіли, через хвилину забувши вирваних од їх і задушених. А коли до їх приходили, щоб побачитись люди з города, свіжі і чулі, і, задихаючись від смраду їх скрині, дивились на їх з муками співстраждання, дивилися з болем і жахом. Сі люди, задимлені люди, з нудьгою і досадою сміялися з їх. І сумно дивився вперед, а назад реготався. Ти не віриш, читачу, я знаю. Не вір же, й не бійся, бо це тільки казка. Слухай же далі. Люди кишіли. Для чого? Так собі просто кишіли та й годі, без мети і без роботи. Вся ж мета – Вся ж робота їх була у тому, що всі вони ждали. Кишіли і ждали, кишіли і ждали. Вдень вони рухались мляво і тупо. Ніч же? Ох, ті ночі, без краї, задимлені ночі. Ночами горіли їм більше пакучі вогники туги, і суму. Ночами їм падали найбільші її сльози у серце. Вони ж їх любили, сі ніжні й пекучі вогники суму і туги. Та дим забивав їх, 
ці нижні вогники, і тупо кишіли ті люди і нічу. Хмуро темніла у тьмі жовторота скриня, тягуче свистіли круг неї самотні закутані люди. Ночі, безкраї, задимлені ночі плили над несплячими. А небо, читачу, те небо, де живе справедливість і правда, кара неправді, те небо, читачу, байдуже темніло й мовчало. Часами з їх одбірали маленький гурток, приводили з другої скрині нових і разом усіх виряжали в далеку дорогу. Вони оживлялись, складались, будили поснулі надії, прощались і йшли. Йшли з цієї скрині у другу, з другої в третю, й губили в далекій дорозі поснулі надії. А ті, що зоставались, співали в дорогу їм горді і гнівні пісні тупими, безживними голосами. Ті, що зоставались, будили на часину й свої задубілі надії, а потім кишіли в диму. І не видно було за тим димом ні жару, ні попілу. І сумно дивився вперед, а назад глузував. Але раз так все було, мій читачу. Скриня вже спала. Хитра і жадна вона спала з вишкереними на поготові зубами. В норах її, глухо ступаючи, ходили люди з ключами, а в клітках трупом лежали задимлені люди. А по людях ходив млявий, тупий, як самі всі вони, задимлений сон. Раптом на дворі, де тільки свистіли закутані люди, клацнули двері. Забрязкали кайдани, і гомін голосів, перемішаний з топотом ніг і залізним гучним брязкітом кайданів, залунав по подвір'ю. Задимлені люди прокинулись, і деякі мляво стали дивитись у вікна в подвір'я. Деякі, менше задимлені, кричали й питались, і крик і шум став на подвір'ю. Здорові були. Куди? Нема. Що? Хто? Давно. Брязь, брязь, брязь. Кричали кайдани і собі. Дзвінко, різко, бадьоро. І помалу став гомін здихати. Вперед ви ж видно було, як гурток тих людей із подвір'я пройшов у скриню і довгою темною низкою просунувся по сходах. Весело дзвянкнув дзвінок у норі, мов радий розігнати застиглу круг його гнітучу тишу. Чоловік з ключами одімкнув двері і в нору всунулась низка людей, розбиваючи тишу дзвоном кайданів. З ними був чоловік Назада. Він повів їх в ту клітку, де був чоловік в чорній сорочці, і покинув їх там. Ті, що були у цій клітці, тупо й байдуже зустріли і брязки ткайданів, і жваву розмову нових. Чоловік в чорній сорочці почав і розпитував їх. «Давно в дорозі? Багато усіх. Їсти хочете?» Вони хотіли їсти, і їм дали. Вони їли, озирались круг себе, одповідали і говорили про минулі, про будучі страждання, з діловитими лицями спеціалістів страждання. Вони з інтересом питались про тутешні страждання і, зневажливо посміхаючись, виставляли страждання других скринь. 
а люди сеї клітки ображались і боронили страждання своєї скрині. І сумно дивився вперед, а назад, а назад реготався. Нових записали в книжки, проставляючи, хто і як і куди йшов. Чи туди, де тільки болото й хвороби, чи де ліс і болото й хвороби, чи туди, де нема ні лісів, ні болот, а тільки хвороби, страждання і смерть. Вони відповідали діловито й байдуже. Який раз у тюрмі? Шостий. Каторга. Каторга. Скільки? Вічно. Потім другий, третій, четвертий. Питали їх, вони відповідали, але не бачив вперед ні в тих, ні у тих у грудях нічого, крім диму. Потім їх розвели по кліткам. Вони примостились на помостах, підгорнули кайдани і знов тупий і млявий сон заходив по понурій скрині. На подвір'ї ж тягуче, тужливо свистіли самотні люди. Тільки ж став зазирати у вікна сірий, похнюплений ранок, вони вже почали ворушитись. У норі загрюкали двері, зачулися крики гомін гармідер. На столах вже стояла їм їжа, і вони спішно запихали її в себе, збираючись знов у дорогу. Знов їх розпитували, вони знову коротко відповідали про довгі дальші муки, і довго розпитували про ближчі і короткі. «Скільки вас усіх сьогодні йде?» «Двадцять два». Дві жінки, одна в кайданах. А не знаєте, чи тут набивають зразу наручники, чи потім? Жінка, в кайданах? Та що ви? Ну да, в кайданах. Одягають тут наручники. А коли виходять, то куди ж цю жінку? Теж у каторгу. Ну скільки? Як звуть? І бачив вперед, як в мляві мозки задимлених людей... Вірвалася думка і стала неспокійно і гостро товктися об другі думки. І бачив вперед, як думки сі й собі стали рухатись жваво, неспокійно, а очі їм стали глибшими, здурбованими, напруженими. Прийшли люди назада. Її стали виводити тих, що йшли у далеку дорогу. За ними ж пішли ті, що тут зоставались, а йдучи вони, як звичайно, співали дуже голосно, безживними голосами, горді і гнівні пісні. Але не бачив вперед їм у грудях жарин їх пекучих. На подвір'ї Усі зупинились і стали прощатись. Небо хмарне і темне було, і літали веселі пухкі сніжинки. Вітрець грався з ними. З вікон кліток співали й кричали, й махали інші, ті, що тут зоставались». Люди назада, нетерпляче і з досадою, ждали кінця тим прощанням. А ті, що йшли, з клунками на плечах, з надіями в очах, кричали, махали шапками і зникали в воротях за людьми назада. Ті ж, що зоставались, стояли купою і співали їм у дорогу свої гнівні пісні. І не бачив вперед їм у грудях жарин, а назад посміхався. Але в цей час розчинялися другі двері похмурої скрині. З тих дверей 
Вийшли люди назад, за ними ж ішли ще одні люди вперед, що йшли у далеку дорогу. Вони йшли і кричали і собі щось до вікон, махали руками, і руки були їм маленькі, а крик був тонкий, голосний. То йшли жінки, люди вперед, і попереду всіх йшла одна з їх. Висока і рівна, і очі дивились їй твердо, а ноги ступали хистко, бо плутались вони в довгій і сірій одежі. Від ніг же тої жінки глухо і страшно дзвякав брязкіт заліза. «Жінки в кайданах!» Пронеслося по тих, що стоячи купою співали в дорогу. І затихло в подвір'ї. Співи притихли. Темне небо поблідло. Веселі сніжинки залякались, шугнули, і вітрець занімів. А жінка гішла. І глухо, і страшно клацало в неї під довгою одежою. І люди назад, як вовки з лісною напружено озирались на неї і тих, що співали, та напруженими очами впивались в постать жінки в кайданах. «Прощайте, товариші!» – озирнулась до вікон вона і, посміхнувшись, Махнула рукою, і глухо дзвякнуло в неї з-під сірої одежі. І побачив вперед, що той брязкіт глухий, повзучи з-під одежі, виставав, розростався, і з страшенною силою, з вітром скаженим, летів на напружені постаті тих, що стояли. Небо зблідло, і ждало. Жадно ждав і дивився вперед, і напружено, залісно спішили люди назад. Жінки гішили і кричали, прощались, а попереду всіх, хистко ступаючи, глухо дзвякаючи, йшла помалу жінка в кайданах. Небо зблідло і ждало. А вперед, жадно бачив вперед, як той брязкіт глухий розростався і дув, дув великим вітром у груди на дим. І хитався той дим, а з-під диму, ах, побачив вперед, як з-під диму червоно горіли жарини. Брязки дув, і стурбовано дим хилитався, і тікав, вилітав бурий дим із грудей, із душі, із мозка сих людей, а у грудях росли, і росли ті червоні жарини, і з вогнем сих жарин розрослись, і шарпнулись грудей, і полетіли у двір величезні, пекучі, болючі, Крики диму не стало, горіли жарини болючі, пекучі, і вогнем сих жарин запалали їм очі, і вогнем сим налилася їм кров, і вогнем жарин сих залунала їх пісня і крики. Прощайте, товаришко. Горе їм. Залісно отиралися, з страхом дивилися люди назад, бо вчули вони той вітер життя, бо побачили дивні жарини, і спішили, і тягли у ворота жінку в кайданах, а вона отпихала, як гадів їх руки, і йшла, і дзвеніла глухим стуком заліза. А крик, крик жарин не здихав, 
Ах, радісно бачив вперед, як розлітався той дим, а у грудях горіли червоні пекучі жарини. Радісно бачив вперед, як зникали вогні їх погані, жовті вогники, як горів на їх бруд і смрад, і попіл понурої скрині. І клацали люди назад зубами, і злістю, і страхом світились їм очі. Горе їм, прощайте, товаришко. Громом гриміло в подвір'ї, і блискавками блищали очі, і єдиний червоний вогонь з'єднив їх усіх і горів великою Пімстою, гнівом і гордістю, і гордо, і гнівно лунала їх гордая пісня. І гордо озирнувся вперед до назада, а назад лютував. І люто схопив він страхом за серце людей своїх і затрусив їх. І схоплені рукою страха затрусилися люди назада, збіліли і, клацуючи зубами, кинулись на людей впереда. Вони вихопили залізу для вбивання і скажено шарпнулись до людей впереда, що були без заліза, а другі з них підхопили і штовхнули в ворота жінку в кайданах. Брязнуло в неї з-під ніг, захиталась вона і зникла серед людей назада в воротях. На подвір'ї ж блискали очі людей вперед'а і залізу людей назада, і громом лунали крики ненависти, гніву і помсти, а вогонь розпалявся, палав. Знову люто струсив озлобілий назад своїх слуг, і вп'ялась рука страха і чорної злости у серце. Страх і злість випили кров їм, і лиця їм страшно збіліли. І сказилися люди назада, з піною, з ревом, з залізом, уп'ялись, увірвались вони в купу людей вперед'а, що були без заліза. І блищало залізо, літало в повітрі, бризкало тіло гарячою кров'ю. Але кров та не могла вже залити жарин їх, не могла та скажена піна людей назада залити на попіл великий червоний вогонь людей впереда. Тоді гордо стрепенув вперед крилами і, не глянувши на назада, полетів туди, де із іскор робились великі пекучі жарини. Кінець різдвяної казки «Дим» Володимира Винниченка Christmas Meditations on Genesis 49, verse 10 by Augustus Toplady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. This remarkable passage is a link of that grand chain of prophecy which was delivered by the patriarch Jacob on his dying bed. Such are the faithfulness and the condescending grace of God that he frequently brightens the last hours of his people with the richest displays of his power and presence, nor does anything short of heaven itself afford a nobler sight than that of a believer standing on the verge of eternity, filled with the faith which casts out fear, happy in the assured possession of grace, and longing for the completion of that grace in glory. Hence I have often wondered how any considerate person can be an enemy to the doctrine of assurance, There is but one thing, 
which can render death terrible, namely our being at an uncertainty as to the reception we shall meet with at the hands of God. Certainly, then, the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sin through the tender mercy of our God, Luke 1 verse 77, is a privilege which well deserves to be wished and prayed for. To have the Spirit of God bearing witness to our spirits that we are the children of God, Romans 8 verse 16, is at least a very desirable blessing. And were our hearts thoroughly awakened to a sense of divine things, it would be impossible for us to sit down, easy and contented, without some degree of this exceeding great and precious gift. Surely it behoves us to cultivate that in life which is the only infallible antidote against the terrors of death. I do not say that assurance of my own personal interest in Jesus is essential to my faith as a real believer in him, but I am positively clear that it is essential to my fullness of comfort. Assurance adds nothing to the esse justificationis, or to the being of justification, but it adds much to the bene esse justificati, or to the well-being of a justified person. Holy Jacob was fully satisfied as to the safety of his soul. He knew that his name was written in the book of life, and that his salvation was settled in the eternal covenant of grace and redemption. He had a blessed conviction that the Son of God, whose human nature was to descend from his loins in the tribe of Judah, had undertaken to atone for his sins and to clothe him, by imputation, with a perfect righteousness. In consequence of this faith, when the time drew near that Israel must die, chapter 47, verse 29, Jacob drew near to the time with as much joy as the time drew near to him with speed. For we find him, chapter 48, verse 21, speaking of his own approaching death, with as much ease and complacency as if he was only setting out on a journey of pleasure. Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. He perceived the symptoms of advancing dissolution, and the prospect conduced not to alarm his fears nor to rivet him closer to the world, but operated like the shining of the sun or the breathings of Zephyr on a flower. It expanded his hope, enlarged his desire for heaven, and diffused the fragrance of his faith on all within the sphere of his conversation. As greatly as this eminent saint longed to be dissolved and to be with Christ, he would not die until he had first taken a solemn leave of his family by blessing them in the name of the Lord, and by predicting the fate of their posterities. At present I shall only consider his last address to Judah, his fourth son, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, i.e. thy tribe shall be the most conspicuous and distinguished on various accounts. In that portion of Canaan which fall to thy descendants and to those of Benjamin, the city of Jerusalem shall be built, and the temple of God shall stand. But chiefly shalt thou be celebrated as the progenitor of that spotless mother, from whom the Son of God shall derive his inferior nature, and within the near neighbourhood of thy territory, shall he suffer and expire for the salvation of his people. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies, and thy father's children shall bow down before thee, referring to that valour and success in war, for which this tribe became so eminent and so respected by its neighbours. This is expressed with still greater sublimity at verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp, though young yet strong, courageous, formidable, and magnanimous, from the prey, my son, thou art gone up, victorious as that king of beasts when he ascends with majestic pace, from the plains to the mountains, flushed with the conquest and red with the slaughter of inferior animals. He stooped down, he couched up as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Implying that this branch of the Israelitish nation should enjoy, as in fact they did, a long series of rest, honour, and prosperity, and that the tribe of Judah could no more be insulted with safety than a sheep or a deer can rouse and irritate a lion with impunity. What grandeur and vivacity of genius must Jacob retain, even in that hour when strength and genius usually fail, to be able to convey his ideas in such august terms, and in a flow of such highly poetic imagery? Who that reads this chapter would imagine that elevated strains like these strains which would have done honour to the muse of Homer, warbled from the lips of a dying man, of a man too, labouring under the utmost bodily decays of age, and over whose head no fewer than a hundred and forty-seven years had passed. 
but the most valuable part of the prophecy is that which relates to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and to him shall the gathering of the people be. Of all regal ornaments the scepter is believed to be the most ancient, and probably its origin was extremely simple. It seems to have taken its rise from the crook, wielded, in earliest times, by the harmless hand of a shepherd, Agreeably to which idea, the Hebrew verb ra signifies he fed, he exercised the office of a shepherd, and likewise he ruled, he governed as a magistrate. So the Greek word pumen, a shepherd, is derived from the verb pumeno, which imports both to feed and to govern. A staff, primarily the instrument and the emblem of pastoral superintendency, appears to have been, from thence, transferred to the hand of royalty, so that whenever kings look upon their scepter, that significant ensign of authority should remind them of the tender affection they owe to their people, and of that fine lesson addressed to each of our English bishops at the time of their consecration, a lesson equally proper for princes as for prelates, be to the flock of Christ a shepherd, not a wolf, feed them, devour them not, hold up the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, bring again the outcasts, seek the lost, be so merciful that you be not too remiss, so minister discipline that you neglect not mercy. Footnote. Office for consecration of bishops. In footnote. Some ancient sceptres, particularly of the earlier kings of France, are affirmed to have been considerably longer than a modern walking stick, and to have been curved at the higher end, exactly like a shepherd's rod. The Greek word skeperon, from whence the Latin skeptorum, and the English scepter, properly denotes a staff or wand of sufficient length for a person to lean upon, and the Hebrew shevet is, in strictness, a staff made of a shoot or straight bough of a tree, such as were the staves of the primitive shepherds and herdsmen. By that scepter, which for a given time was not to depart from Judah, is undoubtedly meant the administration of temporal power. Hence the Septuagint render the passage by uc eclipsi archon exioda a supreme governor shall not fail out of judah i e the supreme government in that tribe shall be jewish until the messiah's advent the words scepter and lawgiver are here explicatory of each other and mutually denote a series of native governors who should rule the jewish nation according to its own law and the sense of the whole is that judah should continue a distinct tribe by itself and that its civil jurisdiction should, under some form or other, and with a greater or less degree of authority, remain in Jewish hands until the incarnation of God the Son, but that, he being come, the Jews should, soon after, lose their intrinsic power and authority as a nation, cease to be governed by rulers of their own, be ultimately dispossessed of the land in which they had so long dwelt, and subjected to the dominion of the Gentiles, among whom they should be dispersed and sifted as in a sieve over the whole earth, every tittle of which came accordingly to pass. On this illustrious prophecy, uttered almost eighteen hundred years before the birth of Christ, profane history may be considered as the best commentary. We there find that the scepter did not actually depart, but begin to depart from Judah, or verge towards a departure, within little more than half a century prior to our Lord's nativity, when Jerusalem was besieged and taken by Pompey, and Aristobulus II, then king of Judea, was sent prisoner to Rome. As the manifestation of God in human flesh drew nearer, the symptoms of the departing scepter grew still more visible. The successive expeditions of Gabinius, of Crassus, and of Cassius against this devoted people contributed to prepare the way for the fulfilment of Jacob's prediction, and in fact proclaimed that Shiloh would soon appear. The scepter, however, was not hitherto departed from Judah. Their civil power and independency, though checked, were not extinguished. They were still governed by magistrates of their own, and were even treated on various occasions, not as dependents, but as friends and allies of the Roman state. A few years lower, when Herod, flatteringly surnamed the Great, a native of Edom, was appointed Tetrarch, and soon after king of Judea, chiefly by his interest with Mark Anthony, the prophecy drew nearer to its accomplishment. But though the throne was now for the first time filled by a foreigner, still that foreigner was a professor of Judaism. Herod revered, or at least affected to revere, the Mosaic institutions, 
and even rebuilt the temple at a vast expense. The subordinate magistracy also consisted of Jews, as did the Sanhedrin, which was their highest court of judicature. The scepter, therefore, though departing fast, was not entirely gone from Judah, ere Shiloh came. Christ was born towards the close of this Herod's reign, i.e. while the political and ecclesiastical constitution of Judea were subsisting. Herod, indeed, was in some sense tributary to the Roman Empire, but the Jews themselves were, for the most part, in full possession of their civil and religious rights. When our blessed Saviour was about twelve years of age, the scepter totally departed from Judah, for Herod, who died while our Lord was yet an infant, was succeeded by his son Archelaus, which Archelaus, after reigning about ten years, was deposed and banished by the Emperor Augustus. From thenceforward the tribe of Judah, which had so long been distinguished by its dignity and pre-eminence, was reduced to a Roman province, and became an appendage to the empire. Quirinius, prefect of Syria, was commissioned to take possession of the country in the emperor's name, and Coponius, a Roman knight, was sent to preside over it as lieutenant governor. Thus did the scepter at length depart from Judah, and a lawgiver from between his feet. Augustus drove the nail to the head, and Titus clinched it, within forty years after our Lord's crucifixion, when the city and temple were utterly destroyed, and those of the Jews who escaped immediate death were sold for slaves into every part of the known world. In this manner does divine providence give completion to its eternal and immutable purposes. All the predicted events that ever came to pass and this among the rest, are so many standing proofs of God's predestination and foreknowledge. Necessity is but another name for certainty of event, without which there could be no such thing as infallible foreknowledge, and without infallible foreknowledge there could be no such thing as infallible prophecy. Such exact and wonderful accomplishments prove also the divine original of the Scriptures. Most of the leading incidents, whether civil or sacred, of general importance either to the Church or to the world, were foretold in the Bible. The four universal monarchies, for instance, the advent, the sufferings, the resurrection and the ascension of the Messiah, the miraculous descent of the Holy Ghost, the abolition of the Levitical economy, the ruin and dispersion of the Jews, the calling of the Gentiles, the ten general persecutions, the vast spread of Christianity through the Roman Empire, the rise, progress and continuance of popery and of Mohammedism, with a multitude of great events beside, were circumstantially foretold in the sacred writings of the Old and New Testament. From hence results such an invincible demonstration of the truth of Christianity, as all the infidels in the world will never be able to surmount while the sun and moon endure. We ourselves know and see that many of the scripture prophecies have been completely fulfilled, and that others of them are now fulfilling, even at this very time. Thus, with regard to the Jews, we have all the evidence it is possible to have, that the prophet Hosea wrote by divine inspiration when he affirmed, chapter 3, verse 4, that the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without sacrifice, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. This has actually and literally been the case with them, for rather more than seventeen hundred years past, and continues to be so at this present moment. Every Jew we meet is a living proof that the scepter is indeed departed from Judah, and a lawgiver from between his feet. It is certain, therefore, that the promised Shiloh is come, and Jesus Christ, the righteous, in whose childhood the scepter departed, is both the Son of the Most High God, and likewise the true Messiah, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Shiloh, Shiloh, may be rendered the Son, also the Saviour, likewise the peaceable and the prosperous one. The Septuagint translates, or rather paraphrases it, or the Apokimeva, i.e., he for whom all things are laid up or kept in store. In this adorable person and most wonderful offices and transactions, Jesus exhausts every one of those significations. He is one, the everlasting Son of the Father, as God, and the Son of Mary, as man. Two, he is the effectual, the only, and the certain Saviour, i.e., deliverer and preserver of his elect body, the Church. 3. He is the alone peacemaker between God and men by the infinitely precious blood of his cross. 4. He prospered and prevailed to the uttermost in the whole and in every branch of his mediatorial undertaking. No part of his success as a saviour is uncertain or suspended on a peradventure. 
the reward of his humiliation lies in the absolute and infallible salvation of every individual sinner for whom he died. And as his work was perfect, his reward is sure. 5. For him all things are reserved. He is the appointed heir of all things, the omega or central end, no less than the alpha or author of the worlds. All beings are by him and for him. The elect, both angels and men, stoop to the sceptre of his grace, and the reprobate, both diabolic and human, must submit to the rod of his power. To him shall the gathering of the people be. It is plain from this clause of the text before us that redemption by Christ is not that random and precarious thing which the Arminian scheme pretends. The salvation he wrought does not lie at sixes and sevens. It is by no means unsettled, uncertain, or undetermined. The dignity of his divine person, the infinite value of his obedience and sacrifice, together with the justice of his Almighty Father, to whom the inestimable price was paid, rendered it impossible that any single soul should perish, for whom such a Redeemer died. It is neither at the option nor in the power of thy corrupt free will to render his mediation effectual or ineffectual. All is firmly fixed by the unalterable will, the immovable decree, and the everlasting covenant of the uncreated three. Christ did not come into the world at haphazard, nor live and die for a maybe. He was born and shed his blood for a peculiar people, whom his own sanctifying grace was to make zealous of good works, Titus 2 verse 14, and that he might gather together into one glorified company all the children of God that were scattered abroad, John 11 verse 52. The elect world are the great all, for whom he lived and bled, even the whole world of his predestinated people, and every one of these his people shall be gathered to him, to him shall the gathering of the people be. As surely as they were created by his power, so surely shall they, in conversion, be gathered to him by the efficacious grace of his Holy Spirit. As surely as Christ was born for them at Bethlehem, so surely shall he be formed in them their hope of glory by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Ghost. And indeed, were not this the case, the whole of Jacob's prophecy would not be true. The text positively avers that the people, i.e. the elect people of God, shall be gathered to Christ. And if free grace say, I, it is in vain for free will to say, No. God hath said, The people shall be gathered, and faith echoes back the promise, with, Then gathered the people shall be, for thy counsel must stand, and thou wilt do all thy pleasure. Happy it is for us that God hath taken upon himself to gather and convert us to his Son. Unless he was the gatherer, not one of us would ever be gathered. Free will never yet led a sinner to Christ, and never will, till the world remains. We are free enough to depart from God and holiness, but we are not free and desirous to return to Him, and forsake our sins, and be conformed to Him in righteousness, until His grace makes us free in the day of His power upon our hearts. Free will has led millions and millions of souls to the place of torment, but it never lifted a single soul to heaven. All the sins that ever were committed were committed by free will, but it is only the transforming grace of God that inspires and adorns us with the mind that was in Christ. You, therefore, who profess to believe in Jesus, as the Shiloh that was conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary, beg of God that he may not permit you to rest satisfied with a mere speculative assent to the gospel history. If we are saved in the next life, we must be gathered to Christ in this. Nothing short of the inward, effectual call can stamp us Christians in deed and in truth. Nothing will make us lead holy lives on earth but an experience of the life and power of grace in our souls. Nor will anything short of Jacob's faith make us face death with Jacob's comfort. And what is death to those that are born of God? It is but another gathering of them unto Christ. The soul of a saint is gathered from the body as a flower from the stalk, to adorn the court of heaven, and to bloom forever in the bosom of God. They who are gathered to him by grace are death, only gathered into glory. Their bodies too shall be gathered from the grave, and rescued from the dominion of death, when Shiloh comes the second time to renew the face of the earth and to begin his millennial reign. He, whose voice is as the sound of many waters, will say to his angels when he appears in the clouds of heaven, Gather my saints together unto me, who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, who died, trusting in my righteousness, and depending on the merit of my blood, which I shed for the remission of their sins, when I offered myself up 
in sacrifice on the cross. To him, in some sense, shall all flesh come. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and at his tribunal shall every knee bow. Thus, in every signification of the term, to him shall the gathering of the people be, and he will sever them, one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats, and set the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left. Eternal Spirit of grace, gather us here to him by the energy of thy renewing power. So at death shall our souls be gathered into heaven, and our mortal bodies shall be sown in the grave, only to be ripened and refined until the resurrection of the just. End of Christmas Meditations on Genesis 49 verse 10 by Augustus Toplady The Ghost's Summons by Ada Boisson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker Wanted, sir. A patient. It was in the early days of my professional career, when patients were scarce and fees scarcer. And though I was in the act of sitting down to my chop, and had promised myself a glass of steaming punch afterwards, in honor of the Christmas season, I hurried instantly into my surgery. I entered briskly, but no sooner did I catch sight of the figure standing, leaning against the counter, than I started back with a strange feeling of horror, which for the life of me I could not comprehend. Never shall I forget the ghastliness of that face, the white horror stamped upon every feature, the agony which seemed to sink the very eyes beneath the contracted brows. It was awful to me to behold, accustomed as I was to scenes of terror. "'You seek advice?' I began with some hesitation. "'No, I am not ill.' "'You require, then—' "'Hush!' he interrupted, approaching more nearly, and dropping his already low murmur to a mere whisper. "'I believe you are not rich. Would you be willing to earn a thousand pounds?' A thousand pounds! His words seemed to burn my very ears. I should be thankful if I could do so honestly, I replied with dignity. What is the service required of me? A peculiar look of intense horror passed over the white face before me. But the blue-black lips answered firmly, To attend a deathbed. A thousand pounds to attend a deathbed? Where am I to go, then? Whose is it? Mine. The voice in which this was said sounded so hollow and distant that involuntarily I shrank back. Yours? What nonsense! You are not a dying man. You are pale, but you appear perfectly healthy. You— Hush! he interrupted. I know all of this. You cannot be more convinced of my physical health than I am myself, yet I know that before the clock tolls the first hour after midnight— I shall be a dead man. But, he shuddered slightly, but stretching out his hand commandingly, motioned me to be silent. I am but too well informed of what I affirm, he said quietly. I have received a mysterious summons from the dead. No mortal aid can avail me. I am as doomed as the wretch on whom the judge has passed sentence. I do not come either to seek your advice or to argue the matter with you, but simply to buy your services. I offer you a thousand pounds to pass the night in my chamber, and witness the scene which takes place. The sum may appear to you extravagant, but I have no further need to count the cost of any gratification, and the spectacle you will have to witness is no common sight of horror. The words, strange as they were, were spoken calmly enough. But as the last sentence dropped slowly from the livid lips, an expression of such wild horror again passed over the stranger's face that, in spite of the immense fee, I hesitated to answer. You fear to trust the promise of a dead man. See here, and be convinced, he exclaimed eagerly. And the next instant, on the counter between us, lay a parchment document, and following the indication of that white muscular hand, I read the words, and to Mr. Frederick Reed, of 14 High Street, Alton, I bequeath the sum of £1,000 for certain service rendered to me. I have had that will 
drawn up within the last 24 hours, and I signed it an hour ago in the presence of competent witnesses. I am prepared, you see. Now, do you accept my offer, or not? My answer was to walk across the room and take down my hat, and then to lock the door of the surgery communicating with the house. It was a dark, icy cold night, and somehow the courage and determination which the sight of my own name in connection with a thousand pounds had given me flagged considerably as I found myself hurried along through the silent darkness by a man whose deathbed I was about to attend. He was grimly silent, but as his hand touched mine, in spite of the frost, it felt like a burning coal. On we went, tramp, tramp through the snow, on, on, till even I grew wary, and at length on my appalled ear struck the chimes of a church clock, whilst close at hand I distinguished the snowy hillocks of a churchyard. Heavens! Was this the awful scene of which I was to be the witness to take place veritably amongst the dead? Uh, Eleven, groaned the doomed man. Gracious God, but two hours more, and that ghostly messenger will bring the summons. Come, come, for mercy's sake, let us hasten. There was but a short road separating us now from a wall which surrounded a large mansion, and along this we hastened until we reached a small door. Passing through this, in a few minutes we were stealthily ascending the private staircase to a splendidly furnished apartment, which left no doubt of the wealth of its owner. All was intensely silent, however, through the house, and about this room in particular there was a stillness that, as I gazed around, struck me as almost ghastly. My companion glanced at the clock on the mantel shelf and sank into a large chair by the side of the fire with a shudder. Only an hour and a half longer, he muttered. Great heaven, I thought I had more fortitude. This horror unmans me. Then, in a fiercer tone, and clutching my arm, he added, Ha! Ah, you mock me! You think me mad! But wait till you see! Wait till you see! I put my hand on his wrist, for there was now a fever in his sunken eyes which checked the superstitious chill which had been gathering over me, and made me hope that after all, my first suspicion was correct, and that my patient was but the victim of some fearful hallucination. Mock you, I answered soothingly. Far from it, I sympathize intensely with you, and would do much to aid you. You require sleep. Lie down, and leave me to watch. He groaned, but rose and began throwing off his clothes, and watching my opportunity, I slipped a sleeping powder which I had managed to put in my pocket before leaving the surgery, into the tumbler of claret that stood beside him. The more I saw, the more I felt convinced that it was the nervous system of my patient which required my attention, and it was with sincere satisfaction I saw him drink the wine, and then stretch himself on the luxurious bed. Ha! thought I, as the clock struck twelve, and instead of a groan, the deep breathing of the sleeper sounded through the room. You won't receive any summons tonight and I may make myself comfortable. Noiselessly, therefore, I replenished the fire, poured myself out a large glass of wine, and drawing the curtain so that the firelight should not disturb the sleeper, I put myself in a position to follow his example. How long I slept I know not, but suddenly I roused with a start, and, and as ghostly a thrill of horror as ever I remember to have felt in my life. Something! What I knew not seemed near, something nameless, but unutterably awful. I gazed round. The fire emitted a faint blue glow, just sufficient to enable me to see that the room was exactly the same as when I fell asleep, but that the long hand of the clock wanted but five minutes of the mysterious hour which was to be the death moment of the summoned man. Was there anything in it, then? Any truth in the strange story he had told? The silence was intense. I could not even hear a breath from the bed, and I was about to rise and approach when again that awful horror seized me, and at the same moment my eye fell upon the mirror opposite the door, and I saw, great heaven, that awful shape, that ghastly mockery of what had been humanity. Was it really a messenger from the buried quiet dead? It stood there in visible death clothes, but the awful face was ghastly with corruption and the sunken eyes 
gleamed forth a green glassy glare, which seemed a veritable blast from the infernal fires below. To move or utter a sound in that hideous presence was impossible, and like a statue I sat and saw that horrid shape move slowly towards the bed. What was the awful scene enacted there, I know not. I heard nothing, except a low, stifled, agonized groan, and I saw the shadow of that ghastly messenger bending over the bed. Whether it was some dreadful but wordless sentence its breathless lips conveyed as it stood there, I know not. But for an instant the shadow of a claw-like hand, from which the third finger was missing, appeared extended over the doomed man's head, and then, as the clock struck one clear silvery stroke, it fell, and a wild shriek rang through the room, a death shriek. I am not given to fainting, but I certainly confess that the next ten minutes of my existence was a cold blank. And even when I did manage to stagger to my feet, I gazed round, vainly endeavoring to understand the chilly horror which still possessed me. Thank God! The room was rid of that awful presence. I saw that. So, gulping down some wine, I lighted a wax taper and staggered towards the bed. Ah, how I prayed that... After all, I might have been dreaming, and that my own excited imagination had but conjured up some hideous memory of the dissecting room. But one glance was sufficient to answer that. No, the summons had indeed been given and answered. I flashed the light over the dead face, swollen, convulsed, still with the death agony. But suddenly I shrank back. Even as I gazed... The expression of the face seemed to change. The blackness faded into a deathly whiteness. The convulsed features relaxed, and even as if the victim of that dread apparition still lived, a sad, solemn smile stole over the pale lips. I was intensely horrified, but still I retained sufficient self-consciousness to be struck professionally by such a phenomenon. Surely there was something more than supernatural agency in all this. Again I scrutinized the dead face, and even the throat and chest, but with the exception of a tiny pimple on one temple beneath a cluster of hair, not a mark appeared. To look at the corpse one would have believed that this man had indeed died by the visitation of God, peacefully, whilst sleeping. How long I stood there I know not, but time enough to gather my scattered senses and to reflect that all things considered my own position would be very unpleasant if I was found thus unexpectedly in the room of the mysteriously dead man. So as noiselessly as I could, I made my way out of the house. No one met me on the private staircase. The little door opening into the road was easily unfastened, and thankful indeed was I to feel again the fresh, wintry air as I hurried along that road by the churchyard. There was a magnificent funeral soon in that church, and it was said that the young widow of the buried man was inconsolable, and then rumors got abroad of a horrible apparition which had been seen on the night of the death, and it was whispered the young widow was terrified and insisted upon leaving her splendid mansion. I was too mystified with the whole affair to risk my reputation by saying what I knew, and I should have allowed my share in it to remain forever buried in oblivion had I not suddenly heard that the widow objecting to many of the legacies in the last will of her husband, intended to dispute it on the score of insanity. And then there gradually arose the rumor of his belief in having received a mysterious summons. On this I went to the lawyer, and sent a message to the lady that, as the last person who had attended her husband, I undertook to prove his sanity, and I besought her to grant me an interview, in which I would relate as strange and horrible a story as ear had ever heard. The same evening I received an invitation to go to the mansion. I was ushered immediately into a splendid room, and there, standing before the fire, was the most dazzlingly beautiful young creature I had ever seen. She was very small, but exquisitely made. Had it not been for the dignity of her carriage, I should have believed her a mere child. With a stately bow she advanced, but did not speak. I come on a strange and painful errand, I began, and then I started, for I happened to glance full into her eyes, and from them down to the small right hand, grasping the chair. The wedding ring was on that hand. 
I conclude you are the Mr. Reed who requested permission to tell me some absurd ghost story, and whom my late husband mentions here? And as she spoke, she stretched out her left hand towards something, but what I knew not, for my eyes were fixed on that hand. Horror! White and delicate it might be, but it was shaped like a claw, and the third finger was missing. One sentence was enough after that. Madam, all I can tell you is that the ghost who summoned your husband was marked by a singular deformity. The third finger of the left hand was missing, I said sternly, and the next instant I had left that beautiful, sinful presence. That will was never disputed. The next morning, too, I received a check for a thousand pounds, and the next news I heard of the widow was that she had herself seen that awful apparition and had left the mansion immediately. End of The Ghost's Summons by Ada Boisson The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brian Albert. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did it. Which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at eight dollars per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid thirty dollars per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to twenty dollars, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day and she had only one dollar eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months, with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling. Something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slendered, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, 
Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still, while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket. On went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophroni, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran, and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked the Sophroni. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It had surely been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him, quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly, on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love. Which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? Seven o'clock, the coffee was made, and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat in the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair away down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow. He was only 22, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as unmovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You know what a nice, what a beautiful gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet, even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone? He said with an air almost of idiocy. You needn't look for it, said Della. It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone, too. 
It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered, she went on with sudden serious sweetness. But nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year. What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic stream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the Lord of the Flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs side and back that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers. But the tresses that should have adorned the coveted ornaments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leaped up like a little singed cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with the reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell, said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now, suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest. Everywhere they are the wisest. They are the Magi. End of The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry Read by Brian Albert, Buffalo, New York Christmas at the Hollow Tree Inn by Albert Bigelow Payne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jan McGillivray. The storyteller told the last Hollow Tree story on Christmas Eve. It was snowing outside and the little lady was wondering how it was in the far deep woods. Once upon a time, he said, when the robin and turtle and squirrel and jack rabbit had all gone home for the winter, nobody was left in the hollow tree except the coon and possum and the old black crow. Of course, the others used to come back and visit them pretty often, and Mr. Dog, too, now that he'd got to be good friends with all the deep woods people, and they thought a great deal of him when they got to know him better. Mr. Dog told them a lot of things they had never heard of before, things that he'd learned at Mr. Man's house, and maybe that's one reason they got to liking him so well. 
He told them about Santa Claus, for one thing, and how the old fellow came down the chimney on Christmas Eve to bring presents to Mr. Mann and his children, who always hung up their stockings for them. And Mr. Dog said that once he had hung up his stocking, too, and got a nice bone in it that was so good he had buried and dug it up again as much as six times before spring. He said that Santa Claus always came to Mr. Mann's house, and that whenever the children hung up their stockings, they were always sure to get something in them. Well, the Hollow Tree people had never heard of Santa Claus. They knew about Christmas, of course, because everybody, even the cows and sheep, know about that. But they had never heard of Santa Claus. You see, Santa Claus only comes to Mr. Mann's house, but they didn't know that either. So they thought if they just hung up their stockings, he'd come there, too, and that's what they made up their minds to do. They talked about it a great deal together, and Mr. Possum looked over all his stockings to pick out the biggest one he had, and Mr. Crow, he made himself a new pair on purpose. Mr. Coon said he never knew Mr. Crow to make himself such big stockings before, but Mr. Crow said he was getting old and needed things bigger, and when he loaned one of his new stockings to Mr. Coon, Mr. Coon said, "'That's so,' and that he guessed they were about right after all. They didn't tell anybody about it at first, but by and by they told Mr. Dog what they were going to do, and when Mr. Dog heard it he wanted to laugh right out. You see, he knew Santa Claus never went anywhere except to Mr. Man's house, and he thought it would be a great joke on the hollow tree people when they hung up their stockings and didn't get anything. But by and by Mr. Dog thought about something else. He thought it would be too bad, too, for them to be disappointed that way. You see, Mr. Dog liked them all now, and when he had thought about it a minute, he made up his mind to do something, and this is what it was. He made up his mind to play Santa Claus. He knew just how Santa Claus looked, because he'd seen lots of his pictures at Mr. Man's house, and he thought it would be great fun to dress up that way and take a bag of presents to the hollow tree while they were all asleep and fill up the stockings of the coon and possum and the old black crow. But first he had to be sure of some way of getting in, so he said to them he didn't see how they could expect Santa Claus, their chimneys were so small, and Mr. Crow said they could leave their latch string out downstairs, which was just what Mr. Dog wanted. Then they said they were going to have all the folks that had spent the summer with them over for Christmas dinner and to see the presents they had got in their stockings. They told Mr. Dog to drop over, too, if he could get away, and Mr. Dog said he would, and went off laughing to himself and ran all the way home because he felt so pleased at what he was going to do. Well, he had to work pretty hard, I tell you, to get things ready. It wasn't so hard to get the presents as it was to rig up his Santa Claus dress. He found some long wool out in Mr. Man's barn for his white whiskers, and he put some that wasn't so long on the edges of his overcoat and boot tops and around an old hat he had. Then he borrowed a big sack he found out there, too, and fixed it up to swing over his back, just as he had seen Santa Claus do in the pictures. He had a lot of nice things to take along. Three tender young chickens he'd borrowed from Mr. Man, for one thing, and then he bought some new neckties for the hollow tree folks all around, and a big striped candy cane for each one, because candy canes always looked well sticking out of a stocking. Besides all that, he had a new pipe for each and a package of tobacco. You see, Mr. Dog lived with Mr. Man and didn't ever have to buy much for himself, so he had always saved his money. He had even more things than that, but I can't remember just now what they were. And when he started out all dressed up like Santa Claus, I tell you his bag was pretty heavy, and he almost wished before he got there that he hadn't started with quite so much. It got heavier and heavier all the way, and he was glad enough to get there and find the latch string out. He set his bag down to rest a minute before climbing the stairs, and then opened the door softly and listened. He didn't hear a thing except Mr. Crow and Mr. Coon and Mr. Possum breathing pretty low, 
and he knew they might wake up any minute, and he wouldn't have been caught there in the midst of things for a good deal. So he slipped up just as easy as anything, and when he got up in the big parlor room, he almost had to laugh right out loud, for there were the stockings, sure enough, all hung up in a row, and a card with a name on it over each one telling who it belonged to. Then he listened again, and all at once he jumped and held his breath, for he heard Mr. Possum say something. But Mr. Possum was only talking in his sleep and saying, "'I'll take another piece, please.' And Mr. Dog knew he was dreaming about the mince pie he'd had for dinner. So then he opened his bag and filled the stockings. He put in mixed candy and nuts and little things first, and then the pipes and tobacco and candy canes, so they'd show at the top, and hung a nice dressed chicken outside. I tell you, they looked fine. It almost made Mr. Dog wish he had a stocking of his own there to fill, and he forgot all about them waking up, and sat down in a chair to look at the stockings. It was a nice rocking chair, and over in a dark corner where they wouldn't be apt to see him, even if one of them did wake up and stick his head out of his room. So Mr. Dog felt pretty safe now, anyway. He rocked softly and looked and looked at the nice stockings and thought how pleased they'd be in the morning and how tired he was. You've heard about people being tired as a dog, and that's just how Mr. Dog felt. He was so tired he didn't feel a bit like starting home, and by and by he never did know how it happened. But by and by Mr. Dog went sound asleep right there in his chair with all his Santa Claus clothes on. And there he sat, with his empty bag in his hand and the nice full stockings in front of him all night long. Even when it came morning and began to get light, Mr. Dog didn't know it. He just slept right on. He was that tired. Then pretty soon the door of Mr. Possum's room opened, and he poked out his head. And just then the door of Mr. Coon's room opened, and he poked out his head. Then the door of the old black crow opened and out poked his head. They all looked toward the stockings, and they didn't see Mr. Dog, or even each other, at all. They saw their stockings, though, and Mr. Coon said all at once, Oh, there's something in my stocking. And then Mr. Crow says, Oh, there's something in my stocking, too. And Mr. Possum says, Oh, there's something in all our stockings. And with that they gave a great hurrah all together, and rushed out and grabbed their stockings, and turned around just in time to see Mr. Dog jump right straight up out of his chair, for he did not know where he was in the least bit in the world. "'Oh, there's Santa Claus himself!' they all shouted together, and made a rush for their rooms, for they were scared almost to death. But it all dawned on Mr. Dog in a second, and he commenced to laugh and hurrah and to think what a joke it was on everybody. And when they heard Mr. Dog laugh, they knew him right away, and they all came up and looked at him, and he had to tell just what he'd done and everything. So they emptied out their stockings on the floor and ate some of the presents and looked at the others, until they almost forgot about breakfast, just as children do on Christmas morning. Then Mr. Crow said all at once that he'd make a little coffee, and that Mr. Dog must stay and have some, and by and by they made him promise to spend the day with them and be there when the robin and the squirrel and Mr. Turtle and Jack Rabbit came, which he did. And it was snowing hard outside, which made it a nicer Christmas than if it hadn't been, and when all the others came they brought presents too, and when they saw Mr. Dog dressed up as Santa Claus, and heard how he'd gone to sleep and been caught. They laughed and laughed. And it snowed so hard that they had to stay all night, and after dinner they sat around the fire and told stories. And they had to stay the next night, too, and all that Christmas week. And I wish I could tell you all that happened that week. But I can't, because I haven't time. But it was the very nicest Christmas that ever was in the hollow tree or in the big deep woods anywhere. And this, said the storyteller, is the very last hollow tree story, and there will be no more, 
for they all came out through Mr. Dog, and Mr. Dog has gone away now into that far land of evening, where all good dogs go when they get very, very old. He was friends with the hollow tree people to the last, and when he got too old to visit them, they used to come to see him, sometimes at night when Mr. Man was asleep. And when Mr. Dog went away on his long journey beyond the sunset, they were all so sorry, for they knew that no other Mr. Dog would ever be friends with them, and they were very sad in the hollow tree for a long time. Then here's goodbye to the old black crow, and the rest with a one, two, three. And here's goodbye to the hollow, 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 goodbye to the hollow tree. End of Christmas at the Hollow Tree Inn by Albert Bigelow Payne The Legend of St. Nicholas by Georgine Faulkner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com org read by ron altman once upon a time there lived in myra a good man named nicholas when he was a young man his father and mother died of the plague and he was left the sole heir of all their vast estate but he looked upon all this money as belonging to god and felt that he himself was merely the steward of God's mercies. So he went about everywhere doing good and sharing his riches with all those who were in need. Now there lived in that country a certain nobleman who had three beautiful daughters. He had been very rich, but he lost all his property and became so poor that he did not know what to do to provide for his family. His daughters were anxious to be married, but their father had no money to give them dowries, and in that country no maiden could marry unless she had her marriage portion or dowry. They were so very poor that they could scarcely get any food to eat. Their clothes were so worn and ragged that they would not go out of the house, and their father was overcome with shame and sorrow. When the good Nicholas heard of their troubles, he longed to help them. He knew that the father was proud, and that it would be hard to give him money, so he thought that it would be best to surprise them with a gift. Then Nicholas took some gold, and tying it in a long silken purse, went at once to the home of the poor nobleman. It was night, and the beautiful maidens were fast asleep, while the broken-hearted father, too wretched to go to bed, sat by the fireside watching and praying. Nicholas stood outside wondering how he could bestow his gift without being seen, when suddenly the moon came from behind the clouds, and he saw that a window in the house was open. Creeping softly to the open window, he threw the purse right into the room, where it fell at the feet of the nobleman. The father picked up the purse, and was very much surprised to find it full of gold pieces. Awakening his daughters, the father said, See this purse which came through the window and fell at my feet. It is indeed a gift from heaven. God has remembered us in our time of need. After they had rejoiced together, they agreed to give most of the gold to the eldest daughter, so that she would have her dowry and could wed the young man she loved. Not long after that, Nicholas filled another silken purse with gold, and again he went by night so that no one should see him, and he threw this purse also through the open window. Then when the father saw this golden gift, he again gave thanks, 
the money he gave to the second daughter, who, like her sister, at once married the man of her choice. Meanwhile the father was very curious to find out who was so kind to them, for he wished to thank the person who had come in the night to help them with these golden gifts. So he watched and waited night after night, and after a time the good Nicholas came with another silken purse filled with gold pieces for the youngest daughter. He was just about to throw it into the room when the nobleman rushed from the house, and seizing him by his long robe, knelt before him, saying, O oh, good Nicholas, servant of God, why seek to hide thyself? And he kissed his hands and feet, and tried to thank him. But Nicholas answered, Do not thank me, my good man, but thank the heavenly Father, who has sent me to you in answer to your prayers. I am but his messenger to help those who trust in him. Tell no man of these gifts of gold, nor who brought them to you in the night, for my deeds are done in his name. Thus the youngest daughter of the nobleman was married, and she and her father and sisters all lived happily, the rest of their lives. The good Nicholas went about from place to place, and wherever he went he did deeds of kindness, so that all the people loved him. One time he took a long journey to the Holy Land, and when he was upon the sea there came a terrible storm, so that the ship was tossed about and almost wrecked, and all the sailors gave up hope. But the good Nicholas said, Fear not, our heavenly Father will bring us safely into harbor. Then he knelt and prayed to God, and the storm ceased, and the boat was brought safely to the land. Whereupon the sailors fell at the feet of Nicholas and thanked him. He answered them humbly, Thank your Father who is in heaven, for he is the ruler of us all. He it is who rules the earth and the sky and the sea, and who in his good mercy spared our lives that we may serve him. When Nicholas returned from Palestine, he went to the city of Myra, where he was appointed a bishop. After that he preached God's word and went about doing good all of his life. When he died the people said, we will not call him Bishop Nicholas, but we will call him Saint Nicholas, for if ever there was a saint upon earth, it was our good Nicholas. And so to this day he is called Good Saint Nicholas. And now in many countries they tell the story of the good Saint Nicholas, and how he goes about the earth at Christmas time bringing gifts of love to all who deserve them, and because he had put his gifts of gold in the long silken purses, our children today hang up their long stockings to hold his gifts. And when the children are very good, he fills their stockings with sweetmeats, toys, and trinkets, but if they have been naughty, they will find a bunch of switches showing that they deserve to be punished. We all know that on Christmas Eve St. Nicholas will come in the night, for he never likes to be seen, and we know that he will always live, for is he not the spirit of love? And love can never die. So every Christmas let us give our gifts as he did those silken purses so long ago, without anyone knowing about it, and let our gifts be a surprise. Then we, too, can have the spirit of love and join in this celebration of Christmas with good St. Nicholas. End of The Legend of St. Nicholas by Georgine Faulkner Myths and Legends of Christmas Tide by Bertha F. Herrick. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Rob E. Brown. Lo, now is come our joyfulest feast. Let every man be jolly. Each room with ivy leaves is dressed, and every post with holly. Now all our neighbors' chimneys smoke, and Christmas blocks are burning. Their ovens they with baked meats choke, and all their spits are turning. The celebration of Christmas, which was considered by the Puritans to be idolatrous, has for many centuries been so universal that it may prove of interest to contrast the rites, ceremonies, and quaint beliefs of foreign lands with those of matter-of-fact America. Many curious customs live only in tradition, but it is surprising to find what singular superstitions still exist among credulous classes, even in the light of the twentieth century. In certain parts of England, the peasantry formerly asserted that on the anniversary of the Nativity, oxen knelt in their stalls at midnight, the supposed hour of Christ's birth, while in other localities bees were said to sing in their hives, and subterranean bells to ring a merry peal. According to legends of ancient Britain, cocks grew lustily all night on December 24th to scare away witches and evil spirits, and in Bavaria some of the countrymen made frequent and apparently aimless trips in their sledges to cause the hemp to grow thick and tall. In many lands there is still expressed the beautiful sentiment that the gates of heaven stand wide open on Christmas Eve, and that he whose soul takes flight during its hallowed hours arrives straightway at the throne of grace. A time-honored custom in Norway and Sweden is that of fastening a sheaf of wheat to a long pole on the barn or housetop for the wild bird's holiday cheer. And in Holland, the young men of the towns sometimes bear a large silver star through the snowy streets, collecting alms from pedestrians for the helpless or the aged sick. Russia has no Santa Claus or Christmas tree, although the festival is celebrated by church services and by ceremonies similar to those of our Halloween. In some of the villages in Wales, a Christmas pudding is boiled for each of the disciples with the exception of Judas, and in the rural districts of Scotland, bread baked on Christmas Eve is said to indefinitely retain its freshness. The fatherland is the home of the Christmas tree, which is thought to be symbolical of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden and candles were first used to typify the power of Christianity over the darkness of paganism, being sometimes arranged in triangular form to represent the Trinity. Pines and firs being unattainable in the tropical islands of the Pacific, the white residents sometimes cut down a fruit tree, such as an orange or a guava, or actually manufacture a tree from wood covering the bare stiff boughs with clinging vines of evergreen. In the Holy Land at this season, the place of greatest interest is, naturally, the Church of the Nativity at Bethlehem, erected on the supposed location where Christ was born. It is said to be the oldest Christian church in existence, having been built more than fifteen centuries ago by the Empress Helena, mother of Constantine. Repairs were made later by Edward IV of England, but it is now again fast falling into decay. The roof was originally composed of cedar of Lebanon, and the walls were studded with precious jewels, while numerous lamps of silver and gold were suspended from the rafters. The Greeks, Latins, and Armenians now claim joint possession of the structure and jealously guard its sacred precincts. 
Immediately beneath the nave of the cathedral is a commodious marble chamber constructed over the spot where the far-famed stable was said to have stood and reached by a flight of stone steps worn smooth by the tread and kisses of multitudes of worshippers. The manger is represented by a marble slab a couple of feet in height, decorated with tinsel and blue satin, and marked at the head with a chiseled star, bearing above it the inscription in Latin, Here was Jesus Christ born of the Virgin Mary. At the foot are several altars, on which incense is ever kept burning, and from which mass is conducted, while a score of hanging lamps shed a fitful light over the apartment. Many theories have been advanced as to the explanation of the mysterious star in the east which guided the wandering shepherds, but it is now thought to have been Venus at the height of its splendor. The early Christians decorated their churches with evergreens out of respect to the passage of Scripture in Isaiah. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And the pagans believed them to be omens of good, as the spirits of the woods remained in their branches. Holly is known in Germany and Scandinavia as Christ's thorn and is emblematic everywhere of cheerfulness, forgiveness, peace on earth, and goodwill to men. The oak mistletoe, or missal, was held in high veneration by the ancient Druids, who, regarding its parasitic character as a miracle and its evergreen nature as a symbol of immortality, worshipped it in their temples, and used it as a panacea for the physical ailments of their followers. When the moon was six days old, the bunches were ceremoniously cut with a golden sickle by the chief priest of the order and received with care into the spotless robes of one of the company, for if they fell to the unholy ground, their virtues were considered lost. Then, crowned with oak leaves and singing songs of thanksgiving, they bore the branches in solemn procession to the altars where two white oxen were sacrificed to the gods. The custom of kissing under the mistletoe dates back to the days of Scandinavian mythology when the god of darkness shot his rival, the immortal Apollo of the North, with an arrow made from its boughs. But the supposed victim being miraculously restored to life, the mistletoe was given into the keeping of the goddess of affection as a symbol of love and not of death to those who passed beneath it. A berry was required to be picked with every kiss and presented to the maiden as a sign of good fortune, the privilege ceasing when all the berries were gathered. One of the most beautiful legends of the Black Forest in Germany is that of the origin of the chrysanthemum, or Christ flower. On a dark, stormy Christmas Eve, a poor charcoal burner was wending his way homeward through the deep snowdrifts under the pine trees with a loaf of coarse black bread and a piece of goat's milk cheese as contributions to the holiday cheer. Suddenly, during a brief lull in the tempest, he heard a low, wailing cry, and searching patiently, at length discovered a benumbed and half-clad child, but little more than an infant in years or size. Wrapping him snugly in his cloak, he hurried onward toward the humble cottage from which rays of light streamed cheerfully through the uncurtained windows. The good housemutter sat before the fire with her little ones, anxiously awaiting her husband's return, and when the poor frozen waif was placed upon her knee, her heart overflowed with compassion, and before long he was comfortably warmed and fed while the children vied with each other in displaying the attractions of the pretty fir tree with its tiny colored tapers and paper ornaments. 
all at once a mist appeared, enveloping the timid stranger. A halo formed around his brow, and two silvery wings sprang magically from his shoulders. Gradually rising higher and higher, he finally disappeared from sight, his hands outspread in benediction, while the terror-stricken family fell upon their knees, crossing themselves and murmuring in awestruck whispers, The Holy Christ, child! The next morning the father found on the bleak cold spot where the child had lain a lovely blossom of dazzling white which he bore reverently homeward and named the chrysanthemum or flower of Christ. And each succeeding festival season some starved and neglected orphan was bidden to his frugal board in memory of the time when he entertained an angel unawares. In merry England, Christmas was the chief event of the entire year, and was sometimes celebrated for nearly a month. The tables of the wealthy literally groaned with plenty, but the poor without their gates were not forgotten, for old Christmas had come for to keep open house. He'd scorn to be guilty of starving a mouse. During the reign of Elizabeth, the boar's head was the favorite holiday dish, and was served with mustard then a rare and costly condiment, and decorated with bay leaves and rosemary, which was said to strengthen the memory, to clear the brain, and to stimulate affection. Boars were originally sacrificed to the Scandinavian gods of peace and plenty, and many odes were composed in their honor. That remarkable compound known as wassail was composed of warm ale or wine, sweetened with sugar and flavored with spices, and bearing upon its surface floating bits of toast and roasted crabs and apples. The huge bowl, gaily decorated with ribbons, was passed from hand to hand around the table, each guest taking a portion of its contents as a sign of joviality and good fellowship. But the triumph of the pastry cook's art was the rare minced pie, the use of which is of great antiquity. The shape was formerly a narrow oblong representing the celebrated manger at Bethlehem, and the fruits and spices of which it was composed were symbolic of those that the wise men of the Orient brought as offerings to their newborn king, while to partake of such a pie was considered a proof that the eater was a Christian and not a Jew. All sorts of games were immensely popular with the English, whether king or serf, aristocrat or pauper, merchant or apprentice. A Christmas gamble oft could cheer the poor man's heart through half the year. Everyone has heard of the matchless Lord of Misrule, also known as the Abbot of Unreason and the Master of Merry Disports, who attended by his mock court, king's jester, and grotesquely masked revelers, visited the castles of lords and princes to entertain them with strange antics and uproarious merriment. His reign lasted until Twelfth Night, during which period he was treated as became a genuine monarch, being feted and feasted with all his train, and having absolute authority over individuals and state affairs. The great event of the evening after the holiday feast was the bringing in of the famous Yule log, which was often the entire root of a tree. Much ceremony and rejoicing attended this performance, as it was considered lucky to help pull the rope. It was lighted by a person with freshly washed hands, with a brand saved from the last year's fire and was never allowed to be extinguished, as the witches would then come down the chimney. The presence of a barefooted or cross-eyed individual, or of a woman with flat feet, was thought to foretell misfortune for the coming year. The games of Snap Dragon and Hot Cockles are supposed to be relics either of the ordeal by fire or of the days of the ancient fire worshippers. The former consists of snatching raisins from a bowl of burning brandy or alcohol, and the latter of taking frantic bites at a red apple revolving rapidly upon a pivot in alternation with a lighted taper. 
Christmas carols are commemorative of the angel's song to the shepherds on the plains of Bethlehem and are seldom heard in America save by the surpliced choirs of the Episcopal churches. The English waits, or serenaders, who sang under the squire's windows in hopes of receiving a Christmas box, unconsciously add a touch of romance and picturesqueness to the associations of the season. For upon the frosty evening air arose such strains as, Awake, glad heart, arise and sing, it is the birthday of thy king. Or, God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, for Jesus Christ our Savior was born upon this day. Most of the old-time favorites are too well known for repetition. The mere mention of their names recalls the scent of evergreens, the pealing of the organ, the tinkle of sleigh bells, and the music of the Christmas chimes. Hark the herald angels sing, while shepherds watched their flocks by night. Gloria in excelsis, and many others embody the very spirit of the season and will live till time shall cease to be. Sing the song of great joy that the angels began, sing of glory to God and of good will to man, while joining in chorus the heavens bend o'er us, the dark night is ending, and dawn has begun. End of Myths and Legends of Christmas Tide by Bertha F. Herrick. My Uncle Peter by George MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devora Allen. I will tell you the story of my Uncle Peter, who was born on Christmas Day. He was very anxious to die on Christmas Day as well, but I must confess that was rather ambitious in Uncle Peter. Shakespeare is said to have been born on St. George's Day, and there is some ground for believing that he died on St. George's Day. He thus fulfilled a cycle. But we cannot expect that of any but great men, and Uncle Peter was not a great man, though I think I shall be able to show that he was a good man. The only pieces of selfishness I ever discovered in him were his self-gratulation at having been born on Christmas Day, and the ambition with regard to his death, which I have just recorded, and that this selfishness was not of a kind to be very injurious to his fellow men, I think I shall be able to show as well. The first remembrance that I have of him is his taking me one Christmas Eve to the largest toy shop in London, and telling me to choose any toy whatever that I pleased. He little knew the agony of choice into which this request of his, for it was put to me as a request, in the most polite, loving manner, through his astonished nephew. If a general right of choice from the treasures of the whole world had been unanimously voted me, it could hardly have cast me into a greater perplexity. I wandered about, staring like a distracted ghost at the wealth of Ormus and of Ind displayed about me. Uncle Peter followed me with perfect patience, nay, I believe with a delight that equaled my perplexity for every now and then when I looked round to him with a silent appeal for sympathy in the distressing dilemma into which he had thrown me, I found him rubbing his hands and spiritually chuckling over his victim. Nor would he volunteer the least assistance to save me from the dire consequences of too much liberty. How long I was in making up my mind I cannot tell, but as I look back upon this splendor of my childhood— I feel as if I must have wandered for weeks through interminable forest alleys of toy-bearing trees. As often as I read the story of Aladdin, and I read it now and then still, for I have children about and their books about, the subterranean orchard of jewels always brings back to my inward vision the inexhaustible riches of the toy shop to which Uncle Peter took me that Christmas Eve. As soon as, in despair of choosing well, I had made a desperate plunge at decision— my Uncle Peter, as if to forestall any supervention of repentance, began buying like a maniac, giving me everything that took his fancy or mine, till we and our toys nearly filled the cab which he called to take us home. Uncle Peter was a little round man, not very fat, 
resembling both in limbs and features an overgrown baby. And I believe the resemblance was not merely an external one. For though his intellect was quite up to par, he retained a degree of simplicity of character and of tastes that was not childlike only, but bordered sometimes upon the childish. To look at him, you could not have fancied a face or a figure with less of the romantic about them. Yet I believe that the whole region of his brain was held in fee simple, whatever that may mean, by a race of fairy architects, who built aerial castles therein regardless of expense. His imagination was the most distinguishing feature of his character, and to hear him defend any of his extravagancies, it would appear that he considered himself especially privileged in that respect. "'Ah, my dear,' he would say to my mother, when she expostulated with him on making some present far beyond the small means he at that time possessed. "'Ah, my dear, you see I was born on Christmas Day.' Many a time he would come in from town, where he was a clerk in a merchant's office, with the water running out of his boots and his umbrella carefully tucked under his arm. And we would know very well that he had given the last coppers he had for his omnibus home to some beggar or crossing sweeper, and had then been so delighted with the pleasure he had given that he forgot to make the best of it by putting up his umbrella. Home he would trudge in his worn suit of black, with his steel watch-chain and bunch of ancestral seals swinging and ringing from his fob, and the rain running into his trousers' pockets, to the great endangerment of the health of his cherished old silver watch, which never went wrong because it was put right every day by St. Paul's. He was quite poor then, as I have said. I do not think he had more than a hundred pounds a year, and he must have been five and thirty. I suppose his employers showed their care for the morals of their clerks, by never allowing them any margin to misspend. But Uncle Peter lived in constant hope and expectation of some unexampled good luck befalling him. For, said he, I was born on Christmas Day. He was never married. When people used to jest with him about being an old bachelor, he used to smile, for anything would make him smile. But I was a very little boy indeed when I began to observe that the smile on such occasions was mingled with sadness and that Uncle Peter's face looked very much as if he were going to cry. But he never said anything on the subject, and not even my mother knew whether he had had any love story or not. I have often wondered whether his goodness might not come in part from his having lost someone very dear to him, and having his life on earth purified by the thoughts of her life in heaven. But I never found out. After his death, for he did die, though not on Christmas Day, I found a lock of hair folded in paper with a date on it, that was all, in a secret drawer of his old desk. The date was far earlier than my first recollections of him. I reverentially burnt it with fire. He lived in lodgings by himself not far from our house, and when not with us was pretty sure to be found seated in his easy chair, for he was fond of his simple comforts, beside a good fire, reading by the light of one candle. He had his tea always as soon as he came home, and some buttered toast or a hot muffin, of which he was sure to make me eat three quarters if I chanced to drop in upon him at the right hour, which, I am rather ashamed to say, I not unfrequently did. He dared not order another, as I soon discovered. Yet I fear that did not abate my appetite for what there was. You see, I was never so good as Uncle Peter. When he had finished his tea, he turned his chair to the fire and read— what do you think? Sensible travels and discoveries, or political economy, or popular geology? No. Fairy tales, as many as he could lay hold of, and when they failed him, romances or novels. Almost anything in this way would do that was not bad. I believe he had read every word of Richardson's novels, and most of Fielding's and Defoe's. But once I saw him throw a volume in the fire, which he had been fidgeting over for a while. I was just finishing a sum I had brought across to him to help me with. I looked up and saw the volume in the fire. The heat made it writhe open, and I saw the author's name, and that was Stern. He had bought it at a bookstall as he came home. He sat a while, and then got up and took down his Bible, and began reading a chapter in the New Testament, as if for an antidote to the book he had destroyed. But Uncle Peter's luck came at last. At least, he thought it did, 
when he received a lawyer's letter announcing the demise of a cousin of whom he had heard little for a great many years, although they had been warm friends while at school together. This cousin had been brought up to some trade in the wood line, had been a cooper or a carpenter, and had somehow or other got landed in India, and, though not in the company's service, had contrived in one way and another to amass what might be called a large fortune in any rank of life. I am afraid to mention the amount of it, lest it should throw discredit on my story. The whole of this fortune he left to Uncle Peter, for he had no nearer relation, and had always remembered him with affection. I happened to be seated beside my uncle when the lawyer's letter arrived. He was reading Peter Wilkins. He laid down the book with reluctance, thinking the envelope contained some advertisement of slaty coal for his kitchen fire, or cottony silk for his girls' dresses. Fancy my surprise when my little uncle jumped up on his chair, and thence on the table, upon which he commenced a sort of demoniac hornpipe. But that sober article of furniture declined giving its support to such proceedings for a single moment, and fell with an awful crash to the floor. My uncle was dancing amidst its ruins like Nero in blazing Rome, when he was reduced to an awful sense of impropriety by the entrance of his landlady. I was sitting in open-mouthed astonishment at my uncle's extravagance, when he suddenly dropped into his chair like a lark into its nest, leaving heaven silent. But silence did not reign long. "'Well, Mr. Belper,' began his landlady, in a tone as difficult of description as it is easy of conception, for her fists had already planted themselves in her own opposing sides. But to my astonishment, my uncle was not in the least awed, although I am sure, however much he tried to hide it, that I have often seen him tremble in his shoes at the distant roar of this tigress. But it is wonderful how much courage a pocketful of sovereigns will give. It is far better for rousing the pluck of a man than any number of bottles of wine in his head. What a brave thing a whole fortune must be, then. "'Take that rickety old thing away,' said my uncle. "'Rickety, Mr. Belper! I'm astonished to hear a decent gentleman like you slander the very table as you've eaten off for the last—' "'We won't be precise to a year, ma'am,' interrupted my uncle. "'And if you will have little scapegraces of nevies into my house to break the furniture, why, them as breaks pays, Mr. Belper.' "'Very well. Of course I will pay for it. I broke it myself, ma'am. And if you don't get out of my room, I'll—' Uncle Peter jumped up once more and made for the heap of ruins in the middle of the floor. The landlady vanished in a moment, and my uncle threw himself again into his chair and absolutely roared with laughter. "'Shan't we have rare fun, Charlie, my boy?' said he at last, and went off into another fit of laughter. "'Why, uncle, what is the matter with you?' I managed to say in utter bewilderment. "'Nothing but luck, Charlie. It's gone to my head.' I'm not used to it, Charlie, that's all. I'll come all right by and by. Bless you, my boy. What do you think was the first thing my uncle did to relieve himself of the awful accession of power which had just befallen him? The following morning he gathered together every sixpence he had in the house, and went out of one grocer's shop into another, and out of one baker's shop into another, until he had changed the whole into three penny pieces. Then he walked to town as usual to business. But one or two of his friends who were walking the same way and followed behind him could not think what Mr. Belper was about. Every crossing that he came to he made use of to cross to the other side. He crossed and recrossed the same street twenty times, they said. But at length they observed that, with a leisure domain worthy of a professor, he slipped something into every sweeper's hand as he passed him. It was one of the threepenny pieces." When he walked home in the evening, he had nothing to give, and besides went through one of the wet experiences to which I have already alluded. To add to his discomfort, he found, when he got home, that his tobacco jar was quite empty, so that he was forced to put on his wet shoes again, for he never, to the end of his days, had more than one pair at a time, in order to come across to my mother to borrow sixpence. Before the legacy was paid to him, he went through a good many of the tortures which result from being a king and no king. The inward consciousness and the outward possibility did not in the least correspond. At length, after much maneuvering with the lawyers, who seemed to sympathize with the departed cousin in this, 
that they too would prefer keeping the money till death parted them and it. He succeeded in getting a thousand pounds of it on Christmas Eve. Now, said Uncle Peter, in enormous capitals. That night a thundering knock came to our door. We were all sitting in our little dining room, father, mother, and seven children of us, talking about what we should do next day. The door opened, and in came the most grotesque figure you could imagine. It was seven feet high at least, without any head, a mere walking tree stump as far as shape went, only it looked soft. The little ones were terrified, but not the bigger ones of us, for from top to toe, if it had a toe, it was covered with toys of every conceivable description, fastened on to it somehow or other. It was a perfect treasure cave of Ali Baba turned inside out. We shrieked with delight. The figure stood perfectly still, and we gathered round it in a group to have a nearer view of the wonder. We then discovered that there were tickets on all the articles, which we supposed at first to record the price of each. But upon still closer examination, we discovered that every one of the tickets had one or other of our names upon it. This caused a fresh explosion of joy. Nor was it the children only that were thus remembered. A little box bore my mother's name. When she opened it, we saw a real gold watch and chain, and seals and dangles of every sort, of useful and useless kind, and my mother's initials were on the back of the watch. My father had a silver flute, and to the music of it we had such a dance. The strange figure, now considerably lighter, joining in it without uttering a word. During the dance, one of my sisters, a very sharp-eyed little puss, espied about halfway up the monster, two bright eyes looking out of a shadowy depth of something like the skirts of a great coat. She peeped and peeped, and at length, with a perfect scream of exultation, cried out, "'It's Uncle Peter! It's Uncle Peter!' The music ceased, the dance was forgotten. We flew upon him like a pack of hungry wolves. We tore him to the ground, despoiled him of coats and plaids and elevating sticks, and discovered the colonel of the beneficent monster in the person of real Uncle Peter." which, after all, was the best present he could have brought us on Christmas Eve, for we had been very dull for want of him, and had been wondering why he did not come. But Uncle Peter had laid great plans for his birthday, and for the carrying out of them he took me into his confidence, I being now a lad of fifteen, and partaking sufficiently of my uncle's nature to enjoy at least the fun of his benevolence. He had been for some time perfecting his information about a few of the families in the neighborhood, for he was a bit of a gossip, and did not turn his landlady out of the room when she came in with a whisper of news, in the manner in which he had turned her out when she came to expostulate about the table. But she knew her lodger well enough never to dare to bring him any scandal. From her he had learned that a certain artist in the neighborhood was very poor. He made inquiry about him where he thought he could hear more, and finding that he was steady and hard-working— Uncle Peter never cared to inquire whether he had genius or not. It was enough to him that the poor fellow's pictures did not sell. Resolved that he should have a more pleasant Christmas than he expected. One other chief outlet for his brotherly love in the present instance was a dissenting minister and his wife, who had a large family of little children. They lived in the same street with himself. Uncle Peter was an unwavering adherent to the Church of England, but he would have felt himself a dissenter at once if he had excommunicated anyone by withdrawing his sympathies from him. He knew that this minister was a thoroughly good man, and he had even gone to hear him preach once or twice. He knew, too, that his congregation was not the more liberal to him that he was liberal to all men. So he resolved that he would act the part of one of the black angels that brought bread and meat to Elijah in the wilderness. Uncle Peter would never have pretended to rank higher than one of the foresaid ravens. A great part of the forenoon of Christmas Day was spent by my uncle and me in preparations. The presents he had planned were many, but I will only mention two or three of them in particular. For the minister and his family he got a small bottle with a large mouth. This he filled as full of new sovereigns as it would hold, labeled it outside pickled mushrooms, "'For doesn't it grow in the earth without any seed?' said he, and then wrapped it up like a grocer's parcel. For the artist, he took a large shell from his chimney-piece, 
folded a fifty-pound note in a bit of paper, which he tied up with a green ribbon, inserted the paper in the jaws of the shell so that the ends of the ribbon should hang out, folded it up in paper and sealed it, wrote outside, inquire within, and closed the hole in a tin box and directed it with Christmas Day's compliments. For wasn't I born on Christmas Day, concluded Uncle Peter for the twentieth time that forenoon. Then there were a dozen or two of the best port he could get for a lady who had just had a baby and whose husband and his income he knew from business relations. Nor were the children forgotten. Every house in his street and ours in which he knew there were little ones had a parcel of toys and sweet things prepared for it. As soon as the afternoon grew dusky, we set out with as many as we could carry. A slight disguise secured me from discovery, my duty being to leave the parcels at the different houses. In the case of the more valuable of them, my duty was to ask for the master or mistress and see the packet in safe hands. In this I was successful in every instance. It must have been a great relief to my uncle when the number of parcels was sufficiently diminished to restore to him the use of his hands, for to him they were as necessary for rubbing as a tail is to a dog for wagging, in both cases for electrical reasons, no doubt. He dropped several parcels in the vain attempt to hold them and perform the usual frictional movement notwithstanding. So he was compelled instead to go through a kind of solemn pace, which got more and more rapid as the parcels decreased in number, till it became at last, in its wild movements, something like a Highlander's sword dance. We had to go home several times for more, keeping the best till the last. When Uncle Peter saw me give the pickled mushrooms into the hands of the lady of the house, he uttered a kind of laugh, strangled into a crow which startled the good lady, who was evidently rather alarmed already at the weight of the small parcel. For she said, with a scared look, "'It's not gunpowder, is it?' "'No,' I said. "'I think it's shot.' "'Shot!' said she, looking even more alarmed. "'Don't you think you had better take it back again?' She held the parcel to me and made as if she would shut the door. "'Why, ma'am,' I answered, "'you would not have me taken up for stealing it.' It was a foolish reply, but it answered the purpose, if not the question. She kept the parcel and shut the door. When I looked round, I saw my uncle going through a regular series of convolutions, corresponding exactly to the bodily contortions he must have executed at school every time he received a course of what they call palmies in Scotland if, indeed, Uncle Peter was ever even suspected of improper behavior at school. It consisted first of a dance, then a double-up, then another dance, then another double-up, and so on. "'Some stupid hoax, I suppose,' said the artist, as I put the parcel into his hands. He looked gloomy enough, poor fellow. "'Don't be too sure of that, if you please, sir,' said I, and vanished. Everything was a good joke to Uncle all that evening.' "'Charlie,' said he, "'I never had such a birthday in my life before. "'But please, God, now I've begun, "'this will not be the last of the sort. "'But you, young rascal, if you split, "'why, I'll thrash the life out of you.' "'No, I won't.' "'Here my uncle assumed a dignified attitude "'and concluded with mock solemnity. "'No, I won't. "'I will cut you off with a shilling.' "'This was a crescendo passage ending in a howl.' upon which he commenced once more an edition of the Highland Fling, with impromptu variations. When all the parcels were delivered, we walked home together to my uncle's lodgings, where he gave me a glass of wine and a sovereign for my trouble. I believe I felt as rich as any of them. But now I must tell you the romance of my uncle's life. I do not mean the suspected hidden romance, for that no one knew, except indeed a dead one knew all about it. It was a later romance, which, however, nearly cost him his life once. One Christmas Eve we had been occupied, as usual, with the presence of the following Christmas Day, and, will you believe it, in the same lodgings, too, for my uncle was a thorough Tory in his hatred of change. Indeed, although two years had passed, and he had had the whole of his property at his disposal since the legal term of one year— he still continued to draw his salary of one hundred pounds of Messrs. Buff and Codgers. One Christmas Eve, I say, I was helping him to make up parcels, when, from a sudden impulse, I said to him, "'How good you are, Uncle!' "'Ha, ha, ha!' 
laughed he. That's the best joke of all. Good, my boy. <laughs> Why, Charlie, you don't fancy I care one atom for all these people, do you? I do it all to please myself. <laughs> it's the cheapest pleasure at the money, considering the quality that I know. That is a joke. Good indeed. <laughs> I am happy to say I was an old enough bird not to be caught with this metaphysical chaff. But my uncle's face grew suddenly very grave, even sad in its expression. And after a pause he resumed, but this time without any laughing. Good, Charlie. Why, I'm no use to anybody. You do me good anyhow, uncle, I answered. If I'm not a better man for having you for an uncle, why, I shall be a great deal the worse, that's all. Why, there it is, rejoined my uncle. I don't know whether I do good or harm. But for you, Charlie, you're a good boy and don't want any good done to you. It would break my heart, Charlie, if I thought you weren't a good boy. He always called me a boy after I was a grown man. But then I believe he always felt like a boy himself, and quite forgot that we were uncle and nephew. I was silent, and he resumed. I wish I could be of real, unmistakable use to anyone. But I fear I am not good enough to have that honor done me. Next morning, that was Christmas Day, he went out for a walk alone, apparently oppressed with the thought with which the serious part of our conversation on the preceding evening had closed. Of course, nothing less than a threepenny piece would do for a crossing sweeper on Christmas Day, but one tiny little girl touched his heart so that the usual coin was doubled. Still, this did not relieve the heart of the giver sufficiently, for the child looked up in his face in a way, whatever the way was, that made his heart ache. So he gave her a shilling. But he felt no better after that. I am following his own account of feelings and circumstances. This won't do, said Uncle Peter to himself. What is your name? said Uncle Peter to the little girl. Little Christmas, she answered. Little Christmas, exclaimed Uncle Peter. I see why that wouldn't do now. What do you mean? Little Christmas, sir, please, sir. Who calls you that? Everybody, sir. Why do they call you that? It's my name, sir. What's your father's name? I ain't got none, sir. But you know what his name was. No, sir. How did you get your name, then? It must be the same as your father's, you know. Then I suppose my father was Christmas Day, sir, for I knows of none else. They always calls me Little Christmas. Hmm, a little sister of mine, I see, said Uncle Peter to himself. Well, who's your mother? My aunt, sir. She knows I'm out, sir. There was not the least impudence in the child's tone or manner in saying this. She looked up at him with her gypsy eye in the most confident manner. She had not struck him in the least as beautiful. But the longer he looked at her, the more he was pleased with her. Is your aunt kind to you? She gives me my whittles. Suppose you did not get any money all day. What would she say to you? Oh, she won't give me a hiding today, sir, supposing I gets no more. You've given me enough already, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll change it into halfpence. She does beat you sometimes, then? Oh, my. Here she rubbed her arms and elbows, as if she ached all over at the thought, and these were the only parts she could reach to rub for the hole. I will, said Uncle Peter to himself. Do you think you were born on Christmas Day, little one? I think I was once, sir. I shall teach the child to tell lies if I go on asking her questions in this way, thought my uncle. Will you go home with me? he said coaxingly. Yes, sir, if you will tell me where to put my broom, for I must not go home without it, else Aunt would wallop me. I will buy you a new broom. But Aunt would wallop me all the same if I did not bring home the old one for a Christmas fire. Never mind, I will take care of you. You may bring your broom if you like, though, he added, seeing a cloud come over the little face. Thank you, sir, said the child, and shouldering her broom, she trotted along behind him as he led the way home. But this would not do either. Before they had gone twelve paces, he had the child in one hand, and before they had gone a second twelve, he had the broom in the other. And so Uncle Peter walked home with his child and his broom. The latter he set down inside the door, and the former he led upstairs to his room. There he seated her on a chair by the fire, and ringing the bell, asked the landlady to bring a basin of bread and milk. The woman cast a look of indignation and wrath at the poor little immortal. 
she might have been the impersonation of Christmas Day in the catacombs, as she sat with her feet wide apart and reaching halfway down the legs of the chair, and her black eyes staring from the midst of knotted tangles of hair that never felt brush or comb, or were defended from the wind by bonnet or hood. I dare say Uncle's poor apartment, with its cases of stuffed birds and its square piano that was used for a cupboard, seemed to her the most sumptuous of conceivable abodes. But she said nothing, only stared. When her bread and milk came, she ate it up without a word, and when she had finished it, sat still for a moment, as if pondering what it became her to do next. Then she rose, dropped a curtsy, and said, "'Thank you, sir. Please, sir, where's my broom?' "'Oh, but I want you to stop with me and be my little girl.' "'Please, sir, I would rather go to my crossing.' The face of little Christmas lengthened visibly, and she was upon the point of crying. Uncle Peter saw that he had been too precipitate, and that he must woo the child before he could hope to win her. So he asked her for her address. But though she knew the way to her home perfectly, she could give only what seemed to him the most confused directions how to find it. No doubt to her they seemed as clear as day. Afraid of terrifying her by following her, the best way seemed to him to promise her a new frock on the morrow if she would come and fetch it. Her face brightened so at the sound of a new frock that my uncle had very little fear of the fault being hers if she did not come. "'Will you know the way back, my dear?' "'I always know my way anywheres,' answered she. So she was allowed to depart with her cherished broom." Uncle Peter took my mother into counsel upon the affair of the frock. She thought an old one of my sisters would do best. But my uncle had said a new frock, and a new one it must be. So next day my mother went with him to buy one, and was excessively amused with his entire ignorance of what was suitable for the child. However, the frock being purchased, he saw how absurd it would be to put a new frock over such garments as she must have below and accordingly made my mother buy everything to clothe her completely. With these treasures he hastened home, and found poor little Christmas and her broom waiting for him outside the door, for the landlady would not let her in. This roused the wrath of my uncle to such a degree that, although he had borne wrongs innumerable and aggravated for a long period of years without complaint, he walked in and gave her notice that he would leave in a week. I think she expected he would forget all about it before the day arrived, but with his further designs for little Christmas, he was not likely to forget it. And I fear I have seldom enjoyed anything so much as the consternation of the woman, whom I heartily hated, when she saw a truck arrive to remove my uncle's few personal possessions from her inhospitable roof. I believe she took her revenge by giving her cronies to understand that she had turned my uncle away at a week's warning for bringing home improper companions to her respectable house. But to return to little Christmas. She fared all the better for the landlady's unkindness, for my mother took her home and washed her with her own soft hands from head to foot, and then put all the new clothes on her, and she looked charming. How my uncle would have managed, I can't think. He was delighted at the improvement in her appearance. I saw him turn round and wipe his eyes with his handkerchief. Now, little Christmas, will you come and live with me? said he. She pulled the same face though not quite so long as before, and said, "'I would rather go to my crossing, please, sir.' My uncle heaved a sigh and let her go. She shouldered her broom as if it had been the rifle of a giant and trotted away to her work. But next day, and the next, and the next, she was not to be seen at her wanted corner. When a whole week had passed and she did not make her appearance, my uncle was in despair. "'You see, Charlie,' said he, I am fated to be of no use to anybody, though I was born on Christmas Day. The very next day, however, being Sunday, my uncle found her as he went to church. She was sweeping a new crossing. She seemed to have found a lower deep still, for alas, all her new clothes were gone, and she was more tattered and wretched looking than before. As soon as she saw my uncle, she burst into tears. Look, she said, pulling up her little frock, and showing her thigh with a terrible bruise upon it. She did it. A fresh burst of tears followed. Where are your new clothes, little Christmas? asked my uncle. She sold them for gin, and then beat me awful. Please, sir, I couldn't help it. 
The child's tears were so bitter that my uncle, without thinking, said, "'Never mind, dear. You shall have another frock.' Her tears ceased, and her face brightened for a moment. But the weeping returned almost instantaneously with increased violence, and she sobbed out, "'It's no use, sir. She'd only serve me the same, sir.' "'Will you come home and live with me, then?' "'Yes, please.' She flung her broom from her into the middle of the street, nearly throwing down a cab horse betwixt whose forelegs it tried to pass. Then, heedless of the oaths of the man, whom my uncle pacified with a shilling, put her hand in that of her friend, and trotted home with him. From that day till the day of his death she never left him, of her own accord at least. My uncle had by this time got into lodgings with a woman of the right sort, who received the little stray lamb with open arms and open heart. Once more she was washed and clothed from head to foot, and from skin to frock. My uncle never allowed her to go out without him, or someone who was capable of protecting her. He did not think it at all necessary to supply the woman, who might not be her aunt after all, with gin unlimited, for the privilege of rescuing little Christmas from her cruelty. So he felt that she was in great danger of being carried off, for the sake either of her earnings or her ransom and in fact some very suspicious-looking characters were several times observed prowling about in the neighborhood. Uncle Peter, however, took what care he could to prevent any report of this reaching the ears of Little Christmas, lest she should live in terror, and contented himself with watching her carefully. It was some time before my mother would consent to our playing with her freely and beyond her sight, for it was strange to hear the ugly words which would now and then break from her dear little innocent lips. But she was very easily cured of this, although, of course, some time must pass before she could be quite depended upon. She was a sweet-tempered, loving child, but the love seemed for some time to have no way of showing itself, so little had she been used to ways of love and tenderness. When we kissed her she never returned the kiss, but only stared. Yet whatever we asked her to do, she would do as if her whole heart was in it, and I did not doubt it was. Now I know it was. After a few years, when Christmas began to be considered tolerably capable of taking care of herself, the vigilance of my uncle gradually relaxed a little. A month before her thirteenth birthday, as near as my uncle could guess, the girl disappeared. She had gone to the day school as usual, and was expected home in the afternoon, for my uncle would never part with her to go to a boarding school, and yet wished her to have the benefit of mingling with her fellows, and not being always tied to the buttonhole of an old bachelor. But she did not return at the usual hour. My uncle went to inquire about her. She had left the school with the rest. Night drew on. My uncle was in despair. He roamed the streets all night, spoke about his child to every policeman he met, went to the station house of the district and described her, had bills printed and offered a hundred pounds reward for her restoration. All was unavailing. The miscreants must have seen bills, but feared to repose confidence in the offer. Poor Uncle Peter drooped and grew thin. Before the month was out, his clothes were hanging about him like a sack. He could hardly swallow a mouthful, hardly even sit down to a meal. I believe he loved his little Christmas every whit as much as if she had been his own daughter. Perhaps more, for he could not help thinking of what she might have been if he had not rescued her, and he felt that God had given her to him as certainly as if she had been his own child, only that she had come in another way. He would get out of bed in the middle of the night, unable to sleep, and go wandering up and down the streets and into dreadful places sometimes to try to find her, but fasting and watching could not go on long without bringing friends with them. Uncle Peter was seized with a fever, which grew and grew till his life was despaired of. He was very delirious at times, and then the strangest fancies had possession of his brain. Sometimes he seemed to see the horrid woman she called her aunt torturing the poor child. Sometimes it was old pagan Father Christmas, clothed in snow and ice, come to fetch his daughter. Sometimes it was his old landlady shutting her out in the frost, or himself finding her afterwards, but frozen so hard to the ground that he could not move her to get her indoors. The doctors seemed doubtful, and gave as their opinion a decided shake of the head. Christmas Day arrived. In the afternoon, to the wonder of all about him, although he had been wandering a moment before, he suddenly said, 
I was born on Christmas Day, you know. This is the first Christmas Day that didn't bring me good luck. Turning to me, he added, Charlie, my boy, it's a good thing another besides me was born on Christmas Day, isn't it? Yes, dear uncle, said I, and it was all I could say. He lay quite quiet for a few minutes, when there came a gentle knock to the street door. That's Chrissy, he cried, starting up in bed and stretching out his arms with trembling eagerness. And me to say this Christmas day would bring me no good. He fell back on his pillow and burst into a flood of tears. I rushed down to the door and reached it before the servant. I stared. There stood a girl about the size of Chrissy, with an old battered bonnet on and a ragged shawl. She was standing on the doorstep, trembling. I felt she was trembling somehow, for I don't think I saw it. She had Chrissy's eyes, too, I thought, but the light was dim now, for the evening was coming on. All this passed through my mind in a moment, during which she stood silent. What is it? I said, in a tremor of expectation. Charlie, don't you know me? she said, and burst into tears. We were in each other's arms in a moment, for the first time. But Chrissy is my wife now. I led her upstairs in triumph and into my uncle's room. I knew it was my lamb, he cried, stretching out his arms and trying to lift himself up, only he was too weak. Chrissy flew to his arms. She was very dirty, and her clothes had such a smell of poverty. But there she lay in my uncle's bosom, both of them sobbing for a long time. And when at last she withdrew, she tumbled down on the floor, and there she lay motionless. I was in a dreadful fright, but my mother came in at the moment while I was trying to put some brandy within her cold lips and got her into a warm bath and put her to bed. In the morning she was much better, though the doctor would not let her get up for a day or two. I think, however, that was partly for my uncle's sake. When at length she entered the room one morning, dressed in her own nice clothes, for there were plenty in the wardrobe in her room, my uncle stretched out his arms to her once more and said, "'Ah, Chrissy, I thought I was going to have my own way and die on Christmas Day, but it would have been one too soon before I had found you, my darling.' It was resolved that on the same evening Chrissy should tell my uncle her story. We went out for a walk together, and though she was not afraid to go, the least thing startled her. A voice behind her would make her turn pale and look hurriedly round. Then she would smile again, even before the color had had time to come back to her cheeks, and say, "'What a goose I am! But it is no wonder.' I could see, too, that she looked down at her nice clothes now and then with satisfaction. She does not like me to say so, but she does not deny it either, for Chrissy can't tell a story even about her own feelings. My uncle had given us five pounds each to spend, and that was jolly. We bought each other such a lot of things, besides some for other people.' and then we came home and had dinner tete-a-tete -tete in my uncle's dining-room, after which we went up to my uncle's room and sat over the fire in the twilight till his afternoon nap was over and he was ready for his tea. This was ready for him by the time he awoke. Chrissy got up on the bed beside him. I got up at the foot of the bed facing her, and we had the tea-tray and plenty of etceteras between us. "'Oh, I am happy,' said Chrissy, and began to cry." "'So am I, my darling,' rejoined Uncle Peter, and followed her example. "'So am I,' said I. "'But I don't mean to cry about it.' And then I did. We all had one cup of tea and some bread and butter in silence after this. But when Chrissy had poured out the second cup for Uncle Peter, she began of her own accord to tell us her story. "'It was very foggy when we came out of school that afternoon, as you may remember, dear uncle.' "'Indeed I do,' answered Uncle Peter with a sigh. "'I was coming along the way home with Bessie. "'You know Bessie, Uncle. "'And we stopped to look in at a bookseller's window where the gas was lighted. "'It was full of Christmas things already, "'one of them I thought very pretty, and I was standing staring at it, "'when all at once I saw that a big drabby woman had poked herself in between Bessie and me. "'She was staring in at the window, too. "'She was so nasty that I moved away a little from her.' but I wanted to have one more look at the picture. The woman came close to me. I moved again. Again she pushed up to me. I looked in her face, for I was rather cross by this time. A horrid feeling, I cannot tell you what it was like, came over me as soon as I saw her. 
I know how it was now, but I did not know then why I was frightened. I think she saw I was frightened, for she instantly walked against me and shoved and hustled me round the corner. It was a corner shop, and before I knew I was in another street. It was dark and narrow. Just at the moment a man came from the opposite side and joined the woman, then they caught hold of my hands, and before my fright would let me speak I was deep into the narrow lane, for they ran with me as fast as they could. Then I began to scream, but they said such horrid words that I was forced to hold my tongue, and in a minute more they had me inside a dreadful house, where the plaster was dropping away from the walls, and the skeleton ribs of the house were looking through. I was nearly dead with terror and disgust. I don't think it was a bit less dreadful to me from having dim recollections of having known such places well enough at one time of my life. I think that only made me the more frightened, because so the place seemed to have a claim upon me. What if I ought to be there after all, and these dreadful creatures were my father and mother? I thought they were going to beat me at once, when the woman, whom I suspected to be my aunt, began to take off my frock. I was dreadfully frightened, but I could not cry. However, it was only my clothes that they wanted. But I cannot tell you how frightful it was. They took almost everything I had on, and it was only when I began to scream in despair, "'Sit still, Charlie, it's all over now,' that they stopped with a nod to each other, as much as to say, we can get the rest afterwards. Then they put a filthy frock on me, brought me some dry bread to eat, locked the door, and left me. It was nearly dark now, there was no fire, and all my warm clothes were gone. Do sit still, Charlie. I was dreadfully cold. There was a wretched-looking bed in one corner, but I think I would have died of cold rather than get into it, and the air in the place was frightful. How long I sat there in the dark I don't know. What did you do all the time? said I. There was only one thing to be done, Charlie. I think that is a foolish question to ask. Well, what did you do, Chrissy? Said my prayers, Charlie. And then? Said them again. And nothing else? Yes, I tried to get out of the window, but that was of no use, for I could not open it. And it was one story high at least. And what did you do next? Said over all my hymns. And then? What did you do next? Why do you ask me so many times? Because I want to know. Well, I will tell you. I left my prayers alone, and I began at the beginning, and I told God the whole story as if he had known nothing about it, from the very beginning when Uncle Peter found me on the crossing, down to the minute when I was talking there to him in the dark. Ah, my dear, said my uncle with faltering voice, you felt better after that, I dare say. And here was I in despair about you, and thought he did not care for any of us. I was very naughty indeed. And what next, I said. By and by I heard a noise of quarreling in the street, which came nearer and nearer. The door was burst open by someone falling against it. Blundering steps came up the stairs. The two who had robbed me, evidently tipsy, were trying to unlock the door. At length they succeeded and tumbled into the room. "'Where is the unnatural wretch?' said the woman, who ran away and left her own mother in poverty and sickness. "'Oh, uncle, can it be that she is my mother?' said Chrissy, interrupting herself. "'I don't think she is,' answered Uncle Peter. "'She only wanted to vex you, my lamb. "'But it doesn't matter whether she is or not.' "'Doesn't it, uncle? "'I'm ashamed of her.' "'But you are God's child, and he can't be ashamed of you. "'For he gave you the mother you had, whoever she was, "'and never asked you which you would have. "'So you need not mind. "'We ought always to like best to be just what God has made us.' "'I am sure of that, uncle.' Well, she began groping about to find me, for it was very dark. I sat quite still, except for trembling all over, till I felt her hands on me, when I jumped up and she fell on the floor. She began swearing dreadfully, but did not try to get up. I crept away to another corner. I heard the man snoring and the woman breathing loud. Then I felt my way to the door, but to my horror found the man lying across it on the floor so that I could not open it. Then I believe I cried for the first time. I was nearly frozen to death, and there was all the long night to bear yet. How I got through it I cannot tell. It did go away. Perhaps God destroyed some of it for me. But when the light began to come through the window and show me all the filth of the place, the man and the woman lying on the floor, 
the woman with her head cut and covered with blood, I began to feel that the darkness had been my friend. I felt this yet more when I saw the state of my own dress, which I had forgotten in the dark. I felt as if I had done some shameful thing and wanted to follow the darkness and hide in the skirts of it. It was an old gown of some woolen stuff, but it was impossible to tell what. It was so dirty and worn. I was ashamed that even those drunken creatures should wake and see me in it. But the light would come, and it came and came until at last it waked them up, and the first words were so dreadful. They quarreled and swore at each other and at me until I almost thought there couldn't be a God who would let that go on so and never stop it. But I suppose he wants them to stop, and doesn't care to stop it himself, for he could easily do that, of course, if he liked. "'Just right, my darling,' said Uncle Peter with emotion. Chrissy saw that my uncle was too much excited by her story, although he tried not to show it, and with the wisdom which I have since learned to appreciate, cut it short. They did not treat me cruelly, though the worst was that they gave me next to nothing to eat. Perhaps they wanted to make me thin and wretched-looking, and I believe they succeeded— "'Charlie, you'll turn over the cream if you don't sit still. Three days passed this way. I have thought all over it, and I think they were a little puzzled how to get rid of me. They had no doubt watched me for a long time, and now they had got my clothes, they were afraid. At last one night they took me out. My aunt, if aunt she is, was respectably dressed, that is, comparatively, and the man had a great coat on which covered his dirty clothes.' They helped me into a cart which stood at the door and drove off. I resolved to watch the way we went, but we took so many turnings through narrow streets before we came out in a main road that I soon found it was all one mass of confusion in my head, and it was too dark to read any of the names of the streets, for the man kept as much in the middle of the road as possible. We drove some miles, I should think, before we stopped at the gate of a small house with a big porch which stood alone. My aunt got out and went up to the house and was admitted. After a few minutes she returned, and making me get out, she led me up to the house where an elderly lady stood, holding the door half open. When we reached it, my aunt gave me a sort of shove in, saying to the lady, There she is. Then she said to me, Come now, be a good girl and don't tell lies, and turning hastily ran down the steps and got into the cart at the gate, which drove off at once the way we had come. The lady looked at me from head to foot sternly, but kindly too, I thought, and so glad was I to find myself clear of those dreadful creatures that I burst out crying. She instantly began to read me a lecture on the privilege of being placed with Christian people, who would instruct me how my soul might be saved, and teach me to lead an honest and virtuous life. I tried to say that I had led an honest life, but as often as I opened my mouth to tell anything about myself or my uncle— or indeed to say anything at all, I was stopped by her saying, Now don't tell lies. Whatever you do, don't tell lies. This shut me up quite. I could not speak when I knew she would not believe me. But I did not cry. I only felt my face get very hot, and somehow my backbone grew longer, though I felt my eyes fixed on the ground. But, she went on, you must change your dress. I will show you the way to your room, and you will find a print gown there, which I hope you will keep clean, and above all things, don't tell lies. Here Chrissy burst out laughing, as if it was such fun to be accused of lying. But presently her eyes filled, and she made haste to go on. You may be sure I made haste to put on the nice clean frock, and to my delight found other clean things for me as well. I declare I felt like a princess for a whole day after, notwithstanding the occupation— for I soon found that I had been made over to Mrs. Sprinks as a servant of all work. I think she must have paid these people for the chance of reclaiming one whom they had represented as at least a great liar. Whether my wages were to be paid to them, or even what they were to be, I never heard. I made up my mind at once that the best thing would be to do the work without grumbling, and do it as well as I could, for that would be doing no harm to anyone but the contrary, while it would give me the better chance of making my escape. But though I was determined to get away the first opportunity, and was miserable when I thought how anxious you would all be about me, yet I confess it was such a relief to be clean and in respectable company that I caught myself singing once or twice the very first day. But the old lady soon stopped that. She was about in the kitchen the greater part of the day till almost dinner-time, 
and taught me how to cook and save my soul both at once. Indeed, interrupted Uncle Peter, I have read receipts for the salvation of the soul that sounded very much as if they came out of a cookery book. And the wrinkles of his laugh went up into his nightcap. Neither Chrissy nor I understood this at the time, but I have often thought of it since. Chrissy went on. I had finished washing up my dinner things and sat down for a few minutes, for I was tired. I was staring into the fire and thinking and thinking how I should get away and what I should do when I got out of the house and feeling as if the man and the woman were always prowling about it and watching me through the window, when suddenly I saw a little boy in the corner of the kitchen staring at me with great brown eyes. He was a little boy, perhaps about six years old, with a pale face and very earnest look. I did not speak to him, but waited to see what he would do. A few minutes passed, and I forgot him. But as I was wiping my eyes, which would get wet sometimes, notwithstanding my good fortune, he came up to me, and said in a timid whisper, "'Are you a princess?' "'What makes you think that?' I said. "'You have got such white hands,' he answered. "'No, I am not a princess,' I said. "'Aren't you Cinderella?' "'No, my darling,' I replied, "'but something like her, "'for they have stolen me away from home "'and brought me here. "'I wish I could get away.' "'And here, I confess, "'I burst into a downright fit of crying. "'Don't cry,' said the little fellow, "'stroking my cheek. "'I will let you out sometime. "'Shall you be able to find your way home "'all by yourself?' "'Yes, I think so,' I answered, "'but at the same time I felt very doubtful about it. "'because I always fancied those people watching me. "'But before either of us spoke again, in came Mrs. Sprinks. "'You naughty boy! "'What business have you to make the servant neglect her work?' "'For I was still sitting by the fire, "'and my arm was round the dear little fellow, "'and his head was leaning on my shoulder. "'She's not a servant, Auntie,' cried he indignantly. "'She's a real princess, though of course she won't own to it. "'What?' "'Lies, you have been telling the boy. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself. "'Come along, directly. "'Get the tea at once, Jane.' "'My little friend went with his aunt, "'and I rose and got the tea. "'But I felt much lighter-hearted "'since I had the sympathy of the little boy to comfort me. "'Only I was afraid they would make him hate me. "'But although I saw very little of him the rest of the time, "'I knew they had not succeeded in doing so. "'For as often as he could, "'he would come sliding up to me, saying— "'How do you do, princess?' and then run away, afraid of being seen and scolded. "'I was getting very desperate about making my escape, "'for there was a high wall about the place, and the gate was always locked at night. "'When Christmas Eve came I was nearly crazy with thinking that tomorrow was Uncle's birthday "'and that I should not be with him. "'But that very night after I had gone to my room the door opened, "'and in came little Eddie in his nightgown, his eyes looking very bright and black over it. "'There, princess,' said he, "'there is the key of the gate. Run!' I took him in my arms and kissed him, unable to speak. He struggled to get free and ran to the door. There he turned and said, "'You will come back and see me some day, will you not?' "'That I will,' I answered. "'That you shall,' said Uncle Peter. I hid the key and went to bed where I lay trembling. As soon as I was sure they must be asleep, I rose and dressed.' I had no bonnet or shawl but those I had come in, and though they disgusted me I thought it better to put them on, but I dared not unlock the street door for fear of making a noise. So I crept out of the kitchen window, and then I got out of the gate all right. No one was in sight, so I locked it again and threw the key over. But what a time of fear and wandering about I had in the darkness before I dared to ask anyone the way. It was a bright, clear night, and I walked very quietly till I came upon a great wide common. The sky and the stars and the wideness brightened me, and made me gasp at first. I felt as if I should fall away from everything into nothing, and it was so lonely. But then I thought of God, and in a moment I knew that what I had thought loneliness was really the presence of God. And then I grew brave again and walked on. When the morning dawned, I met a bricklayer going to his work, and found that I had been wandering away from London all the time. But I did not mind that. Now I turned my face towards it, though not the way I had come. But I soon got dreadfully tired and faint, and once I think I fainted quite. I went up to a house and asked for a piece of bread, and they gave it to me, 
and I felt much better after eating it. But I had to rest so often and got so tired and my feet got so sore that... You know how late it was before I got home to my darling uncle. And me too, I expostulated. And you too, Charlie, she answered, and we all cried over again. This shan't happen any more, said my uncle. After tea was over, he asked for writing things and wrote a note, which he sent off. The next morning, about eleven, as I was looking out of the window, I saw a carriage drive up and stop at our door. What a pretty little brougham, I cried, and such a jolly horse. Look here, Chrissy. Presently, Uncle Peter's bell rang, and Miss Chrissy was sent for. She came down again, radiant with pleasure. What do you think, Charlie? That carriage is mine, all my own, and I am to go to school in it always. Do come and have a ride in it. You may be sure I was delighted to do so. Where shall we go, I said. Let us ask Uncle if we may go and see the little darling who set me free. His consent was soon obtained, and away we went. It was a long drive, but we enjoyed it beyond everything. When we reached the house, we were shown into the drawing room. There was Mrs. Sprinks and little Eddie. The lady stared, but the child knew Cinderella at once and flew into her arms. "'I knew you were a princess,' he cried. "'There, Auntie!' But Mrs. Sprinks had put on an injured look, and her hands shook very much. "'Really, Miss Belper, if that is your name, you have behaved in a most unaccountable way. Why did you not tell me instead of stealing the key of the gate and breaking the kitchen window? A most improper way for a young lady to behave— "'to run out of the house at midnight.' "'You forget, madam,' replied Chrissy, "'with more dignity than I had ever seen her assume, "'that as soon as ever I attempted to open my mouth, "'you told me not to tell lies. "'You believed the wicked people who brought me here "'rather than myself. "'However, as you will not be friendly, "'I think we had better go. "'Come, Charlie?' "'Don't go, princess,' pleaded little Eddie. "'But I must, for your auntie does not like me,' said Chrissy. I am sure I always meant to do my duty by you, and I will do so still. Beware, my dear young woman, of the deceitfulness of riches. Your carriage won't save your soul. Chrissy was on the point of saying something rude, as she confessed when we got out, but she did not. She made her bow, turned, and walked away. I followed, and poor Eddie would have done so too, but was laid hold of by his aunt. I confess this was not quite proper behavior on Chrissy's part, but I never discovered that till she made me see it. She was very sorry afterwards, and my uncle feared the brougham had begun to hurt her already, as she told me, for she had narrated the whole story to him, and his look first let her see that she had been wrong. My uncle went with her afterwards to see Mrs. Sprinks, and thank her for having done her best, and to take Eddie such presents as my uncle only knew how to buy for children. When he went to school I know he sent him a gold watch— from that time till now that she is my wife, Chrissy has had no more such adventures. And if Uncle Peter did not die on Christmas Day, it did not matter much, for Christmas Day makes all the days of the year as sacred as itself. End of My Uncle Peter by George MacDonald La neige à travers la brume de Paul Verlaine Ceci est un enregistrement LibriVox. Tous nos enregistrements font partie du domaine public. Pour vous informer ou pour participer, rendez-vous sur LibriVox.org. La neige, à travers la brume, tombe et tapisse sans bruit le chemin creux qui conduit à l'église où l'on allume pour la messe de minuit. Londres sombre, flambe et fume, ô oh, la chair qui s'y cuit et la boisson qui s'ensuit, c'est Christmas et sa coutume de minuit jusqu'à minuit. Sur la plume et le bitume, Paris bruit et jouit, ripaille et plaisant déduit, sur le bitume et la plume, s'exaspère dès minuit. Le malade en l'amertume, de l'hospice où le poursuit, un espoir toujours détruit, s'épouvante et se consume dans le noir d'un long minuit. La cloche, au son clair d'enclume, dans la cour fine qui lui, loin du péché qui nous nuit, nous appelle en grand costume à la messe de minuit. 
Fin de La neige à travers la brume de Paul Verlaine, lu par Sonia. No Gifts, a Christmas story by J. W. Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The button on the arm of Haldane's coat skillfully avoided numerous ensnaring rips in the sleeve lining as he slipped into his ulster. Also, the garment was a bit faded. His cap still retained the soft texture and cozy warmth of its first season. Hal's finely chiseled features would look well beneath any headgear. He was the sort of man who wore his clothes well, any kind of clothes. Time and mutilation are powerless with some men. As he mingled with the throng of Christmas shoppers crowding the streets and well-lighted stores near the day's end, he might have well been anyone from a luxurious clubman to a member of the peerage. He looked the part, any part you might assign to him. Sleeve linings are not visible from the outside, and garment colors look much alike by lamplight, with the great wet snowflakes veiling history. Ragged derelicts touched their caps to him and begged a meal. Cabbies importuned him from the curb. Men and women alighting from limousines looked twice at him, uncertain in the waning light whether they had overlooked recognition of one of last night's dinner guests. Contrary to his custom of other years, Haldane had deferred his Christmas shopping until the last minute. His reasons were ample, his means were not. He found it difficult to accustom himself to the fact that his original long list had been grudgingly but necessarily cut down. First, when he learned that his kid sister, working her way through school by doing certain domestic service out of hours, had decided she couldn't afford to go back to the old home for the holidays. He knew that meant disappointment to the family, and at Christmas, too. Again, when old Cooper, the ancient paper seller whom he had patronized for years, gave out completely and had to be cared for by someone. And finally last week, when a letter from his mother disclosed a supposedly well-concealed need. Even after three rather drastic cuts, his list seemed hopelessly large beside his pitifully dwindled Christmas savings. Fortunately, the family box was on its way. Scant, he thought, when he packed it, but a box nevertheless and he knew his rollicking Christmas letter, all pasted over with gay stickers, would be read and re-read and laughed over before the fire. Haldane entered several stores and priced certain articles, but doubtless he would find something just as suitable and a trifle less expensive. He was not getting on very well. He had checked off no names on his list. That cigarette case for Arthur Norwood seemed reasonable enough for such a friend, and he turned back for it. A shivering newsboy gazing into a bake shop window queered that deal. The kid was ragged, and it was Christmas Eve, and doughnuts and raisin bread and a pie are absolutely necessary on Christmas Eve. He simply must send something to Mrs. Marshall and the children. They had been mighty kind to him through it all, and never wavered in their friendship. But whatever possessed that hatless woman with the worn-out shawl and three softly crying youngsters to stop right in front of the window of the store he was headed for. To be sure, she was warmer when she came out of the place, and the kids were gurgling with glee and gumdrops. But what would the marshals think of him when they found he had forgotten them? Haldane made several other valiant but futile attempts to get into the game. An absolutely clear path of well-fed, fully clothed, and smiling happy citizens was suddenly crowded with whimpering waifs and miserable derelicts the moment he started into a store. They seemed to rise up out of the ground under his very feet. The stores were closing. One by one their lights went out. A flower shop was still open. There were some wonderful violets in the window, and he had looked forward to sending her violets. Only one little bunch, to be sure, but violets. Hal stopped under a street lamp and consulted his list. Not a single name had been checked off. He also put his hand in his pocket. He looked back at the violets in the window. Then he went home, that is to say he returned to his room. Haldane shook the snow from his cap and ulster, and mounted the creaky stairs. He turned on the table light, 
and sat down without removing his ulster. The room was a bit chilly. Another Christmas, and he had sent no gifts. His thoughts went racing backwards, and he could not comprehend it. No gifts from him of all men at Christmas. It dazed him, and the vision of other years of other Christmases danced before him like the bewildering tumblings of the discs in the toy kaleidoscope he remembered as a boy. Oh, well, he'd give his friends a ring on the phone Christmas morning, and next year he'd try to send a few gifts somehow. His hand reached into his pocket and tossed his list on the table. The crumbled paper almost seemed to exude the fragrance of violets. Haldane undressed, turned out the light, and crawled into bed. He was very tired, and he'd been thinking rather more than was good for him. The abandoned list seemed to lift itself from the table and float to his bedside and shine accusingly through the darkness. He huddled wearily between the cold sheets, lying very quietly save for an occasional shiver, till the warmth of his body brought some measure of comfort. God bless us, every one, he was murmuring drowsily to one of the lumps in his pillow. His voice trailed away to a whisper. Then the whisper ceased. Only his quiet breathing disturbed the silence of the little room. The snow had stopped falling, and the clouds were breaking. Intermittently, through their rifts, the full moon threw its soft radiance across the bed. Presently the door opened without the slightest sound, and a stalwart young man slipped into the room. It was Jimmy Talbot, ninety-two, right end on the old varsity eleven. He stood a moment, smiling down upon Haldane. "'Sleep on, dear old fellow,' you whispered lovingly. There's one chap who's not forgetting how you found him down and out, thanks to booze and baccarat. Walk in the streets, hunting a job, and persuaded Norwood to give him a trial until he finally made good and was on his feet again. Night ho, laddie. He turned to go and found another figure beside him. It was Judge Woodruff. The door was open, so he came in. I heard what you said. You felt his kindly touch, as I have. I'm not the man I was when Hal's unexpected friendship came to one who had been great in his time, but who had lost his grip. Night after night he sat with me in my study, patiently restoring my hope and courage, untangling my badly involved business matters, and gradually leading me back to a place in the world. Those nights sapped his strength almost to depletion. I knew it, but I let him go on, for it was my last chance. Bodies are easily healed. But the saving of a soul is done only by potions brought from the very depths of one's own. You see me now erect, active, thinking right and carrying on, and I know he thinks it's worth all he sacrificed to bring it about. A woman's touch on his arm stopped him. My girl Sadie's, their stenographer at the office, was in July. Surely you'll remember the terrible heat of it, when she wilted like a flower and dragged her poor body through the long days with no one noticing till he made her confess that at night she cooked the dinner for me, who was doing laundry work all day, and the two children, and helped with the dishes and putting the young ones to bed, and fixing them up for school in the morning. It was him asked the boss to give Sadie four weeks vacation instead of two, and the extra check besides, and him paying it. He being that fit, he says, he didn't need a vacation or the trifle of money he'd save for it. That's how me and Sadie and the children went to the lake. A fourth figure had joined the little group in the moonlight beside the bed. It was Foster, second tenor in the glee club in the twenty years ago days when Hal was one of the club's soloists. Yes, he laughed softly. That's his way. Always was his way. He gets a lot out of Christmas, has it all the time, sort of stretches it along, to make it go round, he says. Once heard him tell a little boy that snowstorms and sleigh bells don't make Christmas. It goes all over the world, in the cold places and hot places and everywhere in between. It goes on all the time, summer and winter, if you just get the spirit of it. Says that's what Christmas means, the way he lived it when he was here. Never will forget the boost Hal once gave me. After college, I went into the ministry, was fathering a small flock this year, mostly factory hands and other breadwinners, in a struggling church on the outskirts of town. Bumped into Hal on the street one day and begged him to come out to the church and sing some of the old song at an entertainment I was putting on to cheer up my flock and hold it together. Didn't think he'd do it. 
Hal never was keen on going to church. But he came and sang for a straight hour all the funny songs that used to bring down the house on the glee club tours, sang and twined the guitar and thumped the piano to the uproarious delight of the children from eight to eighty, who filled my little mission that night. Biggest boost I ever had put new spirit into my flock, started em singing among themselves whenever we met. You can always hold folks if you get em singing together. A cloud drifted slowly across the face of the moon. The white light flooding the bed disappeared through the frosted window panes and out into the night, leaving the little room in darkness. The sleeping figure moved restlessly for a moment. Then it grew still again. Only its quiet breathing disturbed the deep silence. The clock struck midnight. It was Christmas Day. Chimes floated softly through the cold air. And somewhere, far away among the city's streets, voices were singing. For Christ is born of Mary, and gathered all above, while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. End of No Gifts by J. W. Wright How Christmas Came to Pebbly Creek From McCall's Magazine, December 1916 by Edith Stowe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is the true story of how the clean, generous spirit of Christmas worked its magic in an isolated settlement of southern mountaineers. Pebbly Creek is a line of little log houses straggling down a narrow valley between two steep mountain walls. Only a few years ago, the entire little community was following a wild career of moonshining. In those days, every stranger was suspected, and even at noonday, if he were wise, he chose a road that would lead him around Pebbly Creek rather than ride down this particular valley. When revenue officers were ordered in here on duty, they came in a compact company of six or eight, and, if possible, captured a pebbly creaker and carried him along with them as a protection against chance bullets fired from ambush. A desperate raid, held 15 years ago, demolished the last still and reduced the settlement to submission. Then the people turned to clearing out their timberland and raising tiny crops. But life in those remote regions is so simple and unluxurious a thing that three months' work in the fields supports a family for an entire year. During the remaining nine months, Satan, that convivial soul, undertakes to furnish an outlet for unspent natures. Into this isolated settlement, the chances of business sent us for a seven-month stay. It was an opportunity for which we became grateful, for it cleared life of many of its wearying trifles. But as Yuletide drew near, we thought back upon the swell of Christmas feeling that was rising like a tide over the world outside filling it with fresh, clean joys and generous impulses. Here in Pebbly Creek would be rows of men sitting on the rail fences and shooting all together into the air for excitement. Half gallons of old corn would be the only gifts brought into the houses. And such Halloween-like jokes as stealing a neighbor and leaving him tied out all night to a tree on a windy mountaintop, the only form of entertainment. Already, from the settlement perched in the mountain gap above us, came down the sounds of shouting and shooting which evinced that its holiday old corn had arrived and the pranking begun. Rumor brought us news of similar revelry along the distant creeks and valleys. Surrounded by all this, we wondered if it would be possible to make our Christmas festival of the Christ child appeal to the people of our settlement. That was two years ago. But the first wonder has never since faded from the memory of that Christmas week. Life sends us what we really need. That is a truth to hold to. In a bundle of anti-Christmas mail was a magazine article describing how a New England town of stately homes and set conventions hung its screens on the outside, instead of the inside, of its dwellings, in order to radiate through its streets a spirit of Christmas cheer. It was a far cry from this cultured town to our raw mountain settlement, but the suggestion took hold upon us. Somewhat casually and very cautiously, we spread before the people our scheme, with a strategic appeal to civic pride. 
Pebbly Creek was to be a radiating center of Christmas cheer, a luminous spot that was to show the county how to take Christmas. There were to be three prizes, 50, 40, and 30 cents, for the houses within a five-mile limit whose exteriors were most attractively trimmed. The little meeting house, so the plan went, was to be kept open and warm as a kind of clubhouse for the young blood of the settlement, who were to take charge of wreathing it, securing and mounting its Christmas tree, and choosing from their number a Santa Claus. With the quick, wholehearted enthusiasm of children, Pebbly Creek elected to set the county an example in Christmas keeping. The only point over which they were dubious was the advisability of holding the Christmas bush in the evening. There had been one or two Christmas trees in the county before, but these had been in the daytime, to avoid any possible disturbance that might arise from men riding abroad on Christmas night. Remembering the festive evening glitter of the Christmas trees that we had known, with the confidence of ignorance we insisted upon an evening tree, thus forcing the settlement to face a grave danger. But responsibility is tonic. Pebbly Creek had set itself the task of radiating clean Christmas cheer. Not one man among them sent away for his usual old corn, for fear that, in its proximity, he might be overtempted. Not one Christmas gun was laid to shoulder, for the Pebbly Creekers had forbidden themselves any unnecessary shooting. Upon this unprecedented condition, the Christmas sun rose from behind the mountain and looked down out of a clear, tranquil sky. The decorations upon the log houses, crude as they looked to us, were the product of much toil and anxious thought. We ain't never done nary such thing, but I reckon we can try, the people had said, and set themselves wholeheartedly to the task. Their basic idea, worked out by clumsy hands, was a bank of greens fastened against the outside of the houses, upon which were hung strips of newspaper, colored rags, even the surplus family clothing, and dead rabbits. In each dooryard stood a Christmas bush. It might be a growing tree pressed into service or one place for the occasion, but it flaunted the same pathetic array of festoonings. The art child of one outreaching brain was a newspaper rose. Three paper circles of decreasing sizes, notched at the edge, were fastened flat, one upon another. These journalistic flowers inspired such enthusiasm that the entire family of their originator worked throughout a night, snipping them by the light of the fire upon the hearth. Like a spreading contagion, Christmas roses soon blossomed on all the houses in the valley. But the crowning device of this creation was a cross of ferns and newspaper roses, a thing so beautiful in the eyes of the makers that, in order to preserve it from the ravages of early morning mists, it was carried in each night and fastened, for lack of other space, upright to the foot of a bed in the little crowded house. It is true that they were setting the entire county an example, for quick rumor carried the news thither and yon across the mountains. With rustic humor, one man who rode through the valley described it to the people of his own settlement. Everything in Pebbly Creek is trimmed up. Why, I even met an old hog running along the road with a twig sticking out of each ear. One old woman from a distant cove came in afoot to take Christmas with her kinfolk. What has took Pebbly Creek? I never saw it look this way afore. The reply was given in lofty unconcern. Oh, we've just fixed up a bit for Christmas. None but a mountain mind could place a relative value on the decorations, so three patriarchs of the valley were selected to act as judges. Not only the good cheer of the radiant morning, but also a pleasant, self-conscious touch of pride showed in their sinewy backs as they started out on muleback for their round of inspection. A stimulating, not altogether unpleasant, sense of danger ran through the day. The three young fellows who might have been possible ringleaders in making trouble were invited to take dinner with us. That subsidence in the jovialty of the Christmas meal that follows the appearance of the plum pudding had fallen upon the table, when suddenly, outside, arose much din and clamor. Could it be possible, we asked ourselves, that owing to those empty, unsatisfying hours of early afternoon, 
Pebbly Creek had fallen from its high purpose? We rushed to the door with apprehension chilling our blood. Without adieus, our three guests broke past us for the road. There before our house trooped a loose procession, shouting and chattering like a flock of happy children, and before it was borne the stars and stripes tied to a hickory pole. It was Pebbly Creek marching in a body down the road to meet the judges. Such a democratic throng it was, some afoot, some on muleback, men, women, and children, hunting dogs flanking the march with joyful yelps of excitement, a cow that had gotten caught in the march and was herded on in the mass, even a couple of nervous, excited hens. It was three quarters of an hour before the sound of their returning broke the stillness. Then came a shout of triumph, the ringing of dinner bells, the shrieking lilt of a falsetto mountaineer song, with the punctuating blare of a tin horn. One woman, the originator of the paper roses, was prevented by a sick child from joining the procession, but with her flock of children gathered about her, she watched the march from her doorstep. She said later, I was that happy, I laughed and I cried. The children might have thought I was crying for sorrow, but it was just the joy in my heart. And when I heard the bells ringing, the Lord just put in my heart an old song my pap used to sing, The Heaven Bells is Ringing. I said to the children, we ain't got no bell to ring, but let's sing her. So we sang her, Oh, the Heaven Bells is Ringing. It just fitted the occasion, and before I knew it, I was flapping my arms and shouting. I said, what if anybody hears me singing and that baby lying sick? So I choked and smothered the song back down, but I couldn't stop it from coming out. When Uncle Brodson was riding along carrying that flag, his face just shone as he never will face it to the world again. Children, I said, just look at Uncle Brodson's face. When I heard that horn a-blowing, I said, that's Gabriel blowing his trumpet. Seems like Pebbly Creek is just heaven and he's a-blowing his horn. Sure the Lord was in Pebbly Creek that day. He was right here walking up and down the road. But, I said, children, why shouldn't he be here as well as anywhere else? Our Christmas bush that night was a whole holly tree, the lighted candles glittering on the red berries and on the gifts. From the hilltops and the valleys miles and miles around, visitors rode in to see it. Perhaps, wiser than we, they suspected that there were revolvers hidden in the hip pockets of pebbly creakers. But I like to believe that they, too, caught the clean joy of our day. However it may have come about, from their first arrival in our settlement to the last sound of a departing hoofbeat on the trails, there was never a more orderly gathering than that which crowded the little meeting house. Santa Claus was there in all the friendly jovialty of red suit and white beard on his first visit to these ranges. The clumsy antics of the valley wit, performing a part he had never witnessed, met with uproarious enthusiasm. He held absolute sway over the people and beamed on the little children as they recited their inevitable night before Christmas and hang up the baby's stocking. To be sure, each person in the place had heard these recitations innumerable times during the days of preparation. For a week past, the settlement had been rehearsing its program in public, but that diminished no whit their pleasure in the ultimate performance. The novelty which we require is a product of over-civilization. Santa Claus held reign over the gathering until it came time to close with our Christmas carols, the first carols that these people had ever sung with joy upon a frosty Christmas night. Best of all the carols, they loved Royal David City with its cattle shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for its bed. To them, this was no empty symbol dulled by repetition. It was fact. They knew, of themselves, the pang and joy of motherhood. They knew the pinch of want at such times. They knew the chilly drafts of their own stables. While they sang, and his shelter was a stable and his cradle was a stall, slow tears rolled down their cheeks. Like the shepherds of old, Pebbly Creek, that night, 
was laying its best at the feet of the Christ child. End of How Christmas Came to Pebbly Creek by Edith Stowe Read by Andrea Kotzer The Carol of the Poor Children by Richard Middleton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sonia The Carol of the Poor Children we are the poor children. Come out to see the sights. On this day of all days, on this night of nights, the stars in merry parties are dancing in the sky. A fine star, a new star, is shining on high. We are the poor children. Our lips are frosty blue. We cannot sing our carol as well as rich folk do. Our bellies are so empty. We have no singing voice. But this night of all nights, good children must rejoice. We do rejoice. We do rejoice as hard as we can try. A fine star, a new star is shining in the sky. And while we sing our carol, we think of the delight the happy kings and shepherds make in Bethlehem tonight. Are we naked, mother? And are we starving poor? Oh, see what gifts the kings have brought outside the stable door. Are we cold, mother? The ass will give his hay to make the manger warm and keep the cruel winds away. We are the poor children, but not so poor who sing our carol with our voiceless hearts to greet the newborn king. On this night of all nights, when in the frosty sky a new star, a kind star, is shining on high. End of the Carol of the Poor Children by Richard Middleton The Reminder by Thomas Hardy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Reminder While I watch the Christmas blaze, Paint the room with ruddy rays. Something makes my vision glide to the frosty scene outside. There to reach a rotting berry, toils a thrush, constrained to vary dregs of food by sharp distress, taking such with thankfulness. Why, O oh starving bird, when I, one day's joy would justify and put misery out of you, do you make me notice you? End of the Reminder by Thomas Hardy Ring Out Wild Bells by Alfred Lord Tennyson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ring out, wild bells, to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light. The year is dying in the night. Ring out, wild bells, and let him die. Ring out the old, ring in the new, ring happy bells across the snow. The year is going, let him go. Ring out the false, ring in the true. Ring out the grief that saps the mind for those that here we see no more. Ring out the feud of rich and poor, ring in redress to all mankind. Ring out a slowly dying cause and ancient forms of party strife. Ring in the nobler modes of life with sweeter manners, purer laws. Ring out the want, the care, the sin, the faithless coldness of the times. Ring out, ring out my mournful rhymes, but ring the fuller minstrel in. Ring out false pride in place and blood, the civic slander and the spite. Ring in the love of truth and right, ring in the common love of good. Ring out old shapes of foul disease, ring out the narrowing lust of gold, ring out the thousand wars of old, ring in the thousand years of peace. Ring in the valiant man and free, the larger heart, the kindlier hand, ring out the darkness of the land, ring in the Christ that is to be. End of Ring Out Wild Bells 
by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Weihnacht von Jakob Julius David. Dies ist eine LibriVox-Aufnahme. Alle LibriVox-Aufnahmen sind lizenzfrei und in öffentlichem Besitz. Weitere Informationen und Hinweise zur Beteiligung an diesem Projekt gibt es bei LibriVox.org. Weihnacht von Jakob Julius David Das Christkind klopft leisen Fingers an, von Herzen an Herz, ihm wird aufgetan. Und aus den offenen Herzen fällt ein Strahl des Lichts in die finstere Welt. Paläste füllt er mit hellem Schein, er leuchtet fröhlich durchs Kämmerlein, die sonst das strenge Leben geschieden, eint heut ein heiliger Gottesfrieden, ein Wunder, nie mocht ein größeres sein. Und deckte der Schnee die Blüten auch zu, in deiner Seele die Blüten heg du, und schlittet der klingende Frost durch das Land. Halt offen die Brust und tu auf deine Hand, und also werde jedem sein Teil von Weihnachtslust und der Christzeit heil. Wenn Sorgen den Glanz der Augen dir scheuchten, erbau dich an fremder Augen leuchten, dass sich der Frieden auf Erden verweil. Und liegt in endloser Ferne gleich, das heiß erflehte, das künftige Reich, und herrscht auf Erden noch stets das Gebot, der nagenden Sorg und der bitteren Not, regieren diese verstörte Zeit, noch immer da Hass und immer da Streit, für kurze Weil bringt die Argen zu schweigen. Es ruft das Christkind, auf denn zum Reigen, der aller Sorgen überschreit. Ende von Weihnacht von Jakob Julius David Little Wolf's Wooden Shoes A Christmas Story by Francois Coppe Adapted and translated by Alma J. Foster From the Children's Book of Christmas Stories Edited by Aza Don Dickinson and Ada M. Skinner This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. This reading is by Carrie Gorman, Little Wolf's Wooden Shoes, by Francois Coppe. Once upon a time, so long ago that everybody had forgotten the date, in a city in the north of Europe, with such a hard name that nobody can ever remember it, there was a little seven-year-old boy named Wolf, whose parents were dead, who lived with a cross and stingy old aunt, who never thought of kissing him more than once a year, and who sighed deeply whenever she gave him a bowl full of soup. But the poor little fellow had such a sweet nature that in spite of everything he loved the old woman, although he was terribly afraid of her and could never look at her ugly old face without shivering. As this aunt of Little Wolf was known to have a house of her own and an old woolen stocking full of gold, she had not dared to send the boy to a charity school, but, in order to get a reduction in the price, she had so wrangled with the master of the school, to which Little Wolf finally went, that this bad man, vexed at having a pupil so poorly dressed and paying so little, often punished him unjustly, and even prejudiced his companions against him, so that the three boys, all sons of rich parents, made a drudge and laughing stock of the little fellow. The poor little one was thus as wretched as a child could be, and used to hide himself in corners to weep whenever Christmas time came. It was the schoolmaster's custom to take all his pupils to the midnight mass on Christmas Eve, and to bring them home again afterward. Now, as the winter this year was very bitter, and as heavy snow had been falling for several days, all the boys came well 
bundled up in warm clothes, with fur caps pulled over their ears, padded jackets, gloves, and knitted mittens, and strong, thick-soled boots. Only little Wolf presented himself shivering in the poor clothes he used to wear both weekdays and Sundays, and having on his feet only thin socks and heavy wooden shoes. His naughty companions, noticing his sad face and awkward appearance, made many jokes at his expense. But the little fellow was so busy blowing on his fingers and was suffering so much with chilblains that he took no notice of them. So the band of youngsters, walking two and two behind the master, started for the church. It was pleasant in the church, which was brilliant with lighted candles, and the boys, excited by the warmth, took advantage of the music of the choir and the organ to chatter amongst themselves in low tones. They bragged about the fun that was awaiting them at home. The mayor's son had seen, just before starting off, an immense goose ready stuffed and dressed for cooking. At the alderman's home, there was a little pine tree with branches laden down with oranges, sweets, and toys, and the lawyer's cook had put on her cap with such care as she never thought of taking unless she was expecting something very good. Then they talked, too, of all that the Christ child was going to bring them, of all he was going to put in their shoes, which you might be sure they would take good care to leave in the chimney place before going to bed. And the eyes of these little urchins, as lively as a cage of mice, were sparkling in advance over the joy they would have when they awoke in the morning and saw the pink bag full of sugar plums, the little lead soldiers ranged in companies in their boxes, the menageries smelling of varnished wood, and the magnificent jumping jacks in purple and tinsel. Alas, little Wolf knew by experience that his old miser of an aunt would send him to bed supperless, but, with childlike faith and certain of having been all the year as good and industrious as possible, he hoped that the Christ child would not forget him. So he too planned to place his wooden shoes in good time in the fireplace. Midnight mass over, the worshippers departed, eager for their fun and the band of pupils, always walking two and two and following the teacher, left the church. Now in the porch and seated on a stone bench set in a niche of a painted arch, a child was sleeping, a child in a white woolen garment, but with his little feet bare in spite of the cold. He was not a beggar, for his garment was white and new, and near him on the floor was a bundle of carpenter's tools. In the clear light of the stars his face with its closed eyes, shone with an expression of divine sweetness, and his long, curling, blond locks seemed to form a halo about his brow. But his little child's feet, made blue by the cold of this bitter December night, were pitiful to see. The boys so well clothed for the winter weather passed by quite indifferently to the unknown child. Several of them, sons of the notables of the town, however, cast on the vagabond looks in which could be read all the scorn of the rich for the poor, of the well-fed for the hungry. But little Wolf, coming last out of the church, stopped, deeply touched, before the beautiful sleeping child. Oh dear, said the little fellow to himself, this is frightful. This poor little one has no shoes and stockings in this bad weather, and what is still worse, he has not even a wooden shoe to leave near him to-night while he sleeps into which the little Christ child can put something good to soothe his misery. And carried away by his loving heart, Wolf drew the wooden shoe from his right foot, laid it down before the sleeping child, and as best he could, sometimes hopping, sometimes limping with his sock wet by the snow, he went home to his aunt. "'Look at the good-for-nothing!' cried the old woman, full of wrath at the sight of the shoeless boy. "'What have you done with your shoe, you little villain?' Little Wolf did not know how to lie, so, although trembling with terror when he saw the rage of the old shrew, he tried to relate his adventure. But the miserly old creature only burst into a frightful fit of laughter. Aha! So my young gentleman strips himself for the beggars. Aha! My young gentleman breaks his pair of shoes for a barefoot. Here is something new, forsooth. Very well, since it is this way, I shall put the only shoe that is left into the 
chimney place, and I'll answer for it that the Christ child will put in something tonight to beat you with in the morning, and you will have only a crust of bread and water tomorrow, and we shall see if the next time you will be giving your shoes to the first vagabond that happens along. And the wicked woman, having boxed the ears of the poor little fellow, made him climb up into the loft where he had his wretched cubbyhole. Desolate, the child went to bed in the dark and soon fell asleep, but his pillow was wet with tears. But behold, the next morning when the old woman, awakened early by the cold, went downstairs, oh, wonder of wonders, she saw the big chimney filled with shining toys, bags of magnificent bonbons, and riches of every sort, and standing out in front of all this treasure was the right wooden shoe which the boy had given to the little b vagabond, yes, and beside it the one which he had placed in the chimney to hold the bunch of switches. As little Wolf, attracted by the cries of his aunt, stood in an ecstasy of childish delight before the splendid Christmas gifts, shouts of laughter were heard outside. The woman and child ran out to see what all this meant, and behold, all the gossips of the town were standing around the public fountain. What could have happened? Oh, a most ridiculous and extraordinary thing! The children of the richest men in the town, whom their parents had planned to surprise with the most beautiful presents, had found only switches in their shoes. Then the old woman and the child, thinking of all the riches in their chimney, were filled with fear. But suddenly they saw the priest appear, his countenance full of astonishment. Just above the bench, placed near the door of the church, in the very spot where, the night before, a child in a white garment and with bare feet, in spite of the cold, had rested his lovely head, the priest had found a circlet of gold embedded in the old stones. Then they all crossed themselves devoutly, perceiving that this beautiful sleeping child with the carpenter's tools had been Jesus of Nazareth himself, who had come back for one hour, just as he had been when he used to work in the home of his parents, and reverently they bowed before this miracle which the good God had done to reward the faith and the love of a little child. End of Little Wolf's Wooden Shoes Recording by Carrie Gorman Ideas for Decorating the Home at Christmas by Nancy D. Dunley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. As Christmas comes but once a year, how jolly it is to decorate the home with pretty yuletide effects. The fragrance of pine greenery seems half of the holiday air. But lacking greenery, the Christmas spirit of good cheer can also be symbolized with other decorations. If greenery can be procured, it is charming, woven in the banisters of the stairway and looped across the edge of the mantle. Mistletoe is usually fastened over a doorway or in the light fixtures. But holly and pine cones are very pretty decorations there, too, especially if they are tied in place with a generous bow of red ribbon. Greenery is attractive draped over picture frames and mirrors, and of course made into wreaths. Besides hanging wreaths in windows, it is becoming more and more the custom to hang one upon the front door. A very pretty wreath for the front door is simply made of evergreen, tied at the top with a bow of red satin ribbon about one and a half inches wide. All wreaths need a good foundation so they will hang well and not lose shape. A small barrel hoop of either wood or wire makes a splendid foundation, but withs braided together can be used successfully. Good stiff wire, too, can be fastened with the ends overlapping and then wound or tied with greenery. Fine wire or strong natural colored twine or green string is least conspicuous for fastening the greenery on the foundation securely. Almost any greenery will have a Christmas effect if combined with red or silver. English or California holly, live oak foliage, asparagus plumosus, ground pine or small branches from evergreen, hemlock, arbor vitae, and even pine trees can be used for Christmas decorations. To imitate holly, cranberries can be strung into little bunches 
and fastened here and there among greenery toothpicks too are an aid when using cranberries for decoration red sealing wax can be used to coat beads wax modeling clay or wads of paper and then fastened holly-like into wreaths fine wire should be caught into the sealing wax while it is hot so it can be used as a stem even cherries from an old straw hat are surprisingly pretty when fastened without their leaves into winter greenery if greenery is to be draped against walls it shows up nicely pinned to red paper the silver touch can be given christmas decorations in several ways tinsel is effective wound into wreaths and through ropes of greenery a bow of silver ribbon is also attractive tied on wreaths silver paint gives a jack frost touch to pine cones which may be just splashed or painted all over tinsel looped from the chandelier down to the corners of the dining table or to each place is suitable for dining room decorations red paper helps out greatly if greenery is scarce red tissue paper bells come in many sizes and can be hung in many places over doorways under chandeliers on the chimney piece as well as the christmas tree red bells lend a festive air small bells are often attached to the crossbar of windows where they look attractive from the street in one home a group of three windows had bells tied to the ring of the window shades and then the three shades were adjusted so that the bells hung like a flight of steps bells can also be pinned to curtains and portieres all flower pots have a more holiday effect if covered with red green or holly pattern paper stiff red paper can be used to cut out birds natural size these can then be strung on fine wire or thread from the chandeliers to the four corners of the room they also make a pretty border around the room pins can be used to attach them to the wall some paste a flock of red birds to the window pane itself to make a pretty red rope use either crepe tissue or stiff paper and cut strips as long as possible that measure one inch wide take two strips and fold into a jacob's ladder fastening the end securely with paste the jacob's ladder makes a graceful rope to loop as a border from the ceiling over the fireplace in the stair banisters on a tablecloth or the christmas tree end of ideas for decorating the home at christmas by nancy d dunley seasonable and tested recipes by janet m hill and mary d chambers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by betty b in all recipes where flour is used unless otherwise stated the flour is measured after sifting once where flour is measured by cups the cup is filled with a spoon and a level cupful is meant a tablespoon or a teaspoonful of any designated material is a level spoonful in flour mixtures where yeast is called for use bread flour in all other flour mixtures use cake or pastry flour lobster and veal soup for this soup there is needed one quart of veal stock made so strong that it jellies add to this a pint of water in which one half a cup each of chopped celery grated carrots and seeded raisins have simmered for half an hour or longer this is best if cooked in a double boiler for two hours or in the fireless cooker overnight strain before adding to the stock put through the food chopper the meat of one smoked herring add to the stock and seasoned water and put all on to cook in the soup kettle when boiling add the meat of one rather small lobster cut in small chunks add salt and pepper to taste and serve in marmites with a garnish of leaves of cress there should be eight servings oysters in crusts prepare a dozen of the long crusty rolls by cutting each with a sharp knife so as to divide into two parts an upper and a lower pull out the soft pith from the rolls until only a crusty shell is left fill the bottom shells with the following into a porcelain saucepan put four tablespoonfuls of butter a little salt and pepper and paprika and when the butter is hot add four dozen medium-sized oysters and toss over the fire until the gills separate and crinkle 
lift out the oysters and place flour in each of the lower shelves add to the liquid in the saucepan enough milk or water to make one cup and one half thicken with two tablespoonfuls of flour and stir until it boils then pour two tablespoonfuls over each crust of oysters put on the upper crusts which should have been thickly brushed with melted butter and placed all in a hot oven for a moment until the crusts are heated through horseradish and apple sauce with cream make a smooth sauce of six green apples simmered in as little water as possible and seasoned with one half a teaspoonful of white pepper add when cooked one half a cup of grated horseradish and one half a cup or more of sugar let cool and when ready to serve beat in one cup of heavy cream whipped to a stiff froth serve with roast pork domestic duck goose or smoked ham roast goose to be satisfactory a goose should be not over six months old no stuffing is required scrub thoroughly rinse outside and in rub the inside with an onion cut in halves then season with powdered sage salt and pepper turn the wings in so the three joints of each will form triangles on the back of the goose the tips being pushed over the first joint on the skin of the neck where it was turned over on the back tie the wings down very firmly and also tie legs together and close to the goose sprinkle with flour and salt roast two hours reducing heat after the first fifteen minutes serve garnished with baked apples and prunes stuffed with chestnut stuffing blanch enough chestnuts to fill a cup then cook in boiling salted water until tender drain and press through a ricer add one half a teaspoonful of salt two tablespoonfuls of butter a little paprika and one cup of fine chopped chicken mix thoroughly roast saddle of lamb choose a saddle from lamb under the yearling age to weigh not more than twelve pounds have the butcher split the tail curl it against the back and fasten it in the kidneys then brush over the surface of the meat with melted butter and dredge thickly with flour seasoned with salt and pepper place on the rack of a large baking pan and set into a hot oven until the paste of flour and butter covering the meat is brown baste with stock sweet cider or white grape juice and reduce temperature to moderate keep basting every fifteen minutes for two hours or until meat is cooked add one half a cup of currant jelly to liquid in pan with seasoning of salt and pepper and thicken slightly with flour serve with a garnish of bacon curls crab meat newberg cut into slices the meat from two cans of crabs put three tablespoonfuls of butter into the upper part of a double boiler and when it melts put the crab meat into it and let cook five minutes add one half a teaspoonful of salt one fourth a teaspoonful of pepper two tablespoonfuls of shero and a grating of nutmeg stir one cup of rich milk into the beaten yolks of four eggs and then add to the crab meat mixture serve as soon as the eggs thicken the sauce serve with toast melba cut white bread in very thin slices remove crusts and toast in the oven to a very delicate brown grilled almonds heat on a pan four tablespoonfuls of olive oil and when hot put in two cups of blanched almonds stir until the nuts are brown then turn the whole into a strainer save the oil for other uses and spread the nuts on absorbent paper patting them dry with soft paper then transferring to a dish and sprinkling with a little fine salt the nuts ought to be dry and crisp and of a good flavor they should be used at once boiled ham buffet service scrub the ham thoroughly cover with cold water and heat to the boiling point let boil five minutes then simmer very gently six hours be careful not to boil hard set ham aside for twelve hours to cool in liquid remove and wipe dry slice carefully and arrange on a bed of cider jelly soften one half a package of gelatin in one half a cup of cold water and dissolve by setting the dish into hot water add three-fourths a cup of sugar and when dissolved and cooled somewhat add three cups of sweet cider let stand twenty-four hours arrange in tablespoonfuls on platter for ham garnish with stuffed mangoes pickled onions 
olives and pomolas stuffed halibut steaks choose two steaks of equal size and place in a hot well-greased pan over the fire prepare the following stuffing squeeze two slices of stale bread of medium thickness out of a cup of hot water and while hot add to them two tablespoonfuls of butter one fourth a teaspoonful each of salt and pepper one tablespoonful of either capers or fine chopped pickles two teaspoonfuls of onion juice and one beaten egg to bind turn up the brown side of one of the steaks and spread over it this stuffing lay upon it the other steak with the brown side towards the stuffing and place the pan in the oven sprinkling over the upper side one fourth a teaspoonful of paprika serve with tomato sauce roast beef select a piece of beef known as the heel cut from the back of the rump wipe with a damp cloth and set skin side down on a rack in a double roaster rub over with salt and flour set in a hot oven to sear over the surface reduce the heat after twenty minutes and let cook one hour and a half turn the meat when half cooked serve with yorkshire pudding sift together one cup and one half of pastry flour and a scant half teaspoonful of salt add one cup and one half of milk gradually to form a smooth batter then add three eggs beaten until thick and light turn into a hot dripping pan the inside of which has been brushed over with hot roast beef dripping when well risen baste with the beef dripping bake about twenty minutes cut in squares turban of brussels sprouts and potato mash six potatoes seasoning with one teaspoonful of salt one half a teaspoonful of pepper one fourth a cup of butter one half a cup of cream one tablespoonful of fine chopped onion or green pepper and while the mixture is still hot beat in two very stiff beaten eggs form into a turban leaving the outside rough on a baking plate or circular platter and place in oven until prettily browned fill center with one quart of fresh boiled brussels sprouts and have ready to pour over the whole two cups of medium white sauce to which one beaten egg and the juice of a lemon has been added pouring it in such a way as not wholly to mask the green of the sprouts or a tomato sauce may be substituted if preferred garnish the border of the dish with four large cucumbers grated to a pulp drained mixed with a heaping tablespoonful of chopped parsley and seasoned with one half a teaspoonful of salt one teaspoonful of onion juice one tablespoonful of olive oil and a dash of cayenne stuffed celery salad cream one tablespoonful of butter add one cream cheese a dash of paprika and one fourth a teaspoonful of salt and three stuffed olives chopped mix thoroughly used to fill the hollow of celery stalks with a very sharp knife cut across the stalks making stuffed pieces about one-third an inch wide add a little french dressing on each individual portion place mayonnaise dressing dotted with small pieces of english walnut meats yuletide salad from slices of canned pineapple remove enough fruit to leave rings one half an inch across mix together the fruit thus removed and the same amount of canned peaches with enough french dressing to taste place this mixture in mounds on lettuce leaves arrange a prepared pineapple ring on each mound with halves of malaga grapes on the ring so arranged as to resemble leaves on a laurel wreath in the center heap cream one cup beaten with two tablespoonfuls of lemon juice one fourth a teaspoonful of salt and one eighth a teaspoonful of paprika decorate one side of each wreath with slices of maraschino cherries to resemble a bow of ribbon holiday rolls brioche scald one cup of milk when lukewarm add one cake of compressed yeast and stir until thoroughly blended add one-fourth a teaspoonful of salt one tablespoonful of sugar three-fourths a cup of butter six eggs and four cups of flour beat thoroughly five minutes using the hand instead of a spoon cover and let rise eight hours place in the ice box overnight in the morning roll into a sheet cut in rounds place in pans and set in a warm place to double in bulk 
Bake in a moderate oven 15 minutes. Brush over with confectioner's sugar, moistened with boiling water to spread, and flavor with vanilla. Decorate with candied cherries and chopped pistachio nuts. Sweet Potato Pancakes Grate enough raw sweet potatoes after paring to make two cups. Beat the yolks of two eggs with one-half a teaspoonful of salt and one-fourth a teaspoonful of pepper. Sift over the grated potatoes one or two tablespoonfuls of flour, according to the moisture of the vegetables. Add them to the beaten yolks and beat in the stiff beaten whites. Cook on a hot pan greased with butter or bacon drippings. The cake should be very thin and served hot with tomato sauce as an accompaniment to meat or fish. Plum pudding. One pound of beef suet, shredded fine and chopped. One pound of seedless raisins, the same amount of currants, carefully washed and dried. Half a pound of citron in fine shavings, five tablespoonfuls of brown sugar, rolled fine. Three cups of grated stale bread, one cup of flour, one grated nutmeg, one tablespoonful each of mace and cinnamon, four large tablespoonfuls of cream, six eggs and two tablespoonfuls of orange juice. Roll the fruit in the flour, moisten the breadcrumbs with the cream, beat the yolks of the eggs and stir into them all the ingredients, and lastly the whipped whites of the eggs. Butter a mold very thoroughly, chill. Dip halves of blanched almonds in melted butter and use to decorate the bottom of the mold. Chill the mold again and turn in the mixture. Steam six hours. Serve with hard sauce. Beat half a cup of butter to a cream. Gradually beat in one cup and one half of confectioner's sugar. Divide into three parts. Leave one part plain. Add one or two ounces of melted chocolate to one and into the third beat raspberry juice to color and flavor. Christmas Cake Boston School of Cookery, Lucy G. Allen, Director Cream one cup and one half of butter and add gradually one cup and one half of sugar. Then the well-beaten yolks of six eggs, six tablespoonfuls of milk mixed with three-fourths a teaspoonful of soda, then the stiff beaten whites of six eggs, and last three cups and one-third of pastry flour mixed with one teaspoonful and one-half of cream of tartar. Flavor as liked and bake in a deep pan, one with a tube in the center bakes best. Before icing, place a small piece of rice paper over the open space and cover with icing. Boiled icing. Put into a saucepan one cup of sugar and one half a cup of water. Heat slowly, stirring constantly, not allowing the syrup to boil until the sugar is dissolved. When the thermometer registers 226 degrees Fahrenheit, Beat the whites of two eggs very stiff. When the thermometer registers 230 degrees Fahrenheit, add one tablespoonful of the syrup slowly to the beaten eggs. Continue beating and adding the syrup until three tablespoonfuls in all have been added. If cooking without a thermometer, cook until it begins to get heavy yet does not thread. Then let the mixture cook to 248 degrees Fahrenheit or until syrup threads when dropped from the tip of the spoon. Remove and beat until the frosting will hold its shape. Spread over cake and sprinkle with coconut, which has been chopped rather fine. Decorate with Christmas trees, which have been made as follows. Buy green gumdrops and pinch into points at the top to resemble the shape of trees. Brush them over with a little unbeaten egg white and roll in the small candies called hundreds and thousands. Dip slender but strong wooden toothpicks into melted chocolate and let harden. Then insert one end into base of gumdrop and set the trees at irregular intervals by inserting other end of cake. Make small mounds of coconut at base of each tree to represent snow. Christmas Bonbons, Boston School of Cookery, Lucy G. Allen, Director. Make agar paste, color green and flavor with oil of peppermint or if preferred, oil of lime. Make a second batch, color red and flavor with oil of wintergreen, or if liked better, oil of clove. Line a pan with heavy paper wet with cold water. Pour and paste to the depth of one half inch and set away for two days. Cut in squares and dip in melted fondant. 
as soon as dipped sprinkle the red paste bonbons with red sugar and the green paste bonbons with chopped pistachio nuts note add one teaspoonful of glycerin to fondant when melting to secure a gloss agar paste soak four tablespoonfuls of granulated agar which can be purchased at a drug store in one cup of cold water an hour or longer put three-fourths a cup of sugar and one-half a cup of crystal white cairo in a pan dissolve agar and water by placing over fire and stirring constantly then strain over the sugar and cairo and cook to 222 degrees fahrenheit flavor and color and pour into pan prepared as above if using without dipping roll each square in a mixture of one-half confectioner sugar and one-half cornstarch a string of fishes for the christmas tree boston school of cookery lucy g allen director cook three-fourths a cup of sugar one-fourth a cup of water and one-eighth a teaspoonful of cream of tartar to two hundred ninety degrees fahrenheit without stirring color and flavor as liked using oils for flavoring have small fish molds well brushed with olive oil lay a string across the molds at the head using one string for three molds placed at equal distances pour in the candy and let harden remove and tie ends of string together molds of other shapes may be used if preferred stuffed raisins glace boston school of cookery lucy g allen director mix equal parts of fondant and almond paste and color green wash and wipe raisins and cut nearly in halves remove seeds and place a small ball of the almond fondant in the raisin so that a wide band shows let dry off overnight and dip in glace glace boil two cups of sugar one cup of water and one eighth a teaspoonful of cream of tartar to two hundred ninety degrees fahrenheit without stirring check heat by placing saucepan in a pan of cold water and immediately place it in a saucepan of boiling water to keep the glace in condition for dipping christmas opera fudge boston school of cookery lucy g allen director put into a saucepan two cups of sugar one cup of fairly heavy cream and one teaspoonful of cairo boil to 234 degrees fahrenheit without stirring pour on the marble work as you would fondant add a few grains of salt and when ready to knead work in two tablespoonfuls of pistachio nuts blanched and cut small and ten glace cherries flavor with pistachio flavoring extract and pack into a pan lined with paraffin paper when ready to use cut into squares and put in paper cups caramel pecan balls boston school of cookery lucy g allen director make a soft caramel mixture as follows and shape into balls one to one and one half inches in diameter cover these with fondant this is not done by dipping which would harden fondant but by folding the fondant around the ball with the fingers press pecan nut meats closely on the outside soft caramel mixture put into a saucepan one cup of white sugar one half a cup of light brown sugar one third a cup of crystal white cairo one fourth a cup of butter and one half a cup of heavy cream stir until dissolved and then cook without stirring to 246 degrees fahrenheit flavor with almond or with vanilla and pour into a buttered pan when quite cool shape into balls english fruit cake cream three-fourths a pound of butter add gradually one pound of granulated sugar and seven egg yolks well beaten also one half cup of cider light cream may be used in place of cider sift three-fourths a pound of bread flour with one teaspoonful each of grated nutmeg and cinnamon and reserve one-fourth a cup to dredge the fruit add remainder of flour to the first mixture alternately with the stiff beaten whites of seven eggs beat well and then stir in one half a pound each of raisins and currants and one-fourth a pound of thin sliced citron bake in a moderate oven about two hours this makes two loaves requiring pans about nine inches long four inches wide and two and one half inches deep makes four pounds and will keep moist some time under favorable conditions chocolate cups 
Boston School of Cookery, Lucy G. Allen, Director. Line silver foil cups. Brown paper cups can be used with melted dipping chocolate and let harden. Then place in the center a filling of half raspberry jam and half marshmallow whip. This will be more satisfactory if allowed to stand until crusted over. Then cover and sprinkle over the top while soft prepared pistachio nuts. Do not blanch, but scrape the skin off with a sharp knife and shave fine and then chop fine. Chocolate Filberts Boston School of Cookery, Lucy G. Allen, Director. Remove shells from filberts and roast in oven until the right shade of brown. Rub them while hot with a rough cloth and most of the skin will come off. Dip one end of each nut into melted dipping chocolate and put together in clusters of three. The chocolate will harden, holding the nuts in position. Then dip in chocolate and place in center of each one a red candy with three tiny leaves of green fondant around it. These may be made by pinching fondant into shape with the fingers. Fondant. Stir two cups of sugar and one half a cup of water until boiling begins. Then remove the spoon and in a few moments, with the hand or a brush dipped in cold water, wash down the sides of the saucepan to remove any grains of sugar that have been thrown up in boiling. Cover again and let cook about five minutes. Now add about one-fourth a teaspoonful of cream of tartar. And if fondant is to be cooked by means of a thermometer, put the thermometer into the syrup and let the syrup cook until the temperature rises to about 238 degrees Fahrenheit, the soft ball stage. Turn the fondant onto a large platter, lightly dampened with water or rubbed over with olive oil. Let stand until a dent can be made in the surface, then work the candy back and forth with a wooden spatula or silver knife to a white, smooth, soft, creamy paste. While still soft and warm, gather together and knead with the hands as bread is kneaded, then press into an earthen bowl and cover close with confectioner's paper. Store in a cool place. After 24 hours, the fondant is ready to use scotch new year cake soften one pound of butter stir into it one pound of sugar and beat together until very light add one tablespoonful each of ground cinnamon and allspice mix well with the butter and sugar and let stand for 15 minutes or while preparing and measuring the other ingredients separate the yolks from the whites of 10 eggs beat the yolks and mix with four ounces each of candied citron candied orange peel candied lemon rind and candied cherries or apricots all of these should be shaved into very thin transparent strips mix this gradually with the butter and sugar beat the whites of the eggs until stiff but not dry and beat these into the mixture of other ingredients add a quarter of a pound of chopped sweet almonds and lastly add 20 ounces of sifted flour and one half a cup of any very rich fruit syrup or cider boiled down to a syrup. On a large baking sheet, place 12 thicknesses of thin manila paper. On these, set one of the baking rings or hoops used by confectioners. Line this with oiled paper, put in the cake mixture, cover the top with two thicknesses of paper, and set in a moderate oven. Remove the paper from the top at the end of two hours and bake for another hour or until firm in the center. Or the recipe may be halved and baked in a two pan set on six thicknesses of paper. End of Seasonable and Tested Recipes by Janet M. Hill and Mary D. Chambers. Вірш Ялинка Антіна Лотоцького. Цей звукозапис зроблено для сайту LibriVox. Усі звукозаписи LibriVox є суспільним надбанням. Щоб отримати більш докладну інформацію або зареєструватися в якості волонтера, будь ласка, відвідайте сайт LibriVox.org. Читає Солоха Анастасія. Як чарівно, як миленько сяють, світять свічачки на ялинці. Що в чічки пестрі прибрана гарненько.
А як радісно серденька б'ються в грудях діточкам, Лиш висміхнеться їх очам вся ялинка принадненька. Я чарівний вид сей люблю, Веселіє мені світ, наче ясний щастя цвіт В моїм серці я голублю. Але більш мені, миленькі від ялинки свічечок, В Україні діточок оченят огні ясненькі. Але більш мені миленький, ніж ялинки ясний дар, В діточок в країни жар. У маленьких їх серденьках. Кілько тільки я погляну в ученята ясні ті, У серденька сі палки, мов в новому світі стану. Бачу й чую всі хвилині, Ученята ясні сі вийдуть на шляхи нові, Найдуть долю Україні. Бачу й чую всі хвилині Сих палких сердечок жар Злучиться в любви пожар І дасть волю Україні. Кінець вірша Ялинка Антіна Лотоцького Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus by Francis Farcellus Church. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ron Altman. From the New York Sun, September 21st, 1897. We take pleasure in answering at once, and thus prominently, the communication below, expressing at the same time our great gratification that its faithful author is numbered among the friends of the sun. Dear Editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Signed, Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist, and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight the eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus. You might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, 
But even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus. But that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not. But that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith fancy, poetry, love, romance, can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus! Thank God he lives! and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. End of Yes, Virginia, There is a Santa Claus by Francis Farcellus Church